Welcome to new audiobook. Don't forget to like and subscribe the channel. Let's start the video. Book name. Will. Author. Will Smith. Introduction. I was 11 years old, my father decided he needed a new wall on the front of his shop. It would be a big wall, roughly 12 feet high by 20 feet long. The old wall was crumbling, and he was sick o' looking at it. But rather than hire a contractor or construction company, he thought it would be a good project for my younger brother, Harry, and me. Dottio did the demolition. I remember looking at that gaping hole in excruciating disbelief. I was utterly certain that there would never be a wall there ever again. Every day for nearly a year, my brother and I would go to my father's shop after school to work on that wall. We did everything ourselves. We dug the footing, mixed the mortar, and carried the buckets. I still remember the formula, two parts cement, one part sand, one part lime. Harry was in charge of the hose. We'd mix the pile with shovels out on the sidewalk and then fill two gallon buckets and lay our separate bricks. We did it without any rebar or wood forms, just one of those levels with the water bubble in the middle. If you know anything about construction, you know this is a loony ass way to do this. If we can keep it real, this is chain gang kinda labor. Today we would just call child protective services. This is a job so tedious and unnecessarily long that what ended up taking two kids most of a year would have only taken a team of grown men a couple of days, at most. My brother and I worked weekends, holidays, vacations. We worked through the summer that year. It didn't matter. My father never took a day off, so neither could we. There were so many times I remember looking at that hole, totally discouraged. I couldn't see how this was ever going to end. The dimensions became unfathomably large in my mind. It seemed like we were building the Great Wall of West Philly billions of red bricks stretching infinitely into some distant nowhere. I was certain that I would grow old and die still mixing concrete and carrying those buckets. I just knew it. But Dottio wouldn't let us stop. Every day, we had to be there, mixing concrete, carrying buckets, laying bricks. It didn't matter if it was raining, if it was hot as hell, if I was mad, if I was sad, if I was sick, if I had a test the next day there were no excuses. My brother and I tried to complain and protest, but it made no difference to Dottio, we were trapped. This wall was a constant, it was permanence. Seasons changed, friends came and went, teachers retired but the wall remained. Always, the wall remained. One day, Harry and I were in a particularly stank mood. We were dragging our feet and grumbling, impossible this and ridiculous that. Why'd we have to build a wall for, anyway? This is impossible. It's never gonna get done. Dottio overheard us, threw down his tools, and marched over to where we were yapping. He snatched a brick out of my hand and held it up in front of us. Stop thinking about the damn wall, he said. There is no wall. There are only bricks. Your job is to lay this brick perfectly. Then move on to the next brick. Then lay that brick perfectly. Then the next one. Don't be worrying about no wall. Your only concern is one brick. He walked back into the shop. Harry and I looked at each other, shook our heads this dude's a kook and went back to mixing. As home of the most impactful lessons I've ever received, I've had to learn in spite of myself. I resisted them, I denied them, but ultimately the weight of their truth became unavoidable. My father's brick wall was one of those lessons. The days dragged on, and as much as I hated to admit it, I started to see what he was talking about. When I focused on the wall, the job felt impossible. Never ending. But when I focused on one brick, everything got easy I knew I could lay one damn brick well. As the weeks passed, the bricks mounted, and the hole got just a little bit smaller. I started to see that the difference between a task that feels impossible and a task that feels doable is merely a matter of perspective. Are you paying attention to the wall? Or are you paying attention to the brick? 
whether it was acing the tests to get accepted into college, hitting it big as one of the first global hip-hop artists, or constructing one of the most successful careers in Hollywood history, in all cases, what appeared to be impossibly large goals could be broken down into individually manageable tasks insurmountable walls comprised of a series of conceivably layable bricks. For my entire career, I have been absolutely relentless. I've been committed to a work ethic of uncompromising intensity. And the secret to my success is as boring as it is unsurprising, you show up and you lay another brick. Pissed off? Lay another brick. Bad opening weekend? Lay another brick. Album sales dropping? Get up and lay another brick. Marriage failing? Lay another brick. Over the past 30 years, like all of us, I have dealt with failure, loss, humiliation, divorce, and death. I've had my life threatened, my money taken away, my privacy invaded, my family disintegrated and every single day, still, I got up, mixed concrete, and laid another brick. No matter what you're going through, there is always another brick sitting right there in front of you, waiting to be laid. The only question is, are you going to get up and lay it? I've heard people say that a child's personality is influenced by the meaning of their name. Well, my father gave me my name, he gave me his name, and he gave me my greatest advantage in life, my ability to weather adversity. He gave me will. It was a cold, overcast day, nearly a year after my brother and I had begun. By that time, the wall had become such a fixture in my life that thoughts of finishing it felt like delusions. Like, if we ever did finish, there would tragically be another hole, right behind it, that immediately needed to be filled. But on that frigid September morning, we mixed the final pile, filled the final bucket, and laid the final brick. Dottio had been standing there watching the last few bricks being set into place. Cigarette in hand, he stood quietly admiring our work. Harry and I set and leveled the final brick, then silence. Harry kinda shrugged what now? Do we jump, do we cheer, do we celebrate? We gingerly stepped back and stood on each side of Dottio. The three of us surveyed our family's new wall. Dottio plucked his cigarette to the ground, twisting his boot to put it out, exhaled the final drag of smoke, and, never taking his eyes off the wall, he said, Now, don't y'all ever tell me there's something you can't do. Then he walked into the shop and got back to work. Fear IVE always thought of myself as a coward. Most of my memories of my childhood involve me being afraid in some way afraid of other kids, afraid of being hurt or embarrassed, afraid of being seen as weak. But mostly, I was afraid of my father. When I was nine years old, I watched my father punch my mother in the side of her head so hard that she collapsed. I saw her spit blood. That moment in that bedroom, probably more than any other moment in my life, has defined who I am today. Within everything that I have done since then the awards and accolades, the spotlights and the attention, the characters and the laughs there has been a subtle string of apologies to my mother for my inaction that day. For failing her in that moment. For failing to stand up to my father. For being a coward. What you have come to understand as Will Smith the alien annihilating MC, the bigger than life movie star, is largely a construction a carefully crafted and honed character designed to protect myself. To hide myself from the world. To hide the coward. My father was my hero. His name was Willard Carroll Smith, but we all called him Dottio. Dottio was born and raised in the rough and rugged streets of North Philadelphia in the 1940s. Dottio's father, my grandfather, owned a small fish market. He had to work from 4 a.m. until late at night every day. My grandmother was a nurse and often worked the night shift at the hospital. As a result, Dottio spent much of his childhood alone and unsupervised. The North Philly streets had a way of hardening you. You either crystallized into a mean motherfucker, or the hood broke you. Dottio was smoking cigarettes by 11 and drinking by the age of 14. My father developed a defiant and aggressive attitude that would continue all his life. 
When he was 14, my grandparents, fearing where his life was headed, scraped together what money they could and sent him to an agricultural boarding school in the Pennsylvania countryside where kids learned farming techniques and basic handyman work. It was a strict and traditional place, and by sending him there they hoped to introduce some much needed structure and discipline into his life. But nobody was going to tell my father what to do. Other than working on some of the tractor engines, he couldn't be bothered with what he described as that hillbilly bullshit. He would skip classes, he smoked cigarettes and kept on drinking. At age 16, Dadio was done with the school and ready to go home. He decided to get himself kicked out. He started disrupting classes, ignoring all the rules, and antagonizing anyone in a position of authority. But when the administrators tried to send him home, my grandparents refused to take him back. We paid for the full year, they said. You're getting paid to deal with him, so deal with him. Dadio was stuck. But Dadio was a hustler he was going to find his way out, on his 17th birthday, he snuck off campus, walked half a dozen miles to the nearest recruiting office, and enlisted in the United States Air Force. This was classic Dadio he was so hell-bent on defying authority and rebelling against both his parents and the school that he jumped out of the frying pan of an agricultural boarding school and directly into the fire of the United States military. He ended up in the exact structure and discipline my grandparents had desperately hoped to instill in him. But as it turned out, Dadio loved it. It was in the military that he discovered the transformative power of order and discipline, two values that he came to worship as the guardrails protecting him from the worst parts of himself. Wake up at 4 a.m., train all morning, work all day, study all night he found his lane. He discovered that he could outlast anybody, and he began to take pride in that. It was another aspect of his defiant attitude. Nobody could force him to wake up with a bugle horn because he already was up. With his passionate work ethic, boundless energy, and undeniable intelligence, he should have quickly risen through the ranks. But there were two issues. First, he had a brutal temper, and superior officer or not, if you were wrong, he wasn't doing it. Second, his drinking. Let me tell you, my father was one of the smartest people I've ever known, but when he was angry, or drunk, he became an idiot. He would break his own rules, subvert his own objectives, destroy his own things. After about two years in the military, this self-destructive streak peeked through the veil of order and ended his service career. One night, he and the guys from his platoon were gambling. Dadio was sweet with a pair of dice. He took those dudes for almost a thousand dollars. Once he'd stashed the winnings in his footlocker, he headed out to get something to eat, but when he returned from the mess hall, the guys had stolen back the money. In his fury, Dadio drank himself into a frenzy, took out his service pistol, and lit up the barracks. Nobody got hurt, but it was enough for the Air Force to show him the door. He was fortunate that he wasn't court-martialed instead, they just discharged him, put him on a bus, and invited him to never come back. This was a tension that ripped through my father's entire life he demanded such rigid perfection from himself and the people around him, yet after too many drinks, or if he snapped, he would burn everything to the ground. D. Adio moved back to Philly. Undaunted, he took a job in a steel mill while putting himself through night school. He studied engineering and showed a real aptitude for both electricity and the science of refrigeration. One day, after being passed over for a promotion at the steel mill for the third or fourth time because of his race, he simply walked out the door and never went back. He knew refrigeration, so he decided he'd start his own business. Dadio was brilliant. Like many sons, I worshipped my father, but he also terrified me. He was one of the greatest blessings of my life, and also one of my greatest sources of pain. My mom was born Carolyn Elaine Bright. She's a Pittsburgh girl, born and raised in Homewood, a predominantly black neighborhood on the east side of the city. My mother, aka Mom Mom, is eloquent and sophisticated. She has a petite frame, with long, 
elegant, piano player's fingers, perfectly sized to deliver a gorgeous rendition of for Elise. She had been a standout student at Westinghouse High School and was one of the first black women to ever study at Carnegie Mellon University. Mom Mom would often say that knowledge was the only thing that the world couldn't take away from you. And she only cared about three things, education, education, and education. She loved business banking, finance, sales, contracts. Mom Mom always had her own money. Life moved quickly for my mother, as it often did in those days. She married her first husband at the age of 20, had a daughter, and was divorced less than three years later. By 25, as a struggling single mom, she was probably one of the most educated African American women in all of Pittsburgh, yet she was still working jobs beneath the level of her true potential. Feeling trapped and craving bigger opportunities, she packed up the baby and moved to live with her mother my grandmother Gigi in Philadelphia. My parents met in the summer of 1964. Mom Mom was working as a notary in the Fidelity Bank in Philly. She was rolling out with some girlfriends to a party, and one of them told her she just had to meet this man. His name was Will Smith. In many ways, Mom Mom is the total opposite of my father. Whereas Dadio was the boisterous, charismatic center of attention, Mom Mom is quiet and reserved, not because she's shy or intimidated, but because she only speaks when it improves on silence. She loves words and always chooses them carefully she speaks with an academic sophistication. Dottio, on the other hand, was loud, spewing the lingo of a 1950s North Philly hood rat. He loved the poetry of his profanity I once heard him call a man a dirty rat, coxican, lowdown, mangy pig fucker. Mom Mom doesn't use profanity. It's important to note here, that back in the day, Dottio was the man. Six foot two, smart, good looking, the proud owner of a fire engine red convertible Pontiac. He was funny, he could sing, he could play the guitar. He could lock people into him he was always the dude standing in the middle of a party with a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other, a master storyteller who could keep a room buzzing. When mom mom first saw Dottio, he reminded her of a tall Marvin Gaye. He was savvy and knew his way around people. He could talk his way into a party, get free drinks and a table near the front. Dottio had a way of moving through the world like everything was under control, it was all going to be fine. This was comforting for my mom. My mother's memory of their first days together is just a blurred montage of restaurants and clubs, strung together by a stream of jokes and laughter. Mom mom couldn't get over how funny he was, but most important to her, he was ambitious. He had his own business. He had employees. He wanted to work in white neighborhoods, with white people working for him. Dottio was going places. My father wasn't used to interacting with women of my mother's educational accomplishments man, this bird smart as a motherfucker, he thought. Dottio was the street smarts to mom mom's book smarts. My parents had a lot in common, too. They both had a passion for music. They loved jazz, blues, and, later, funk and R&B. They lived through the glorious Motown days and spent much of it dancing together in musty basement parties and jazz clubs. But there were strange commonalities, as well the stuff that startles you and makes you think, this must be God's plan. Both of my parents had mothers who were nurses who worked night shifts, one was Helen, one was Ellen. Both of my parents had short-lived marriages in their early twenties, and they both had daughters. And in perhaps the strangest coincidence, they had both named their daughters Pam. My parents got married in a small ceremony at Niagara Falls in 1966. Soon after, Dottio moved into my grandmother Gigi's house, on North 54th Street in West Philadelphia. It wasn't long before they combined their very different strengths and talents into an effective team. Mom Mom ran Dottio's office, payroll, contracts, taxes, accounting, permits. And Dottio got to do what he did best, work hard and make money. Both of my parents would later speak fondly of those early years. 
they were young, in love, ambitious, and they were moving on up. My full name is Willard Carroll Smith to not junior. Dio would always correct people, hey. He ain't no motherfucking junior. He felt like calling me junior diminished both of us. I was born on September 25, 1968. My mom says that from the moment I showed up, I was a talker. Always smiling, yapping, and babbling away, content to just be making noise. Gigi worked the graveyard shift at Jefferson Hospital in Center City, Philadelphia, so she'd take care of me in the mornings while my parents were at work. Her house had a huge porch, which served as my front row seat to the drama of North 54th Street, and a stage on which I could join in the theatrics. She'd prop me up on that porch and watch me jibber-jabber with anybody and everybody who walked by. Even at that age, I loved having an audience. My twin brother and sister, Harry and Ellen, were born on May 5, 1971. And counting Mom Mom's daughter Pam, just like that there would now be six of us under one roof. Fortunately, the North Philly entrepreneur in Dadio was alive and well. He had gone from repairing refrigerators to installing and maintaining refrigerator and freezer cases in major supermarkets. Business was taking off he was expanding beyond Philly into the surrounding suburbs. He started to build a fleet of trucks and hire a crew of refrigeration and electrical technicians. He also rented a small building to use as his base of operations. Dadio was always hustling. I remember one particularly frigid winter, cash got tight, so he taught himself how to repair kerosene heaters. They were all the rage in Philly at the time. He put up a bunch of flyers, and people started bringing him their broken heaters. Dadio figured out that once he'd fixed a heater, he'd have to test it for a couple days, to make sure it was working. At any given time, he'd have 10 or 12 kerosene heaters being tested for the quality of his work. That many heaters will easily warm a West Philly row home, even in the coldest of winters. So Dadio cancelled our gas service, kept his family warm and toasty for the winter, and got paid for it. By the time that I was two years old, Dadio had established his business firmly enough to buy a house about a mile away from Gigi in a middle-class neighborhood of West Philly called Winfield. I grew up at 5943 Woodcrest Avenue on a tree-lined street of 30 grayish-red brick row homes, all connected. The physical proximity of the houses cultivated a strong sense of community. It also meant that if your neighbor had roaches, you had roaches, too. Everybody knew everybody. For a young black family in the 1970s, this was as American dream as you could get. Across the street was Bieber Middle School and its majestic concrete playground. Basketball, baseball, girls jump in double dutch. The OL had slap boxing. And the second the summer hit, pop goes the water plug. Our neighborhood was thick with kids, and we were always outside playing. Living within 100 yards of my house, there were almost 40 kids my age. Stacy, David, Reese, Cherie, Michael, Teddy, Sean, Omer, and on and on and that's not even counting their siblings, or the kids on the next blocks. Stacy Brooks is my oldest friend in the world. We met the day my family moved to Woodcrest. I was two, she was three. Our mothers pushed our strollers up to each other and introduced us. I was in love with her by the time I was seven. But she was in love with David Brandon. He was nine. Times were good, and people were clearly having sex a lot. My middle-class upbringing contributed to the constant criticism I took early in my rap career. I was not a gangster, and I wasn't selling drugs. I grew up on a nice street in a two-parent household. I went to a Catholic school with mostly white kids until I was 14. My mom was college educated. And for all of his faults, my father always put food on the table and would die before he abandoned his kids. My story was very different from the ones being told by the young black men who were launching the global phenomenon that would later become hip-hop. In their minds, I was somehow an illegitimate artist, they would call me soft, whack, corny, a bubblegum rapper, 
criticisms that violently infuriated me. Looking back, I realize I may have been projecting a little, but the reason I hated it so much was that they were unknowingly poking at the thing I most hated about myself, my sense that I was a coward. Diadio saw the world in terms of commanders and missions, a military mindset that informed every aspect of his life. He would come to run our family as though we were a platoon on a battlefield and the Woodcrest house was our barracks. He didn't ask us to clean our rooms or to make our beds he commanded, police your area. In his world, there was no such thing as a small thing. Doing your homework was a mission. Cleaning the bathroom was a mission. Getting groceries from the supermarket was a mission. And scrubbing a floor? It was never just about scrubbing a floor it was about your ability to follow orders, to exhibit self-discipline, and to complete a task with the utmost perfection. 99% is the same as zero was one of his favorite sayings. If a soldier failed his or her mission, it had to be repeated until perfected. And to disobey a command meant you faced a court-martial, and the punishment usually came in the form of a belt to your bare ass. He'd say, take M off, I ain't gone beat my clothes. In Dottio's mind, everything was life or death. He was preparing his children to thrive in a harsh world a world that he saw as chaotic and brutal. The instilling of fear was and still is to a large degree a cultural parenting tactic in the black community. Fear is embraced as a survival necessity. It is a widely held belief that in order to protect black children, they must fear parental authority. The instilling of fear is viewed as an offering of love. On May 13, 1985, Dottio came into our rooms calling for us to get on the floor. A couple of miles south of Woodcrest, the Philadelphia Police Department had just dropped a pair of one-pound bombs on a residential neighborhood. We could hear the faint ka 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 a a ka 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 a a a of automatic gunfire. Five children and six adults would die that day in what is now known as the move bombing. Two entire city blocks 65 homes were burned to the ground. The news always seemed to reinforce Dottio's point of view. Dottio's ideology was centered on training us mentally and physically to handle life's inevitable adversities, but what he unwittingly created was an environment of constant tension and anxiety. I remember one Sunday afternoon, Dottio was taking a rare day off and sitting in the living room watching TV. He called me over, EY, Will. Popping straight to attention, I said, Yes, Daddy. Run up to Mr. Bryant's and grab my Terradin 100S. Yes, sir. He handed me five dollars, and I was off to the corner store. I was maybe ten years old at the time, but this was the 1970s, back when parents could send their kid to buy cigarettes. I ran down the street directly to Mr. Bryant's without stopping. Totally out of breath, a perfect soldier. Hi, Mr. Bryant, my dad sent me to pick up his cigarettes. How you doin', Will? Mr. Bryant said. They didn't come in today tell Dottio they should be here tomorrow. I'll hold a carton for him. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bryant. I'll tell him. Still a good soldier, I headed home. On my way back, I ran into David and Danny Brandon, who had just gotten this weird new thing called a Nerf football. It was a football, but it was soft. Any soldier would have stopped. This thing was amazing I got lost in the ingenuity of this extraordinary object. You could throw it in the winter, but it wouldn't hurt your fingers if you caught it. You could miss it, it could hit you in the face, and you'd be fine. One minute turned into five and then five became ten, ten became twenty. Suddenly, David and Danny freeze. Their eyes lock over my shoulder. I turn, and my stomach drops. Dottio, bare-chested, striding up the middle of the street right at me. What the hell are you doing? David and Danny evaporated. I quickly try to explain. Daddy, Mr. Brian said the cigarettes didn't come in and what did I tell you to do? I know, Daddy, but I who's in charge? What do you mean who's in charge? You. Or me. My heart pounding out of my chest, 
my voice quivers, you are, daddy because if two people are in charge, everybody dies. So, if you're in charge, let me know because I will defer to your leadership. His nostrils flaring, the vein in his left temple pulsing madly, his eyes burning through my fragile, ten-year-old innocence. When I send you on a mission, there are two possibilities one, you complete the mission. Or two, you are dead. Do you understand me? Yes, daddy. Dottio grabbed me by the back of the neck and dragged me home. I didn't think I deserved a whoopin for that. Most of the times I got hit during my childhood, I didn't think I'd earned it it felt like an injustice. I wasn't the kind of kid you needed to spank. I already wanted to please you. David Brandon needed a beaten. Matt Brown needed a beaten. If I got in trouble, it was usually because I was distracted I would forget something or my mind would drift. I think the corporal punishment of my childhood just convinced me I was bad. T. He constant fear during my childhood honed my sensitivity to every detail in my environment. From a very young age, I developed a razor-sharp intuition, an ability to attune to every emotion around me. I learned to sense anger, predict joy and understand sadness on far deeper levels than most other kids. Recognizing these emotions was crucial and critical for my personal safety, a tone in Dottio's voice, a pointed question from my mother, a twitch of my sister's eye. I processed these things quickly and profoundly a missed glance or misinterpreted word could quickly deteriorate into a belt on my ass or a fist in my mother's face. Dottio had a black leather key pouch hooked on his utility belt that held about 30 keys, which for me served as an alarm system. The second he'd walk through the door you could hear his keys jingling as he placed them back into their case and reset them at his hip. I became so in tune that I could discern his mood from the rhythm and the intensity with which he handled his keys. My bedroom was at the top of the stairs, directly facing down to the front door. If he was in a good mood, they would jingle effortlessly, as though they were lighter than usual. If he was pissed, I could hear the jolt of pressure as he reattached them to his hip. And if he was drunk, the keys didn't matter. This emotional awareness has stayed with me throughout my life. Paradoxically it has served me well as an actor and performer. I could easily recognize, comprehend and emulate complex emotions long before I knew that people would pay me for it. My father was born on the heels of the Great Depression. He was a poor black kid living on the streets of North Philly in the 1940s. He basically had a 10th grade education. Yet, over the course of his life, he built a business with a dozen employees and seven trucks, selling 30,000 pounds of ice per day to grocery stores and supermarkets in three states. He went weeks without taking a day off, decades without taking a vacation. My mother has memories of Dottio coming home in the middle of the night from the shop, dumping thousands of dollars in cash onto the bed, saying, count that, and then immediately heading out into the night to get back to work. My father tormented me. And he was also one of the greatest men I've ever known. My father was violent, but he was also at every game, play, and recital. He was an alcoholic, but he was sober at every premiere of every one of my movies. He listened to every record. He visited every studio. The same intense perfectionism that terrorized his family put food on the table every night of my life. So many of my friends grew up either not knowing their fathers or not having their fathers around. But Dottio had my back and never abandoned his post, not even once. And while he never learned to overcome his own demons, he would cultivate in me the tools to confront my own. As much as we all suffered under Dottio's militaristic views of love and family, nobody suffered more than my mother. If two people being in charge meant everybody dies, then that meant my mother could never be in charge. The problem was that my mother wasn't the type of woman to be commanded. She was educated, proud, and stubborn, and as much as we begged her to please be quiet, she refused. Once, when Dottio slapped her, she egged him on. Oh, you're such a man. You think that hitting a woman makes you a man, huh? He hit her again, knocking her to the ground. 
She stood right back up, looked him in the eye, and calmly said, Hit me all you want, but you can never hurt me. I have never forgotten that. The idea that he could hit her body but somehow she was in control of what hurt her? I wanted to be strong like that. Everybody in my house could fight. Except me. My older sister Pam was strong like our mother. She was six years older than me, and she was kinda my childhood bodyguard. She would stand up to anybody at any time. There were multiple situations where somebody would take my money or I would get bullied or come home crying, and Pam would grab me by the hand, walk me straight outside, and scream, Who did it? Point to M, Will. Then she'd proceed to casually hoop the whole ass of the unfortunate kid I pointed at. It was a sad day when she left for college. Harry turned out to be strong, too. While I took extra special care to please my father every chance I got, Harry mimicked my mother's behavior. Starting at a young age, he preferred to just stand up and take the beatings. He once yelled at my father, You can hit me, but you can't make me cry. Smack. I'm not crying. Smack. I'm not crying. Eventually, realizing he couldn't break him, Dottio laid off Harry altogether. All along, Harry's courage the fact that my little brother was able to stand up to the monster just reinforced my shame. In a family of fighters, I was the weak one. I was the coward. I and acting, understanding a character's fears is a critical part of understanding his or her psyche. The fears create desires and the desires precipitate actions. These repetitive actions and predictable responses are the building blocks of great cinematic characters. It's pretty much the same in real life. Something bad happens to us, and we decide we're never going to let that happen again. But in order to prevent it, we have to be a certain way. We choose the behaviors that we believe will deliver safety, stability, and love. And we repeat them, over and over again. In the movies, we call it a character, in real life, we call it personality. How we decide to respond to our fears, that is the person we become. I decided to be funny. E.A.C.H. of my siblings remembers that night in that bedroom with our mother. Each of us was incredibly scared, but each of us responded differently, in ways that would go on to define who we were for much of our lives. Harry, despite being only six years old, tried to intervene and protect our mother he would do so many times over the coming years, sometimes successfully. But that night, Dottio just shoved him away. My brother intuitively got my mother's lesson about pain, Harry had discovered that untouchable place within himself, that place where you could hit him as much as you wanted, but you could never hurt him. I remember him once yelling at my father, you'll have to kill me to make me stop. That same night, my sister Ellen responded by running to her bedroom, curling up on the bed, covering her ears, and crying. Later, she would recall Dottio walking by her room and, hearing her sobbing, coldly asking, Now what the fuck you crying about? Ellen withdrew. Not only from Dottio but from the rest of the family. Years later, her withdrawal would result in outright rebellion. She'd stay out all night drinking and smoking and wouldn't even bother to call to say where she was. If Harry was fight, Ellen was flight, and I became a pleaser. Throughout our childhood, my siblings and I judged one another harshly for our different reactions, and those judgments hardened into resentment. Ellen felt like Harry and I didn't support her, Harry felt that, as the older brother, I should have been stronger, I should have done something. And I felt like their responses only inflamed the situations and made it worse for all of us. I wanted everybody to just shut the fuck up and do it my way. I wanted to please and placate him, because as long as Dottio was laughing and smiling, I believed, we would be safe. I was the entertainer in the family. I wanted to keep everything light and fun and joyful. And while this psychological response would later bear artistic and financial fruits, it also meant that my little nine-year-old brain processed Dottio's abusive episodes as somehow being my fault. I should have been able to keep my father satisfied. 
I should have been able to protect my mother. I should have been able to make the family stable and happy. I should have been able to make everything all right. And it's in this compulsive desire to constantly please others, to keep them laughing and smiling at all times, to redirect all the attention in the room away from the ugly and uncomfortable, toward the joyful and the beautiful it's there that a true entertainer is born. But that night, in that bedroom, with me standing there in the doorway, watching my father's fists collide with the woman I loved most in this world, watching as she collapsed on the ground, helpless, I just stood there. Frozen. I had been scared my whole childhood, but this was the first time I had been aware of my own inaction. I was my mom's oldest son. I was less than ten yards away. I was the only chance she had for help. Yet, I did nothing. It was then that my young identity congealed in my mind. It became encased in a hard sediment, an unshakable feeling that no matter what I have done, and no matter how successful I have become, no matter how much money I've made or how many number one hits I've had or how many box office records I've broken, there is that subtle and silent feeling always pulsating in the back of my mind, that I am a coward, that I have failed, that I am sorry, mom mom, so sorry. Do you know what happens when two people are in charge? When two people are in charge, everybody dies. That night, in that bedroom, at only nine years old, watching the destruction of my family as my mother collapsed to the floor in that moment, I decided. I made a silent promise. To my mother, to my family, to myself, one day, I would be in charge. And this would never, ever happen again. Fa and ta s y n l, I know y'all were thinking I was going to start this book off with, Thuria in West Philadelphia, born and raised, not with stories of domestic abuse and violence. I was tempted, I mean, how could I not be? I'm a make-believer. And not just any ol make-believer, I'm a legendary, bad boy, man in black kind of make-believer, I'm a movie star. My first impulse is always to clean up the truth in my mind. To make it better. To shine it up a little bit so it doesn't hurt as much. I redesign it and replace it with whatever suits me. Or really, whatever suits you, I'm a crowd pleaser. It's my actual job. The truth is whatever I decide to make you believe, and I will make you believe it, that's what I do. I'm a master storyteller. I thought about showing you the pretty me, a flawless diamond, a swaggy, unbreakable winner. A fantasy image of a successful human being. I'm always tempted to make believe. I live in an ongoing war with reality. Of course, there's the red carpet walking, fly car driving, tight fade wearing, box office record breaking, hot chick marrying, I am legend, pull up doing, jiggy ass Will Smith. And then there's me. This book is about me. Thuria in West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground is where I spent most of my days chilling out, maxing, relaxing all cool I got my ass beat and bullied every day at ER school. That's how the song should have gone. Okay. I can admit I was a weird kid. Kinda skinny, sorta goofy, with a bizarre taste in clothes. I was also the unfortunate owner of a prominent set of ears that made David Brandon once say that I looked like a trophy. As I think back, I probably would have made fun of me, too. It didn't help that I liked math and science, they were my favorite subjects in school. I think I like math because it's exact, I like when things add up. Numbers don't play games or have moods or opinions. And I talked a lot probably too much. But, most important, I had a wild and vivid imagination, a fantasy life that was much broader and lasted way longer than most children. Whereas when most kids just played around with plastic army men, nerf balls, and toy guns, I would construct elaborate fantasy scenarios and then get lost in them. When I was about eight or nine, Mom Mom sent me and Pam to Sayre Morris Day Camp in southwest Philadelphia. It was the usual, bargain basement thing, rec room, swimming pool, arts, and crafts. I came home after the first day and ran into the kitchen, where my mom was sitting with our next-door neighbor, 
Miss Frida. Hey, baby, how was camp? Mom mom asked. Ah, mom, I loved it. They had this big jazz band with trumpets and violins and singers and drums, and they had one of those horn things that do like this. I mimicked the back and forth movement of a trombone. And then we had a dance battle, and like 50 people were doing choreographed moves together. Miss Frida looked at my mom a full jazz band. 50 choreographed dancers. At a children's summer camp. What Miss Frida didn't know was that she was caught in the crossfire of a playful game between my mother and me, one that still goes on even to this day. The rules are, I describe the most colorful, vivid, outlandish scene that I can come up with, which I then superimpose over the reality of my actual experience, and Mom Mom's job is to determine how much of it is actually true, and in which case, does she need to do something? My mom paused and came nose to nose with me. Her gaze served as a sort of old school, mother would lie detector, looking for the slightest wobble in my commitment to my story. I didn't flinch. She'd seen enough. Willard, stop playing. There was no jazz band at Sayer Day Camp. No, Mom, I'm telling you it was crazy. Miss Frida, confused, said, but, Carolyn, he didn't even know the word for a trombone he had to have seen it, right? No. He does this mess all the time. Just then, Pam walked into the kitchen, and my mother said, Pam, was there a full jazz band? a dance contest, and a trombone at camp today. Pam rolled her eyes. What? No. It was a jukebox, Mom. Will stood there and listened to the jukebox all day he didn't even get in the pool. Mom Mom looked to Miss Frida. I told you. I burst into laughter Mom Mom won this round, but at least I beat Miss Frida. My imagination is my gift, and when it merges with my work ethic, I can make money rain from the heavens. My imagination has always been the part of me that mom mom loved the most. Well, that and when I got good grades. It's a weird mix of love that she has for me. She loves my silly side, but she needs me to be smart. At some point in her life, she decided that she was only allowed to talk about important stuff, educational reform, generational wealth, the new misleading national health guidelines. She doesn't entertain foolishness. Her and Dottio debated everything. Integration is the worst thing that ever happened to black folks, Dottio said emphatically. You don't believe that, will you're just saying it to pluck my nerves, Mom Mom said dismissively. Listen to me, Carlin. Before integration, we had our own. Black businesses were thriving because niggas had to patronize niggas. The cleaners, the restaurant, the hardware store everybody needed everybody. As soon as black folks was allowed to eat at McDonald's, our entire economic infrastructure collapsed. So are you suggesting that you'd prefer to be raising these children in slavery, or in Jim Crow? Mom Mom said. I'm suggesting that if there was a nigga water fountain, niggas would be getting hired to fix it. Mom Mom would never say it to Dottio, but she would repeat all the time, Never argue with a fool, because from a distance, people can't tell who's who. So when she would stop arguing with you, you knew what she thought of your position. When I say silly stuff, it makes the world lighter for her. But she needs me to say smart stuff, too. That makes her feel safe. She thinks that the only way I'll be able to survive is if I'm intelligent. She likes about a 60-40 ratio of smart to silly. She's the best audience I've ever had. It's like there's some hidden part of her that even she's not aware of that's always egging me on. Come on, Will, sillier, smarter, sillier, smarter. I like to hit her with stuff that, on the surface, is super silly, and I hide the smart under it to see if she can find it. I like the look on her face when she thinks something is just stupid, and then the smart part sneaks up on her. That's my favorite, too. Comedy is an extension of intelligence. It's hard to be really funny if you're not really smart. And laughter is mom mom's medicine. In a way, 
I'm her little doctor, and the more she laughs, the more silly, smart, spectacular shit I make up. As a child, I would disappear into my imagination. I could daydream endlessly there was nothing more entertaining to me than my fantasy worlds. There was a jazz band at camp, I heard the trumpets, I saw the trombone, the zoot suits, the big dance scene. The worlds that my mind created and inhabited were as real to me as real life, sometimes even more so. This constant stream of images and colors and ideas and silliness became my safe place. And then, to be able to share that space, to be able to transport someone, became the ultimate bliss. I love the ecstasy of a person's rapt attention, taking them on a roller coaster ride of their emotions locked in harmony with my fantasy creation. For me, the border between fantasy and reality has always been thin and transparent, and I've been able to step in and out of each effortlessly. The problem is one man's fantasy is another man's lie. I developed a reputation in the neighborhood as a compulsive liar. My friends felt like they could never trust what I said. This is a strange quirk about me and even continues to this day. It's a running joke among my friends and family that you have to dial back my stories two or three notches to know what actually happened. Sometimes I'll tell a story and then a friend will look at Jada and say, okay, so what really happened? But as a child, what the other kids didn't understand was that I didn't lie about my perceptions, my perceptions lied to me. I would get lost, sometimes I would lose track of what was real and what I had made up. It became a defense mechanism my mind wouldn't even contemplate what was true. I would think, what do they need to hear to be okay? But mom mom got me she delighted in my peculiarities. She made space for me to be as silly and creative as I could be. For instance, for much of my childhood I had an imaginary friend named Magiker. A lot of kids go through the imaginary friend phase usually between 4 and 6 years old. Those imaginary friends are amorphous identities that don't really have any shape or personality. The imaginary friend wants whatever the child wants, hates what the child hates, and so on. It's made up to affirm the child's thoughts and feelings. But Magiker was different, even as I write this book, the memory of Magiker is as vivid and resonant as any of the actual experiences of my childhood. He was a full-blown person. Magiker was a little white boy with red hair, fair skin, and freckles. He always wore a little powder blue polyester suit, with a fire engine red bow tie. His pants rode just a little bit too high, exposing poorly chosen white socks. Whereas most other children's imaginary friends served as projections and affirmations, Magiker had distinct preferences and opinions about what games we should play and where we should go and what we should do. Sometimes, he would disagree with me, other times, he'd make me go outside when I didn't want to. He had strong ideas about certain types of foods and the character of people in my life. Even as I'm sitting here recalling our relationship, I'm thinking, damn it, Magiker, this is my imagination. Magiker was such a significant presence in my childhood that my mom would sometimes set out a separate plate for him at the dinner table. And if she wasn't making any headway with me, she'd talk to Magiker instead. Okay, Magiker, are you ready to go to bed? Fortunately, this was the one thing that Magiker and I always agreed on we were never ready to go to bed. A side effect of being lost in a fantasy life was that I had a lot of eccentric ideas about what was fly, fashionable, or funny. For example, I'm not sure how it developed, but I stumbled into an unfortunate but passionate cowboy boot phase. Man, I loved cowboy boots, in fact, I refused to wear anything else on my feet. I'd wear them with sweatsuits, I'd wear them with jeans. Hell, I even wore them with shorts. Now, a black kid in West Philly in cowboy boots might as well just put a bullseye on his back. Kids would make fun of me and tease me mercilessly, but I didn't understand why. These boots are dope. And the more they laughed, the deeper my commitment to cowboy boots grew. I was always a bit of an oddball. Things that felt normal to me could seem strange to others, and things that other people celebrated sometimes didn't inspire me in the least. Back in the day, 
Huffy mountain bikes were on fire, every kid wanted one. And one Christmas, all my friends on my block got together and we agreed to ask our parents for Huffy bikes that year. The plan was we would all ride our matching bikes to Marion Park, a small park just far enough outside our neighborhood to feel like we were on an adventure. Well, Christmas came, and Santa made good on ten brand new, matching Huffies. Noon rolled around, and everybody was out front. Everybody, that is, except me. See, I didn't ask for a Huffy. Huffies were for suckers. And they were about to witness what a real bike looked like. Because while they had all asked for stock, standard, run-of-the-mill Huffy mountain bikes, I ain't no sheep. I had asked for a bright red Raleigh chopper. Choppers were those low-rider bikes with a big wheel in the back and a tiny one up front, with the handlebars that stuck way up in the air, with the three-speed gear shift and an L-bucket dragster saddle, aka the banana seed. They were like the Harley-Davidson of kids' bikes. You felt like you were on a motorcycle on that thing. It was the undisputed coolest bike on earth. I couldn't sleep the night before imagining my entrance. I had worked out my big reveal, I would wait for everybody to line up out front, ready to go, but I would come out from the back driveway, maintaining the element of surprise. I even planned and practiced what I was gonna say when they saw me on my chopper. What up, suckas, what y'all waiting for? Let's go, and then I'd just ride past them so they would have to catch up with me, Will Smith the leader of the pack, the king of the neighborhood. The moment arrived. I had been watching them from behind the curtains in my living room, I could tell they were all waiting and wondering, where's Will at? And just then I rolled out from the driveway, handlebars scraping the heavens, pedaling smoothly in my cowboy boots that Raleigh chopper first gear was butter. I was the man. I float on by, all eyes on me. I throw the nod, then hit them with the line, what up, suckers, what y'all waitin' for? Let's go. It was quiet for a few seconds. I figured I had M shook. Then I was nearly knocked off my chopper by the roar of laughter that emerged behind me. Teddy Allison literally laid on the ground laughing. Through his tears he managed to say, what the fuck is that John? I hit the brakes and turned to scan the rest of the crowd to see if Teddy was just bussin', or if he was speaking for everybody. Nigga, are you in a biker gang, said Danny Brandon. You can't even see over them handlebars. Michael Barr said quietly, this what happens when you go to white schools. But it didn't matter what they thought, because to me, I was hot. That's one of the things about having an overactive imagination, I could make my mind believe anything. I was able to cultivate an almost delusional level of confidence. And while this somewhat skewed perception of myself would often end in ridicule or getting my ass kicked when I was young, on many occasions throughout my life it served as a superpower. When you are unaware that you shouldn't be able to do something, then you just do it. When my parents told me I couldn't be a rapper because there were no careers in hip-hop, it didn't deter me, because I knew parents just don't understand. When television producers asked me if I could act, I said, of course, even though I had never acted a day in my life I thought, how hard can it be? When movie studios said they couldn't cast me because African American leads don't sell to international audiences, I wasn't necessarily offended, I just couldn't understand how a motherfucker that wrong could have this job. It wasn't just the racism that bothered me, it was the stupidity. People would tell me how I was supposed to be, and it just didn't make any sense. I felt like their rules didn't apply to me. Living in your own little world with your own rules can be an advantage sometimes, but you have to be careful. You can't get too detached from reality. Because there are consequences. My consciousness was an infinite playground that I delighted in exploring. But when I was a kid, the benefits of my fantastical delusions were still far off in the future, and the consequences were front and center. Tolerance and open-mindedness weren't the most common schoolyard virtues in West Philly. Kids could be cruel. And the more eccentric you are, the less mercy you will be shown. 
the playground is a hunting ground where every little boy is testing the limits of his own budding masculinity, attempting to prove himself as stronger and dominant, constantly flexing and challenging other boys, measuring himself against them, and punishing those weaker than himself. I was skinny and profoundly unathletic. My limbs and my torso had a sadly dysfunctional relationship. In addition, I had an overactive imagination and, from what the other kids could tell, I lied incessantly. All this meant that I was singled out by the other boys as an easy and justifiable target on which to prove their dominance. I got pushed around, picked last for games, hit, and spit on you name it, I got it. One day, when I was probably 12 or 13 years old, a bunch of us were playing basketball in the schoolyard. I was fresh to death in my bright green shorts and my favorite cowboy boots. In my mind, I was Magic Johnson, but on the actual court I was more like a figure skater cowboy boots don't necessarily provide the requisite grip or ankle support you might otherwise find in a standard basketball shoe. Basically, I was stumbling all over the place. At some point, the universal basketball bragging began, everybody trying to demonstrate how they could replicate the moves of their favorite players. One guy shouted out Kareem, as he slung up a sky hook. Another screamed out Bird, throwing up a three. But this was Philadelphia in the early 80s how dare they disrespect these Philly streets. There's only one name to yell out on these courts, Dr. J, Julius Irving. So, I said, watch out. Here comes the doc. Move, y'all, I'm about to dunk. Matt Brown bust out laughing. Nigga, you can't dunk. Granted, I had never dunked before, but as soon as I said it, I believed it. As I made my way back to half court, I licked my fingers and wiped the bottom of my cowboy boots for traction. As I prepared to take a running start, I swear to the Almighty I had no doubt I was about to dunk this ball. As I stretched my shoulder to prepare for full extension, the guys started throwing out bets. I bet you three dollars you can't do it, Will. Bet. I clapped back. Get my money ready. I'm in for five, somebody said. I'll take all a y'all's money. Bring it. And I'm agreeing to all of them, because in my mind, this ball is already dunked. The guys all fan out. There's a moment of anticipation, I steady myself, as the murmuring settles. And then, boom. I take off running down the court. I'm seeing the Julius Irving rock the baby cradle dunk in the 1983 final sweep against the Lakers. Cowboy boots clomping, feet flailing, I hit my stride. About to take off, I'm up, I'm flying, the cameras are flashing, the crowd is going crazy. And then silence. And somehow, I'm falling. Backward. Something has gone wrong. Slam, reality hits with the force of paved asphalt. I am not Julia serving. I am out. Cold. The bigger the fantasy you live, the more painful the inevitable collision with reality. If you cultivate the fantasy that your marriage will be forever joyful and effortless, then reality is going to pay you back in equal proportion to your delusion. If you live the fantasy that making money will earn you love, then the universe will slap you awake, in the tune of a thousand angry voices. And if you think you can dunk like Julia serving in cowboy boots, then gravitational reality will invoke a painful and divinely perfect retribution. Let's rewind and see what actually happened, I had clomped my way from half court, all was still going well as I accelerated past the foul line. I took my last dribble, liftoff was smooth not perfect but I was airborne. As I ascended, I got just high enough to hit the rim with the ball, completely halting my forward momentum, thereby causing my legs to fly out from under me. The slang terminology for this particular sporting mishap is hanging yourself on the rim. As I think back, the added weight of the cowboy boots may have exacerbated the torque. I came down hard, directly on the back on my head and neck, knocking myself unconscious. When I wake up, my friend Omer is standing over me. I can see the strobing lights of an ambulance, there's blood in my hair, 
and I have no idea where my left cowboy boot is. I can hear Omer's voice. He's awake. He's awake. Omer is my oldest friend well, except for Stacy Brooks. When he was little, he was so pigeon-toed that he'd be tripping himself and falling and scuffing himself all the time when we were playing. His parents decided that he should have corrective surgery. When he was five, the doctors broke both of his legs and reset them. Omer had leg braces all summer, but when it was time to go to school, all of a sudden, he was the fastest kid on the block and the best dancer. It made us all want the magical surgery. As my vision slowly sharpens, Omer's face slips into focus. I can see in his eyes that my fall must have been pretty bad. He isn't laughing, he's scared. Yo, man, you all right. I do a quick inventory I can move my hands, my arms, my legs, my feet. Nothing broken. I muster an affirmative nod. As they strap me to the stretcher and slide me into the ambulance, I catch a final glimpse of Omer. Yo, oh. It went in, right. A make-believe is a normal part of psychological development. But as we grow up, we start to let go of our fantasy life simply because we discover that living in the real world is more valuable to us than clinging to our fantasies. We have to learn how to deal with others, how to succeed at school and at work, how to survive in the material world. And it's hard to do that if you're unable to perceive reality accurately. As such, we all have to learn to make a distinction between what is real and what is not. In fact, some people make the distinction so well that, as adults, they unfortunately lose the ability to embrace anything other than concrete, material reality. But, for some reason, I didn't go through this process. Or, perhaps, I refused to go through this process. That's because my fantasy life is what protected me from the world. Offered the choice between the infinite playground of my imagination and a reality filled with constant threat, my mind chose fantasy. We all delude ourselves a little bit around the things that scare us. We're afraid of not being accepted by people at work, or at school, or on Twitter, so we convince ourselves that they're stuck up or ignorant or cruel. We concoct entire narratives about other people's lives when in fact we have no clue what they're thinking or feeling or struggling with. We invent these stories to protect ourselves. We imagine all sorts of things to be true about ourselves or the world, not because we've seen evidence for it, but because it's the only thing that keeps us from collapsing back into fear. Sometimes we'd rather blindfold ourselves than take a cold, hard look at the world exactly as it is. The problem is delusion works like poisoned honey it tastes sweet in the beginning but ultimately ends in sickness and misery. The stories we tell ourselves, which are designed for our protection, are the same stories that create the walls that prevent the very connections we so desperately crave. I told myself that I had a friend named Magiker because it made me feel less alone. But that fantasy was also a part of why I was disconnected from the other kids in the neighborhood. Later in my life, I would invent the fantasy that becoming rich and famous would solve all of the other problems in my life. But the pursuit and maintenance of that fantasy only drove the people I loved further away from me. As a child, I told myself that if I kept Dio entertained and made him laugh then he wouldn't hurt my mother. But that fantasy only caused me to feel like a coward, an unworthy son, despite the fact that none of it was my fault. My fantasy life, while in some ways protecting me, also caused me to feel more guilt and shame and more self-loathing. All fantasies eventually fail. No matter how hard you fight, the truth is undefeated, reality remains the undisputed champ. Diadio only took one summer vacation in my entire childhood. When your family sells ice, you are trapped at work from the first week of June, when you get out of school, to just after Labor Day, when you go back. But in the summer of 1976, Dottio decided to take off two months, rent a camper, and drive the family cross-country. There was a family reunion from Gigi's side in Los Angeles. We took the northern route out to LA, and the southern route back to Philly. 
I have seen every nook and cranny of the United States of America. We left Philly and headed west to Pittsburgh to see Mom Mom's childhood home. Her father we called him Pap Pap still lived there. He seemed like a really old version of Dottio. Legend had it that Pap Pap would get so angry sometimes that his nose would bleed and that could be just watching the Steelers. Next stop, Cleveland, to see Aunt Tootie and Uncle Walt. Then Chicago to the Great Lakes, then on to Minneapolis and the Dakotas. We saw prairie dogs, but I don't know why they call them that. They look like tall hamsters that stand upright think time and from the Lion King. Harry got a handmade drum from a Sioux tribal leader in South Dakota. He banged that thing all the way through Mount Rushmore, the Devil's Tower, and into Yellowstone National Park. We saw Old Faithful I couldn't believe they could tell you down to the second exactly when it was going to erupt. The ranger would point and then abracadabra. Huge jets of boiling water shooting up out of the ground. The smell was nasty. Dio said it was sulfur, I was glad to find that out because for a second, I thought it was Ellen. Mom Mom woke us up at sunrise on the top of a mountain in Wyoming. We were above the clouds. This is what heaven must feel like. But then we got stuck for an hour because a black bear walked out into the middle of the road and headed straight for our camper. It was a park rule that you had to turn off your vehicle if there was a bear within 50 feet of you. Dottio slammed the window closed with both hands it's the only memory I have of him ever being scared of anything. After about two weeks, Dottio started commenting that this was the longest period in his life that he'd gone without seeing any black people. Apart from us, of course we're black. Dottio was suffering from Negro Withdrawal Syndrome, or NWS, but one day at a rest stop in Wyoming, he saw a black couple driving away, and he chased them and pulled them over just to shake their hands and say hi. They thought it was very funny. Dottio drove all day to the craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho it looks just like the moon, and you actually feel like you're on it. He was exhausted, but Mom Mom didn't want to be on the moon she didn't feel comfortable there so we never checked into the motel, and Mom Mom drove us south to Salt Lake City. When Dottio woke up, he took us out into the Great Salt Lake. He explained how buoyancy works in salt water versus the fresh water of the Great Lakes, he showed us how easy it is to float. He made ice, so he knew everything about water. But the most incredible thing I'd ever seen in my young life was the Grand Canyon. This entire canyon was carved by water, Mom Mom said. I was in total awe, but I was too scared to approach the edge. I remembered Peter Brady on the Brady Bunch also being amazed about how water could possibly make this canyon. Wow, he said. No wonder you don't like us to leave the water faucets dripping. And just when I thought the day couldn't get any better, Harry accidentally dropped his drum into the canyon. It seemed like it fell for about three days. I was so sick of hearing him bang that thing it felt like the heavens had answered my prayers. This trip expanded and detonated my imagination. Every person we came across seemed like a new and fascinating character, every destination was a dreamland, and I felt like life was just waiting for me to make up the story. The American landscape was so diverse and beautiful there were mountains and prairies and valleys and white water rivers and regular deserts and painted deserts and green forests and petrified forests and corn into infinity and sequoias or redwoods whichever ones we saw touching the sky which was filled with sun sometimes and tornadoes in the distance and funny clouds and scary clouds and all the clouds in between. These were the best eight weeks of my childhood everybody was happy. We were the perfect family. About a block away from Woodcrest, at the end of Graham Street, there was a known sex offender. All the kids in the neighborhood knew about him, and our parents told us to never go anywhere near his house. We rarely saw him he was like a ghost or an urban legend. One day, I saw a little girl going up the front steps to his house he was standing in the open doorway, inviting her in. My heart started pounding in my chest, I thought about calling out to her, but I froze she was too far away, and I could see him. I was terrified. I ran home, up the steps to my bedroom, and slammed the door. Nobody was supposed to go into that house. 
That was the bad man's house. Did he see me? Is he coming to get me? Needing to get as far away as possible, I hid in the closet, shaking. I could feel magicker with me. You have to tell an adult, Will. But I can't. What if the man found out it was me? What if he tries to hurt me for telling on him? Will, go tell your parents right now. I can't I can't I can't. Will. Go. Right now. But all I could do was curl up on the floor of the closet and cry. Will. Get up. You have to go tell your parents. Magicker was angry now. He never got angry. You have to tell someone. You have to get up, now. I closed my eyes and buried my head in my hands. I can't. Just like I couldn't face my father. Just like I couldn't face the neighborhood bullies. I couldn't even tell someone that somebody else was potentially being hurt. What was wrong with me? Why was I always so afraid? Why was I such a coward? I just lay there, trembling. Ashamed. Weak. Moments passed. I took my hands away from my eyes. Magicker was gone. There's a moment when your fantasies recede and you realize that you are still you. Imaginary friends or dunking basketballs won't make the fear go away. They may help you forget for a moment, but reality remains undefeated. Fortunately, someone else had seen the girl enter the house and had intervened. But what if they hadn't? I never saw Magicker again. Performance S. Sunday morning at Resurrection Baptist Church and the monotone voice of Reverend Claudius Amaker echoed across old rickety wooden ceilings, raining down the infallible word of God upon us. My grandmother Gigi, pronounced Zizi, always dressed up for church. To her, the Sunday presentation of yourself was an intentional act of devotion to the Lord. She wore one of those pristine, floral, church lady dresses, perfectly accessorized with the church pearls and the church hat with the giant satin flower pinned to it. During the sermons, she'd fan herself, eyes closed, shaking her head in agreement, chiming in, preach, pastor, say it again, or just a simple mmm hum. Every once in a while, she would glance down at me, checking to make sure I was paying attention. But I was just nine years old. People clapped and swayed and cried and prayed, all the while my nine-year-old mind couldn't help but wonder if the service was ever going to end. Except every third Sunday when the visiting Reverend Ronald West would take the pulpit. Reverend Amaker was our home pastor, and he would talk about the power of God, but all I could hear was the voice of the adults in Charlie Brown wah, 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 wah. Reverend West, though, would show you God's power. He wore stylish red Kazal glasses with a matching three-piece suit, punctuated with the standard bleached white Baptist pocket hanky he was six foot three, two hundred and ten pounds of God's glory. And do not let him near your piano, because after Reverend West played it, you could just wheel that thing out to the trash. Reverend West led the choir. He always started off seated, playing the piano with his left hand, directing the choir with his right, calmly leaning into some slow, Mahalia Jackson, style ballad to warm up the elders. This was just the calm before the storm. Slowly, he would transform, allowing the music to carry him into a trance. Tears would fill his eyes, sweat building on his brow, as he rummaged for his hanka to clear the fog from his glasses. The drums, the bass, the voices, all rising at his command, as if imploring the Holy Spirit to show itself. And then, like clockwork, an ecstatic crescendo, and boom. The Holy Ghost fills the room. Reverend West explodes from his seat, kicking over the stool, both hands possessed, banging in praise on the piano. Then, with a guttural roar, he blazes across the stage to the three-tiered electric organ, demanding that it do what God intended it to do, swirling massive orchestral Baptist chords, all the while sweat flying, the congregation erupting, singing, dancing, old women passing out in the aisles, weeping, Reverend West pointing, directing, 
never once losing control of the choir and the band until his body would collapse in surrender and gratitude for the merciful bliss of God's love. As the music settled, Gigi returned to her seat, dabbing tears from her eyes, and my little heart pounding not even totally sure what that sweet vibration was inside my body all I could think was I want to do that. I want to make people feel like that. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. It's always been funny to me that the first prayer my grandmother taught me was actually a rap. Gigi was Jesus's homegirl. I've met many people who say they are religious. But I've never met anyone who lived out Christ's gospel the way my grandmother did. She walked and talked and embodied the example of Christ. This was not a Sunday thing for her. It was a 24-7-365 thing. Everything she said, everything she did, everything she thought, it was to glorify God. Gigi worked the graveyard shift at the hospital, which allowed both of my parents to maintain full-time jobs. She watched my siblings and me during the day and worked at night. At the young age of four or five, hearing the phrase the graveyard shift filled me with images of ghouls and demons and my superhero grandmother slaying vile creatures just so she could feed me while I lay in bed, safe and sound, caressing the silken edges of my cream-colored puffed blankie. I used to beg her, please don't go, Gigi. Please stay here with me. I felt such guilt. My impressionable mind twisted the situation into a sense of personal failure and weakness. I thought, what kind of kid stays in bed while his grandmother has to fight monsters in a graveyard at midnight? It felt as though she was risking her life to protect me. And in some sense, maybe she was not her life, but she was certainly sacrificing a big part of herself for me, my siblings, and my parents. One day, I'm gonna take care of you, Gigi, I said. Aw, oh, thank you, lover boy. That was her nickname for me. Oh any day we were sitting on Gigi's front porch. She was crocheting a sweater which at some point I was going to be forced to wear when a homeless woman walked by. Her clothes were filthy, her face was darkened and haggard, a mix of dirt and sunburn. Her front teeth were missing. And even though she was down on the street, I could smell the pungent reek of urine. I'd never seen a homeless person before. She looked like a witch to me, and I prayed she'd just walk on by. But Gigi stopped her. Excuse me, miss, what's your name? I was horrified I thought, Gigi, what are you doing? Just let her go. This woman was clearly not used to being asked her name, or at least not recently. She seemed to almost have to remember it. After a long pause, as she sized up my grandmother, she said, Clara. Will, this is Miss Clara, Gigi said, as though they were old friends. With that, Gigi walked down off the porch and put her arm around Clara. I'm Helen, Gigi said, and invited her into the house. My mind was furiously flip-flopping between disgust and terror but it was about to get way worse. First, they went to the kitchen. Gigi didn't give Miss Clara food that was already prepared in the refrigerator, she cooked her a fresh meal, from scratch. While Clara ate, Gigi handed her a robe, took all of her clothes, and washed and folded them. Will. Gigi called out. What could she possibly want with me? I thought. Yes, Gigi. Go run Miss Clara a bath. As I think back, this may be the moment where one of my most famous movie catchphrases was born, oh hell nah. I thought. I ran the bath. Gigi then took Miss Clara upstairs, bathed her with her bare hands, brushed her teeth, and washed her hair. I wanted to scream, Gigi. Stop touching that dirty lady. She's gonna stank up our bathtub but I knew better than to say that. They were both about the same size, so Gigi took Clara to her closet and began holding up clothes in front of her in the mirror to see which ones would fit. Miss Clara was gasping with gratitude. Through tears, she kept saying, This is too much, Helen, way too much. 
Please stop. I don't deserve this. But Gigi wasn't having it. She held both of Clara's hands, gently shaking them to get Clara to look into her eyes. Jesus loves you, and so do I, Gigi said. That was the end of the discussion. Gigi didn't make a distinction between your burdens and her own. She truly believed the message of the gospel. She saw loving and serving others not as a responsibility but as an honor. I never heard her gripe about working the graveyard shift. Never heard her say a negative word about my father, even though he had beaten her daughter. With her Bible in hand, her arms were open not only for us but for everyone. She was joyfully her brother's and sister's keeper. Gigi was the moral compass that has guided my entire life. She was my conduit to God. If Gigi was happy with me, that meant that God was happy with me, but if she was unhappy, that meant that the universe was displeased. Gigi's approval of me meant that the universe approved of whatever I was doing. In my mind, she had a direct line to God. When she was talking, I felt like I was getting explicit instructions from God. So her approval wasn't simply the adoration of a loving, gentle grandmother her approval was how I would access and harness the power and favor of the Lord. Gigi personified my understanding of holiness and divinity. To this day, when I ask myself, what makes a person good, my mind immediately pictures my grandmother. When I sat in those hard wooden pews at Resurrection Baptist as a kid, I didn't understand the meaning of the sermons or the intricacies of scripture. But I got Gigi. She lived as Christ taught her to live. She walked the walk. And through her, I saw God's love. I felt God's love. And that love gave me a sense of hope. Gigi was light. She illuminated the possibility that life could be beautiful. W. Hen I think back to my childhood, I visualize my father, my mother, and Gigi arranged as a philosophical triangle. My father was one side of the triangle, discipline. He taught me how to work, how to be relentless. He instilled in me an ethic that it's better to die than to quit. My mother, education. She believed that knowledge was the irrevocable key to a successful life. She wanted me to study, to learn, to grow, to cultivate a deep and broad understanding, to either know what you're talking about or be quiet. Gigi, love, God. Whereas I tried to please my mother and father so I wouldn't get into trouble, I wanted to please Gigi so that I could bathe in that transcendent ecstasy of divine love. These three ideas discipline, education, and love would fight for my attention throughout the rest of my life. Gigi was obsessed with this one Broadway play from the 1960s called Pearly Victorious that was turned into the musical Pearly in 1970. Written by Ossie Davis, it was the story of a black preacher named Pearly who went down to Georgia, opened a church, and began saving enslaved people from an evil plantation owner. One year, Gigi decided all the kids at church had to perform Pearly. We had to learn every word, and every song, front to back. She would have my siblings and me practice in the living room, record player blaring, as we sang and danced along. Forty years later, I can still sing you every song from Pearly. Gigi was always encouraging me to perform. She was the self-appointed head of special events at Resurrection Baptist Church and organized all of the Easter recitations, nativity reenactments, the Thanksgiving feeding of the poor, holiday talent shows, post-baptism potluck dinners, and on and on you name it, she planned it. As soon as my brother and sisters and I could talk, Gigi had us up in front of the congregation giving a rendition of some biblical something, for all to see and enjoy. Both my parents encouraged music as well. We all took piano lessons as kids because mom mom played. My brother, Harry, blew a saxophone badly for a while, and I took drum lessons briefly in middle school, including a thankfully forgettable stint of using a snare in the Our Lady of Lords marching band. But the piano was the only instrument that actually liked me. One of the more famous moments on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was the final scene of the pilot, where after an argument with Uncle Phil, he leaves the room and I sit down on the piano bench. 
the producers had originally planned on me sitting with my back to the piano so they could push the camera in on my face as I pondered the profundity of Uncle Phil's closing words. But when I sat down, I faced the piano, and began playing Mom Mom's favorite, Beethoven's for Elise. James Avery, stunned, stepped back around the corner. The set went silent as everyone realized this show was about to be special. The whole point of the scene had been to never judge a book by its cover. The producers were so inspired by this improvisational moment that they kept it, and it became the defining thematic premise of the entire series. But my greatest piano performance had come a decade earlier. I was 11 years old, and Gigi had organized a children's talent show, followed by an Easter egg hunt in Resurrection Hall. I had been practicing the Morris Albert song feelings as a part of my piano lessons. Gigi had made me play it for her every night for a month. Then she sprung it on me. Lover boy, I want you to play this song for everybody at church on Easter. At the time, it was the only song I knew how to play, and I had never played the piano in front of anybody except my family. Wait, Gigi, no, I can't, I'm not ready. I said. I'm gonna mess up the notes. She smiled. Ah, baby, she said, gently caressing my cheek, God doesn't care if you hit the notes right. Gigi had a magical, invisible power, she would never apply force, yet no one could resist her overwhelming energy. And so it was that two weeks later I found myself dressed in a cream, pinstripe three-piece Easter suit, sitting at the piano in Resurrection Hall. Gigi beaming in the wings. My hands trembling. Two hundred faces gazing. Silence. Anticipation. My heart pounding out of my chest it felt like it wanted to leave whether I decided to or not. And Gigi gave me the nod. I took a deep breath, somehow found an F, and began. The way the piano was situated on stage, I had eye contact with Gigi the whole time. Morris Albert's feelings was ringing through Resurrection Hall for an audience of 200 people. But I was only playing for one person. And the look on her face. I still struggle to describe it. The words pride or approval are pale and inadequate. I can only say that I have been chasing that look in the eyes of every woman I've ever loved ever since. I've never felt more certain of someone's adoration. All my career, my performances, my albums everything has been a relentless, unbroken quest to relieve the delicious purity I felt when I played feelings at Resurrection Hall for my Gigi. I didn't have to do anything different, I didn't have to be anything different. In that moment, just as I was, bum notes and all, I was enough. I began to perform all the time. Whether I was making up skits for my parents, or reenacting a movie for my friends, or singing songs at church for Gigi, performance became my little secret oasis of love. It gave me the warmth of affection but behind the protection of a mask. It was perfect, I could hide myself and be loved at the same time, mitigating the risk of vulnerability but gaining everything. I was hooked. But it would take me another 40 years before I understood that I had misinterpreted my grandmother's deepest lesson. If I had understood what she was truly trying to teach me, this book would end right here. But as you can see, there are 19 more chapters. One year, during Christmas Eve services Resurrection Hall decorated from entry to altar, adorned to a level that even Jesus may have thought was a bit too much Gigi was peacefully swaying to the choir's soothing rendition of blessed assurance. I watched her rock and hum, and I found myself becoming hypnotized by her tranquility. She was not quite smiling, but the soft rise in the corners of her mouth betrayed an invincible serenity. I would later come to recognize this look as the look that people have when they know things that the rest of us don't. She caught me staring. Yes, lover boy. Gigi, why you so happy all the time? I whispered. Now she was fully smiling. She paused, like a gardener preparing to sow essential seeds. She leaned over and whispered in my ear, I trust God. And I am so thankful for His grace in my life. I know that every single breath I take is a gift. 
and it's impossible to be unhappy when you're grateful. He put the sun in the sky, and the moon. He gave me you. And our whole family. And for all of that, he only gave me one job. What's your job, Gigi? To love and care for all his children, she said. So everywhere I go, I try to make everything I touch better. Then she reached out and touched the end of my nose. Boop. See. I've e been called nigger to my face five or six times in my life twice by police officers, a couple of times by random strangers, once by a white friend, but never by anyone who I thought was smart or strong. I once heard some of the white kids at school joke about catch a nigger, kill a nigger day, an apparently well-known holiday in their neighborhoods. Back in the early 1900s, some of Philly's white community members would pick a specific day to assault any black person they saw walking around their neighborhood. Seventy years later, some of my Catholic school classmates still thought it was funny to joke about it. But every encounter I've ever had with overt racism was with people I estimated to be weak enemies at best. They always seemed unintelligent, angry, and to me, easily circumvented or defeated. So, consequently, overt racism although dangerous and ever-present as an external threat never made me feel inferior. I was raised to believe that I am inherently equipped to handle any problems that may arise in my life, racism included. Some combination of hard work, education, and God would topple any and all obstacles and enemies. The only variable was the level of my commitment to the fight. But as I grew older, I started to become more aware of the silent, unspoken, and more insidious forms of prejudice lurking around me. I'd get in more trouble for doing the same things my white classmates would do. I got called on less often, and I felt like teachers took me less seriously. I spent most of my childhood straddling and navigating two cultures, my black world of home and the neighborhood, Resurrection Baptist, and Adios Shop, and the white world of school, Catholic Church, and the prevailing culture of America. I went to an all-black church, lived on an all-black street, and grew up playing with mostly other black kids. But at the same time, I was one of only three black children attending Our Lady of Lords, the local Catholic K-8. At school, it was impossible to not feel like an outcast. I didn't dress like the white kids. I didn't listen to Led Zeppelin or ACDC, and I never got my head around lacrosse. I simply didn't fit in. But back in the neighborhood, I didn't quite fit in, either. I didn't talk like the other kids or use the slang they did my mother didn't even allow us to say ain't at home. Mom mom worked for the school board of Philadelphia, and she was a stickler for words. One day, she heard me yell out to my friends, hey, where y'all gone be at? Her head whipped around in disbelief, like that girl from The Exorcist. I hope they're going to be behind that preposition, mom mom said. At Catholic school, no matter how well-spoken or intelligent, I was still the black kid. In Winfield, no matter how up I was on the latest music or fashion, I was never quite black enough. I became one of the first hip-hop artists who was considered safe enough for white audiences. But with black audiences, I was labeled soft because I wasn't rapping about hardcore, gangster shit. This racial dynamic is something that has plagued me in various forms throughout my entire life. But just like at home, performance and humor became my sword and shield. I was your classic class clown, telling jokes, making silly noises, being all around ridiculous. As long as I was the funny kid, it meant I wasn't just the black kid. Funny is colorblind, comedy diffuses all negativity. It is impossible to be angry, hateful, or violent when you're doubled over laughing. But I started to notice that a joke that would kill at Our Lady of Lords would garner blank stares in Winfield and vice versa. I realized that white people and black people responded differently to my humor. My white friends tended to lean into my bigger, broader moments, when I was light and silly and displayed a cartoon-like physicality. One of the white boys in Lords once tried to light his fart in the bathroom, I thought that was a little far to get a laugh, but it worked. They also liked puns and wordplay, 
witty sarcasm, and they demanded a happy ending everyone had to come out okay. My black friends preferred their jokes more real and raw and demanded a gritty slice of truth at the core of the comedy. They saw my silliness as weakness I would have got the whole shit kicked out of me if I'd tried to light a fart in Winfield. They responded better when my humor sprang from strength, from more of a battle mentality put-downs, insults, disses, and nothing played bigger than smashing somebody who was talking shit. They loved it when someone got what was coming to them karmic justice even if the somebody was them. As black people, we love laughing at ourselves. When we can joke about something our pains, our problems, our tragedies it makes them just a little bit more bearable. I learned to move between these two worlds. If I was making the kids on the corner laugh, I wasn't getting my ass kicked. If I was making the white kids at school laugh, I wasn't a nigger. If I was making Dottio laugh, it meant my family was safe. I began to equate laughter with safety. The little scientist in my head started searching for what I called the number one answer. The number one answer is the perfect, mythical joke that obliterates everyone who hears it, no matter their race, creed, color, age, nation of origin, sexual orientation no one would be safe from the power of this joke. Throughout my career, and quite honestly, my entire life, this has been an obsession for me. I am forever seeking the perfect wording, the perfect tone of voice, the perfect delivery, the perfect physicality, the perfect swagginess, all of which would coalesce into a perfect moment of comedic nirvana and unalloyed human harmony. But despite my high aspirations, life at Our Lady of Lords grew more and more difficult. I've always been reluctant to ascribe the escalating issues between myself and the school to racism. The subtle forms of disrespect, the multiple suspensions in 7th and 8th grade, exclusions from parties and school events. I've often wondered if it was more about me being Baptist in a Catholic school than being black in a white world. The school wanted my parents to have me baptized Catholic, but they refused even though doing so would have meant a 20% reduction in the yearly tuition. They knew that Lords was so much better academically than the local public schools, so they insisted that I tough it out. The breaking point came halfway through my 8th grade year. I played on my middle school football team, and I had proven myself as the top defensive back of the season 17 interceptions in 10 games. Each year, the football team would have a banquet where all the players, parents, and the coaches hosted a dinner to honor the team at the end of the season. The kids who won awards were supposed to sit at the front and then walk up on stage and be recognized. Since I had the most interceptions on the team, I was set to receive my trophy, Defensive Player of the Year. But a week before the banquet, I was informed by Sister Agnes that because I had been suspended from school, before the football season had even started, I wouldn't be allowed to sit up front or receive an award on stage. I was disappointed, but I figured that was fair it was a rule, and everybody knew I won anyway. But on the night of the banquet, I saw my white friend Ross Dempsey sitting at the front, preparing to receive his trophy, even though we had gotten suspended together. This injustice infuriated me. I leaned over to Mom Mom and Dottio and told them what was going on. Without a word, they looked at each other, and in a moment of rare but potent agreement, they stood up, and we left. We drove home that night in silence. A few days later, over dinner, without looking up from his meal, Dottio said, We're done with that school. And that was that. Tea Hat Summer was hot. Business was booming and cash was flowing so Dottio treated himself to a Kodak Super 8 home movie camera and projector. This was dope as hell. It had one of those big rubber eyepieces and a little leather strap for your wrist so you didn't drop your whole summer's worth of money off your back patio. Had Dottio grown up in a different time or place, he definitely would have been an artist. When he was a teenager, one of his school teachers loaned him a camera and he fell in love with photography. He ran all over North Philly snapping photos and later learned to develop film in a darkroom. But when it started to consume all of his time and attention, his parents and teachers reminded him that he needed to work and make money. Photography was an expensive hobby. 
so when he was sent to boarding school, they made him give the camera back. His heart was broken, but Dadio never lost his love for photography. His new Super 8 camera turned him into one of those dads, the kind who, at birthday parties and barbecues, would follow all the kids around filming everything they did, making us smile, do tricks, or be funny. Because the camera didn't have sound, he encouraged us to wildly over-exaggerate our movements Charlie Chaplin, style to communicate his narrative without words. Dottio let go behind the camera. When there was work to be done, he was all about order and discipline. But when his camera was rolling, he wanted to see me jumping around and being silly. I ate up the attention you could not keep me out of his picture frame, even when he was not trying to shoot me. I invented photo bombing. After we would shoot, Dottio would rush down into the basement, throw a sheet up on the wall, and carefully feed the delicate reels of film into the projector. Following a series of frustrating snags and misfires, the sheet would suddenly light up with us. A road trip here, a birthday party there. These were our family's highlights. Dottio would sometimes play the guitar, too. Glass of Chivas Regal on the side table, a tarot and 100 dangling out of his mouth, his eyes squinting from the dancing smoke, he'd pick the chords to Andy Williams's The Shadow of Your Smile, or attempt some intricate jazz rip that his working man's hands were just too battered to perfect. He'd pluck, strum, and even sing. It was always something romantic, love songs seemed to put him in a good mood. My mom, too. The music and home movies brought peace to the house. I think our home movies depicted Dottio's dream of a perfect, happy family. And by a strange alchemy, what was true on the screen became true in the basement as we all watched together. In every image we were all smiling, laughing, having fun. There was no fear, no tension, no violence. For those brief moments, Dottio's life imitated his art, as we all smiled and laughed and sang along. Peace psychologists have written about how our relationship with our parents in childhood and early adolescence creates our map for understanding love in adulthood. When we interact with our parents as children, some behaviors and attitudes win us attention and affection and other behaviors and attitudes cause us to feel abandoned, unsafe, and unloved. The behaviors and attitudes that win us affection often come to define what we understand as love. Dottio appreciated when I worked hard and performed his directed orders with intensity and precision. He applauded when I was disciplined in laying a perfect brick toward the construction of a perfect wall. Mom Mom loved when I used my brain she applauded the thinker within me, when my wit and intellect were most on display. My mom is my prototype, patient, brilliant, formidable, nurturing. She'd prefer to do things together, but she's going to be fine with or without you. Mom mom can carry it all for a while if you need to take a break. With Gigi, there was something majestic and empowering about how she loved me. Whenever I performed for her, I felt like I was plugged into the force, like I couldn't lose. She was like the sun to me. If I could just make the world see me the way Gigi saw me when I played feelings, then that was it. That was the mountaintop. The concepts of love and performance became fused in my mind. Love became something earned by saying and doing the right things. In my mind, great performances got you love, bad performances left you abandoned and alone. An exquisite performance secured affection. But if you sucked, you sucked by your damn self. I performed to placate my father to quell his fouler moods. I performed to distract my family from the growing tension and resentment that was consuming our home. I performed to get the kids in my neighborhood to like me. As such, I began to see happiness for myself and my loved ones as a function of my ability to perform. If I performed well, we would all be safe and happy. If my performance faltered, we were in trouble. Dottio was at his most loving either behind a camera or projector. Therefore, I always wanted to be in front of his camera, and he always wanted me in front of it. It was one of the few times in my childhood where he and I were perfectly aligned. I loved being in my father's home movies. 
it brought me closer to him. And that deep craving for his love and approval undoubtedly played a role in my desire to perform on film later on in life. Throughout my life, I have been haunted by an agonizing sense that I am failing the women I love. Over the years, in my romantic relationships, I would always do too much. Coddling, overprotecting, desperately trying to please them, even when they were totally fine. This insatiable desire to please manifested as an exhausting neediness. To me, love was a performance, so if you weren't clapping, I was failing. To succeed in love, the ones you care for must constantly applaud. Spoiler alert, this is not a way to have healthy relationships. W. Hen I was 13 years old, Dottio hit mom mom for the last time. She'd had enough. She went to work the next morning and didn't come home. She didn't go far just a few blocks to Gigi's house but the message was clear, she was done. This was the first of only two times in my life that I contemplated suicide. I thought about pills, I knew where a boy had lost his legs on the train tracks, I had seen people cut their wrists in a bathtub on TV. But what kept ringing in my mind was a faint memory of hearing Gigi say that killing yourself was a sin. Dottio reverted to full military protocols. He was now in absolute command, he was going to do it all. He woke up at four that next morning to prepare breakfast. He was determined to prove that he didn't need mom mom. By 5.30, the plates were on the table, half an apple, sunny side eggs, and a slice of scrapple. A pitcher of orange juice and a pitcher of milk. Mom mom never did pitchers. By six, Ellen and I were sitting at the table. Harry knew he was supposed to be down by six. I guess 604 was my brother's silent protest. Dottio let it go, he would never have ordinarily let it go, 604 would usually have meant no breakfast for Harry. The food had been sitting out for 30 minutes, so the eggs were cold, and the half apple was turning brown. Ellen and I ate quietly. The eggs are hard, Harry said. Dottio seemed to not even hear him, he was washing the dishes. Start clean. Stay clean was one of Dottio's maxims. He used it for cooking and at work. You clean up as you go along, not leaving one big mess for the end. Harry's nose turned up at the food. The apple is all brown, Harry said. Please, Harry, just leave him alone. And what's this mess? Harry said, poking the scrapple with his finger. Without a word, Dottio snatched up Harry from the chair and carried him to the front door, opened it, and deposited Harry outside. He then handed Harry his book bag and slammed the door. Harry didn't come home that day after school. He went to Gigi's house and moved in with Mom Mom. When Harry left, it was just as painful for me as Mom Mom leaving. I wanted to be with her, too, but I was too scared to leave. It only solidified my deepest insecurity. I could no longer deny the truth, I was a coward. Mom Mom lived at Gigi's for three years. We saw Mom Mom every day. She would bring us lunch, and we would stop by Gigi's, sometimes spend the night. The houses were close enough that we maintained our outward proximity, but on the inside, our family was broken. It was during this time that I began to escape into television. I found solace and joy in the perfectly crafted family narratives of my favorite sitcoms, Happy Days, Good Times, The Brady Bunch, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy and Jack Tripper on Three's Company was the truth. I idealized the families I saw on TV. They were doing exactly what I had been trying to do they'd have a problem, Mr. Cunningham would be pissed, Richie would be scared, it would look bad for a minute, but then the phones would say something funny, bang the jukebox, everybody laughed, and they all lived happily ever after. Yes. Exactly. It's not that fucking hard. I wanted to be the happy-go-lucky teenager who always got along with his parents. I wanted to have a mother and father who loved each other. I wanted to live with two beautiful girls against Mr. Roper's rules. At a minimum, I felt I deserved a quirky alien who would come down from Orc and solve all my problems. 
Instead, I was trapped in chaos. But my biggest obsession as a kid was the television show Dallas. The Ewings were a large, wealthy Texas oil family, led by J.R., the iron-willed patriarch. He ruled the Ewing clan much like Dottio ruled the Smiths. Except J.R. Ewing was hella rich. People give you a whole lot more leeway when your family compound has a name. That blew my mind. Their house had a name. South Fork was a 300-acre ranch in North Texas. The entire Ewing family brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents, in-laws, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews everybody lived at South Fork. I wanted my whole family to live together like that. I will never forget the scene that changed my life. In retrospect, it was just a small moment, it was a normal sunny day in North Texas. The Ewing family was assembling for the mandatory family meal. They cut to an exterior shot of the palatial mansion, and Sue Ellen, J.R.'s wife, came to breakfast on a horse. My young mind would never be the same. She came from her house on the property to the family house on the property on a fucking horse. To me, South Fork was heaven, a property where everybody lives together and my wife could come to breakfast on a fucking horse. Meanwhile, in the real world, I buried my shortcomings further under layers and layers of performance. I adopted a personality that was indefatigably cheery, upbeat, and positive. I responded to the dissonance of my world by remaining purely constant, I was always smiling. Always fun and ready to laugh. Nothing wrong in my world. One day, I would be in charge, and everything was going to be perfect. We are going to have a big house on a huge property and everybody's going to live together, and I'll take care of everybody. I would be the golden child. My mother's savior. My father's usurper. It was going to be the performance of a lifetime. And over the next 40 years, I would never break character. Not once. P.O.E.R.P.A.U.L. was in trouble. He was getting into fights, staying out late, Sneaking to New York from his home in Jersey to hang with the wrong crowds I heard Mom Mom say he'd even knocked out a cop. He was 18 years old, and my Aunt Barbara couldn't handle him anymore. Desperate, she called the one person she knew who could help, Dottio. It had been a few years since any of us had seen my cousin Paul. We all remembered him as a sweet but serious kid. But when he showed up in Philly in the summer of 1983, he was a grown-ass man. Paul was tall now, his shoulders were broad, and he was shredded. This dude was a brick. The knuckles on his hands had scratches and cuts and keloid scars that he clearly did not get from cooking. He sported a huge afro with a black power, fist pick stuck in the top. But his pick was the special edition that had the peace sign cut out of the wrist slash handle. And if that didn't get your attention, Paul also went everywhere with an attack-trained German shepherd named Duke. Paul had recently achieved his first-degree black belt in Kung Fu, and proudly walked around West Philly dressed in his G.I. and Kung Fu slippers. He was full-on into his militant black power face. He was like the no-bullshit, real-life version of Bruce Leroy from the movie The Last Dragon. Paul never said much, but when he did speak, he was unfailingly polite he would karate bow all the time and end every sentence with either a yes, sir or no, ma'am. He stayed to himself, and he didn't bother anybody, but if you fucked with him, and he snapped two words, scorched. Earth. Be why this time, Dottio's business, Akrak, air conditioning, refrigeration, air compressors, was poppin'. It had expanded and morphed beyond just refrigeration repair. When he would sell his clients new refrigeration equipment, they would often pay him just to get the old ones out of their stores. His shop became a sort of graveyard for refrigerators and ice machines. But instead of sending them to the junkyard, Dottio would work day and night to refurbish and rebuild them. Before he knew it, he had the capacity to produce thousands of pounds of ice each day from machines that had been thrown away as trash. And just like that, our family was now in the cubed ice business, manufacturing, packaging, 
and delivering bags of ice throughout Philadelphia, into Jersey, and even as far as Delaware. The problem was that bagging thousands of pounds of ice each day required labor. A lot of labor. And because ice is cheap, you need the labor to be cheap. It started with me and Harry and Ellen and both my sisters Pam, and then all of our friends. And then Dadio started recruiting extended family and all of their friends. Child labor laws were very different back in the day, so pretty soon, every kid in the neighborhood was bagging ice. Akrak was the way kids stayed off the street and made a little money for the summer. Dadio had become a kind of kid whisperer in Winfield. Because he was so military minded, he was instilling structure and discipline to the level that most of these kids had never experienced. And he paid cash. If a kid was late, he sent them home. If someone cursed or fought, they were out. The kids' parents loved it their kids were earning cash money and learning respect and discipline. Dadio was in his lane. So, when Paul started getting in trouble, my Aunt Barbara shipped him to Philly hoping that the structure, and cash, of Dadio's ice house would change his life's trajectory. But it was my trajectory that would end up being forever changed. PAUL moved in with us in late May, just in time for the summer ice rush. He had me walk him around the neighborhood. I showed him where Mr. Bryant's was, and I introduced him to my friends I was showing off my cool ass cousin. Paul loved hanging with me he thought I was hilarious. He started showing me how to connect with Duke, and even shared the secret attack commands which were in German, a German shepherd, trained in German I thought that was hot. And best of all, he was teaching me Kung Fu. That summer, he became a kind of big brother that I never had. Dadio ran Akrak the same way he ran our house, as a commander. He would yell and rant and curse, we'd all be terrified, walking on eggshells, hoping he wouldn't explode. But Paul was the first person I ever met who wasn't bothered in the least by Dadio's anger or outbursts. When Dadio would flip, Paul would get totally calm and still, never taking his eyes off Dadio. Paul's body language was very clear, you can say anything you want, old man, as long as you say it over there. But if you come over here, two words. Scorched. Earth. I was amazed Paul and Dadio got along perfectly. The idea that someone could be confronted by the Dadio ogre, stand in the storm of his rage and fury and disarm him with nothing more than a look and a laugh. I had never experienced that kind of power. Paul's martial arts training allowed him to submit to Dadio's authority. He respected him, but he was not afraid of him, because deep down inside, Paul knew that if he needed to, he could kill him. And Dadio knew that, too. For the first time in my childhood, Paul made me feel safe in my own home. He was powerful. If Paul was around, no one would mess with me. Not the neighborhood kids. Not the white boys from school. Not even Dadio. And just when I thought it was impossible for my cousin to get any cooler, he unlocked the world of hip hop. B. Act then, hip hop wasn't what it is now. There had been a couple of hits, but for the most part it was still underground. There were no albums or singles, no radio play, no videos you had to know somebody who knew somebody who could get you a cassette tape of one of the live performances exploding from the epicenter, New York City. People would literally go stand in the audience at a party and hold up a boom box over their heads to record the performers. That's how mixtapes were created people physically going to a party and holding a big ass radio up in the air for an hour, two hours, then making copies of the tape and giving them to their friends. People in New York would cut a tape of some of their favorite hip hop artists, make a copy, then take it to their friend in Boston, mail one to their brother in LA, or play one for their little cousin in Philly. These tapes got traded, sold, copied, and traded again. This hand-to-hand -hand exchange across the country was what drove the rocket-fueled expansion of hip-hop. It was grassroots. It was viral before anyone knew what going viral was. It was straight from the street to the heart. Back in the 1970s in New York City, black communities would throw block parties. They'd shut down their block, 
and a DJ short for disc jockey would bring out a turntable and a box of records and play on the street for everybody to dance. Given that this was the 1970s, most of what they played was funk and disco music. The songs in both funk and disco always featured instrumental sections somewhere in the middle. The song would be jamming along, and then it would begin to rise, until it reached a soaring crescendo with every instrument at full blast, and then boom. Nothing but the drummer. This became known as the break. Break beats were designed to have a little extra splato to M. The break was the time for performers like James Brown to show off their dance moves, but as it turned out, the breaks became the hottest part of the song and always set the party on fire. Because everybody loved dancing to the breaks so much, one day at a block party in the Bronx, a guy named DJ Cool Herc came up with the idea to bring out two turntables and have two of the same record. That way, he could switch back and forth between them, playing only the break, and keeping it going indefinitely. Two turntables and a mixer also meant that he could blast between James Brown and the Winstons and back to Brown then to Sly and the Family Stone from break to break to break, only playing the favorite 10 seconds of everybody's favorite records. This created a frenzied, new style dance party. And modern DJing was born. Because the DJ now had two turntables and a mixer, another innovation emerged, scratching. Scratching was done by moving a record back and forth, creating a wild new sound in music. One of the records could be scratched while the other played the break. The record being scratched would then be released, perfectly on beat, and then the process was flipped so that the break could continue for as long the people wanted to hear it. And the only thing that was missing from the equation to make it hip-hop was rapping. DJs now had two turntables and twice as many records. The demands of the craft consumed more and more of their attention, preventing them from being able to interact with the crowd as much as they used to. So they started bringing their brother or one of their friends along to be on the mic to engage with the crowd. These masters of ceremonies would talk to the audience, hype them up, brag about the DJ, and generally entertain the audience, ladies, let me hear ya. Who got a hundred dollars in they pocket? Where Brooklyn at? Eventually, the most creative MCS started to talk in rhymes to the rhythm of the breakbeats a flavor imported from Jamaican immigrants known as rapping. The block parties began to blaze. Especially when the rhymes were clever, funny, poetic, or, best of all, when they shouted out your neighborhood. The equation was now complete, DJing plus MSing equals hip-hop. And the world was not ready. PAUL's troublesome escapes to New York City had given him access to all the mixtapes. He knew people who were down with a crew called the Zulu Nation, an early collective of hardcore hip-hop enthusiasts based out of the New York-slash-New Jersey area. He could get me any tape, Grandmaster Flash, Mel Mel and the Furious Five, The Treacherous Three, Cool Modi battling Busy B. Starsky, and my all-time favorite, Grandmaster Kaz and the Cold Crush Brothers. Grandmaster Kaz was single-handedly, undeniably, the greatest influence of my hip-hop life. He was the prototype for the Fresh Prince. He was one of hip-hop's first storytellers. Kaz was witty, he was clever, his verses took you on a journey, you'd be on the edge of your seat listening to him rap, always wondering what was gonna happen next. And most of all, my dude knew how to land a punchline. I wanted to be just like Cos. In fact, my first hit single, Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, was inspired by weight, no, influenced by. Okay, basically, I studied every single line of a Grandmaster Cos mixtape freestyle called Yvette and then wrote my own version of his story. I guess why I connected to him so much was that I had had a similar experience to what he describes in Yvette, but it never dawned on me to write a rhyme about it. In a way, Cos validated and unleashed a creative part of me that I never thought anybody would care about. He made it okay to be me. It was a long time ago, but I'll never forget I got caught in the bed with this girl named Yvette I was scared like hell, but I got away that's why I'm here talking to you today. I was outside of my school, shooting up the rock a crowd of people gathered round listening to my box it was me, 
the L, the A, and the L and then I slipped away to make a phone call and to this very day it was a MOE I regret but I didn't know it then, so I called Yvette. There's probably no need to point out the similarities, but to gild the proverbial lily, I always loved that Kaz was on a basketball court when he makes the call to Yvette. So in the theme song for The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I put my character on a basketball court, to a quiet homage to the legend. I am not exactly sure when I became a rapper. Back then, hip-hop wasn't something we did it was what we were. Hip-hop was not just our music it was dance, it was fashion, street art, politics, social justice. It was everything, it was life, it was us. Outsiders didn't see it as a legitimate genre of music to pursue and perfect, but we weren't even thinking about it in those terms. It was something new, fresh, fun, and exciting that was growing around us and within us. None of us thought it was going to blow up and dominate the world like it does today, and if someone had asked, where do you think hip-hop will be in 40 years, I probably wouldn't have said, oh, it'll be one of the most impactful forms of music in the history of humankind. We simply loved what we were doing, so we kept doing it. I still remember the first rhyme I ever wrote, I was 12 years old, at the age of 1, I had just begun, on my journey to the T.O.P. And at age 2, everybody knew, that I was a hella edha MC. At age 3, any sure shot could see, I was a bona de low ER at heart. I got an IQ of 142 and, like my name, I'm a work of art. Fortunately, I got better. With Paul's tapes and encouragement, I became obsessed. I was already an incessant talker and performer. But now I was walking around all day, quietly babbling and rapping to myself, constructing new rhymes, reciting my favorite verses, trying to freestyle on whatever was going on around me. I went out and bought one of those black and white speckled composition notebooks and started writing down my rhymes and practicing them in my room in the mirror. My fantasy-driven mind would splash all over those pages, sometimes even surprising me by what came out. My creative river was raging. Rapping was the most natural thing in the world to me. And from the cocoon of a bullied, awkward kid, emerged a natural-born killer MC Overbrook High School was located less than a mile away from Our Lady of Lords. But it may as well have been on another planet. The environments could not have been more different. Whereas Lords bordered the wealthy white neighborhood of Lower Marion, Overbrook was the center of a section called Hilltop, which anchored the poorer black neighborhoods of West Philadelphia. Our Lady of Lords was a small, intimate Catholic school with only a few dozen kids per grade, most of them white. I had been one of only three or four black kids in the entire place. But Overbrook was nicknamed the Castle on the Hill. It was gigantic an absolute monster of a structure. Built in 1924, back when they used real materials to build buildings, it spanned two square city blocks and loomed over the neighborhood like a stone fortress. You had to ascend a mountain of 30 stairs just to make it from the sidewalk to the front door, and if you survived the climb, what you found inside was nearly 1,200 students, 99% of them black. Swarms of kids buzzed through the city block long hallways. At Lord's, everyone had known who I was, but when I walked into Overbrook on my first day, I was completely anonymous. I was intimidated and terrified. As I look back with today's understanding, I was probably on the edge of a panic attack. My heart was racing, my hands were shaking, but by this time I had developed an infallible strategy for coping with my fear, performance. If I could get them laughing and smiling, then I would feel safe. I'm still not exactly sure why I did what I did that first day. It was a reflex, some bizarre automatic defense mechanism, as though my emotional immune system had kicked in and took control of my mouth. I was talking before I knew what I was going to say, and thereby started my high school career with maybe the stupidest thing I had done in my life up until that point. Just before 8 a.m., EST, a couple hundred kids gathered in the sprawling cafeteria for orientation. We were the new kids, there to get acclimated, to get our class assignments, 
and to be officially welcomed to Overbrook High School. As I entered the cafeteria, the mounting pressure of my anxiety finally became too much. I put my hands up into the air and shouted, Excuse me, excuse me, may I have everybody's attention please? The room quieted, 200 students all turned and looked at me. He's here, I said, pointing to myself. Y'all can relax, because he's here. You're welcome. Go head back to what y'all doin'. I'll be here if y'all need me. There was a strange silence clearly, this was an educational first for most of the kids. A couple of them chuckled, then most just went back to doing what they had been doing before they were so bizarrely interrupted. I'm not sure what response I had hoped for from the crowd, but the outburst had at least purged most of my anxiety and tension. As I ventured deeper into the room, I slid past a dude who had clearly not been impressed by my announcement. Without looking up, he said, Man, don't nobody give a fuck that you hear. Without missing a beat, I leaned down to him and said, EY, just give me ten minutes, your girl gone care. Oh oh. The voices around us rang out, there were even a couple claps. The kid looked at me for a second but didn't say a word. He gave this stiff chin nod not a nod of agreement but a nod of AI, so that's how it's gonna be. I moved on victoriously, thinking, maybe this high school thing ain't gonna be so bad. At 8.31, orientation was complete, and the students were all released into the overbrick halls to juke and fumble and stumble around until we located our homeroom classes. My homeroom was 315, and as I was rounding the stairs between the second and third floors, I saw the dude from the lunchroom out of the corner of my eye, sneaking up behind me. Then there was a blue flash, a sharp pain to the right side of my head and then nothing. The next thing I remember is the taste of blood, then a clamor of voices, my top lip is swollen, and my front teeth are loose, and I have the worst headache I've ever had. This guy had taken one of those old school combination locks the kind that everybody used for their lockers. He'd put the lock in the palm of his hand and the steel loop over his middle finger, creating a makeshift form of brass knuckles. As he passed, he cracked me on the right side of my head with the lock. I went down instantly, as I fell, I hit my mouth on the stairs. Blood everywhere, kids screaming, teachers running, everybody trying to figure out if I had died or not. T he lights in the principal's office are killing my eyes. I'm holding a towel over my mouth as Dadio walks in. Pretty soon, the police are there, and I mumble through my recollection. Dadio is furious, the police are talking to the principal about pressing charges. In my haze, all I can think is wait, wait, everybody slow down. This is all happening too fast. I just wanted to hit pause and then rewind. I wanted a do-over. I didn't want to be here, I didn't want any of this to be the truth. Come on, Dadio says, let's go. He stands me up. The hallways are empty now. Dadio feels like a lion that can't find anything to kill. We exit the side door. I'd only been at Overbrick for an hour and a half. It's weird to be out of school in the middle of the day. The Sugar Bowl convenience store is across the street. I wanted a water ice and a pretzel. It just seemed like Dadio wasn't in the mood, so I didn't ask. As we drove away, I saw the kid being led in handcuffs from his first day of high school and discarded into the back of a paddy wagon. He was later expelled, and I never even knew his name. An I. The moonlight glints off my swollen, Vaseline-caked lips. The first moment of solace in a day of complete and utter insanity. As I lay in my bed, on my left side, I wonder, what the hell happened? How did I get here? Just then, Gigi came in to check on me. She changed out my ice pack, plumped up my pillow, and reset the bandage on my head. I gotta say, it's not too bad having a nurse for a grandmother. I told her the whole story. She didn't lecture or scold. She simply said, you know, if you stop talking so much, maybe you could see some of those hits coming. Then she kissed me and went on her way. 
I couldn't stop thinking about Gigi's words. She was right I was always talking, always joking I never shut up. I talked not because I had anything particularly important to say, but because I was afraid. It began to dawn on me that my overcompensation and fake bravado were really just another, more insidious, manifestation of the coward. My thoughts were swirling. My mind drifted to the time when Gigi found my first rap book. Like most young kids emulating their hip-hop idols, I had been writing verses full of curse words and slick, slangy vulgarities, and I had accidentally left my book out in the kitchen. Gigi found it and read it. She never said anything to me, but she wrote me a note on the inside front cover. Dear Willard, truly intelligent people do not have to use language like this to express themselves. God has blessed you with the gift of words. Be sure you are using your gifts to uplift others. Please show the world that you are as intelligent as we think you are. Love, Gigi lying in my bed, I was overcome with shame. Had I used my words to uplift others? I thought about this kid sitting in a jail cell somewhere what is his grandmother doing right now? He had potentially thrown his whole life away, a demise maybe not caused but certainly provoked by my words. I knew for certain I didn't want to be that kind of person. But my shame slowly began to give way to a staggering realization of the power of words. I knew that I had unconsciously caused my whole day I didn't know exactly how, but I knew for damn sure I had done it. I sensed for the first time that I wasn't weak, in fact, I was infinitely powerful I just had no control over it. My imagination was running wild with the possibilities. God had indeed blessed me with the gift of words. And that night, I was getting my first glimpse of the power of those words to alter and shape my reality. And then I asked myself, if I have this much power, shouldn't I use it for good? Words can affect how people view themselves, how they treat each other, how they navigate the world. Words can build people up, or they can tear them down. I decided that night that I wanted to use my words to empower others, to help rather than hurt. I never cursed again in my rhymes. And I got criticized and smashed for years for that choice. But there was no peer pressure that even came close to overriding Gigi pressure. Tiho's first months of high school were a little rocky, but I was certainly no longer anonymous. And in the same way that the power of my words had almost destroyed me, I was now starting to see their power painting my dreams. By the middle of that school year, hip-hop had really started to bubble in Philly, and now everyone had their own cousin Paul somebody they knew in New York who could get them mixtapes. The success of Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang was putting major dents into mainstream barriers. Everybody was listening to that song all the time. Walking the halls of Overbrick that year was like walking through a hip-hop battleground. Hip-hop may not have been on TV, it may not have been on the radio, but at Overbrick High, everybody was rapping. Nobody knew it yet, but I had been writing rhymes every day for the past eight months. I had pages and pages of different concepts and punchlines and stories. I started to keep a stash memorized and ready to go. I would walk up on groups of kids rapping and join in, and I slowly started to develop a reputation as a pretty good rapper. The new thing was free stealing. Somebody would beatbox with their mouth and then the rapper would improvise in the moment about whatever was around them some kid's funny shoes, the test you failed in math class, the girl you liked, whatever. This was always my biggest strength. I had been cracking jokes my entire life. Now all I had to do was make them rhyme and people were flippin'. The best beatboxer in the whole school was a guy named Clarence Holmes everybody called him Clayt. Not only could he generate the most bass, but he could mimic the actual sounds of popular breakbeats. And on top of that, Clayt could do sound effects he could make a bird noise in the hallway that was so realistic people would be turning around to see who let a bird in here. I soon realized that every time Clayt beatboxed for me, he always made me sound better. I started seeking him out every day after class. I'd roll up and hit him with our standard greeting, Sup, see, you ready to rock? You know what it is, he'd say. Clayt was always ready to rock. 
always. So much so that we all started calling him Ready Roxy. Pretty soon, what started out as just casual freestyle sessions Ryman and Flowin' and trying to one-up each other morphed into what became known as battles. I would step up and do a verse, then the other kid would try to one-up me. Maybe he'd make fun of my hair or my clothes. Then, when his verse finished, I had to step back in and freestyle a response. The judge of who won was determined mainly by who got the biggest laugh or cheer from the crowd. If you won the crowd, you won the battle. I was invincible two words, scorched. Earth. There were some guys who were cleverer than me, who had tighter flows or better voices, or more developed poetic sense. But nobody was as funny as me. Nobody could rock the crowd with a punchline the way I did. What nobody seemed to ever understand was that you can't beat funny. You can spit all the tough gangster shit you want you can rip rhymes about all the money and women in the world but if your pants are just a little bit too far above your shoes, and somebody says, look at you, homie, pretending you all why looks like your shoes went to a party and your pants got high and 40 people laugh. You're done. It's over. Rapping changed everything for me. For the first time in my life, I was popular. I was getting attention and respect. Ready Rock and I were from Winfield, but Overbrick was in Hilltop. Many times, in these battles, we'd be reppin' for Winfield. So a lot of the same neighborhood guys who used to pick on me and make fun of me were now getting hyped when I showed up. I was making new friends, girls were starting to feel me. Ready Rock and I became inseparable. The other reason I never lost a rap battle was because I had been raised in the house of Dadio, molded and chiseled by his unrelenting work ethic. I practiced incessantly. Unlike the other kids, who were starting to smoke weed and cut class, I spent hours and hours filling notebooks with rhymes every day. I'd stand in the mirror and practice my verses, making sure my face and my body language were perfectly matched to reinforce and punctuate the punch lines. I was tightening my delivery and trying to deepen my tone. Every break between class, and before and after school, I was always looking for some sucker who was slippin'. I'd battle anybody in the lunchroom, in the parking lot, at the Tustin playground or the Bieber schoolyard. In class, I started having fun with my teachers, rhyming answers back when they called on me. I'd rhyme to my parents. I'd answer the phone in rhymes. A lot of adults pretended they hated it, but I knew they loved it. The combination of hip-hop and humor made me untouchable. I had found my voice. I was choosing my words poetically and comedically. And now, for the first time, I was experiencing a surge of power over my own life. My teachers loved me. I'd be late for a class or miss my homework or get caught being silly in the back of the room. They couldn't yell at me because they were laughing. I started noticing that I was never getting in trouble. One of my favorite teachers was Miss Brown. She taught algebra too, elementary functions, and trig. She had flawless, chocolate skin and big, steady brown eyes. Her body was just under 5 feet tall, but she was 6'8 on the inside. She knew exactly what I was doing. By this point, I was at least a foot taller than her, and when I would do something that she needed to check me for, she'd walk right up into my chest and say, come down here so I can talk to you. Learning is really easy when you can feel that your teachers love you. Miss Brown began to jokingly call me Prince Charming. She'd sarcastically say things like, oh, look, Prince Charming has graced us with his homework this Monday morning. How kind of him. The kids would laugh, and I would eat it up. As long as everybody's laughing, I'm good. Back in the 80s, the word fresh was the new hip-hop slang. Everybody was saying it every other word like fly in the 70s, or dope in the 90s, in the 80s, if something was hot, you'd say, man, that's fresh. One day I came running into Miss Brown's class literally only 45 seconds after the bell, and, looking at her watch, she said, His Highness, the prince, two minutes late I quickly corrected her. Nah, Miss Brown, 
we both know I am barely 30 seconds late. And if you don't mind, thenceforth and hitherto do I demand to be known as the Fresh Prince. The classroom burst out laughing. The name stuck. I in order to feel confident and secure, you need to have something to feel confident and secure about. We all want to feel good about ourselves, but many of us don't recognize how much work that actually takes. Internal power and confidence are born of insight and proficiency. When you understand something, or you're good at something, you feel strong, and it makes you feel like you have something to offer. When you have adequately cultivated your unique skills and gifts, then you're excited about approaching and interacting with the world. And what I learned from Paul was that being good at something allows you to be calm in a storm, knowing that you can handle whatever comes. There is a great Bruce Lee quote that resonates with me. One of Lee's students once asked him, Master, you constantly speak to us of peace, yet every day you train us to fight. How do you reconcile these conflicting ideas? And Bruce Lee responded, It is better to be a warrior in a garden, than a gardener in a war. Rapping didn't just win me the approval I desperately craved from my peers, it gave me a sense of power. But I knew it was fleeting, it demanded my constant attention and nurturing. I knew I was good, but I also knew that I had to work. It wasn't going to just come to me. I had to go get it. I kept seeing her in the hallways I'd even had a dream about her but we were from two different cliques. I was rapping now, so I was rolling with the cool kids, but she wore big ass glasses, and her and all of her friends were in the art program and lugged around those big ass portfolio bags. But Melanie Parker was beautiful. She noticed me soon after the unfortunate lock incident. She was a mocha xeno flavored cutie she had that sort of goofy gorgeous genius thing, a beguiling mixture of insecurity and quirkiness surrounding a simmering core of artistic brilliance. We had been sniffing around each other for a few weeks, and I could tell she was far too much of a lady to speak first. She had gorgeous mahogany eyes, and a springtime smile that I would come to understand was painted on top of hidden layers of sadness. Melanie was a broken angel, and from the moment I saw her, I wanted nothing more than to take care of her. So, I pressed up on her. What's up, cutie? I'm the prince, I said. She smiled politely, and said, what does your mother call you? I was thinking, damn my mother calls me by my government name. Well, she calls me Willard, I said, but you can call me Willard, she interrupted. Nice to meet you, Willard. I'm Melanie. She never called me Will, she never called me Prince, she called me asshole once or twice. But to this day, she calls me Willard. Look, that's a big ass art bag, I said. May I carry it for you to your next class? Melanie paused, I sensed that she already liked me, but she felt like she had to make it difficult. She handed me the bag without a word and walked off to class. I followed her, already completely in love. When we reached her classroom, I handed her the bag. I think you should let me carry it home for you, too. This afternoon, I said. You should rest your art muscles. I would walk Melanie home from Overbrick every day. She took easily to wonder and awe everything was interesting to her. She was one of those people who could stop and look at a tree for ten minutes. Melanie lived in the opposite direction from Woodcrest, so I'd walk ten minutes to her house carrying her big ass portfolio all the way then twenty minutes back to mine, thinking about those eyes all the way home. Melanie was born and raised in Minneapolis. Her household was filled with violence to a tragic extreme, her mother ended up killing her father and went to prison for it. Her mother incarcerated, Melanie moved to Philly to live with her aunt, a strict Muslim who opened her home to her niece but who maintained very strong opinions about how a teenage girl should behave. I never quite got the whole story, but on one occasion, Melanie and her aunt had a very serious disagreement about something, which escalated to the point that her aunt threw Melanie out of the house. Legally, without a place to stay, Melanie could have been sent back to Minneapolis and placed into foster care. I was panic-stricken. 
I told Mom Mom the whole story and begged her to let Melanie stay with us. Mom, it will only be for a little while, I said. I'll get a job, do whatever I have to do to get a bunch of money, and me and Melanie will get our own place. I love her, Mommy. Please can she stay with us till I can figure it out. Mom Mom's eyes welled, her tears a complex emotional mixture. On the one hand, this was exactly the kind of son she had hoped to raise loving, responsible, committed. But on the other hand, she knew from personal experience the fragile realities of young love. Oh, hell no. Dottio said. Carlin, you know exactly what they gon' be doin'. But I had already promised my mother, no sex. Melanie would stay in the basement, I would sleep in my room two floors up. It was only temporary. Dottio protested, but Mom Mom won this one. I'm still not exactly sure why I did what I did that night. To this day, I have no idea what I was thinking. Of all the experiences I am sharing in this book, this is the individual moment of personal behavior that makes the least sense to me. Before I reveal what happened, I would like to preface my remarks by making it unequivocally clear that I was deeply and totally in love with Melanie Parker. We were going to be married, we were going to have four beautiful Mokoxino flavored children, and our union would live alongside the epic tales of romance, Romeo and Juliet, Tristan and Izuld, Tupac and Janet, even Eddie and Hallie in Boomerang. But at 4 a.m., less than three months into our star-crossed love affair, Mom Mom should have been asleep but tragically decided she wanted a cup of coffee. And wearing slippers far too quiet to defend her delicate sensibilities, she approached the threshold of the family kitchen. Still innocent, she flipped the light switch as she had done tens of thousands of times before. But this time, her eyes landed upon her eldest son and his girlfriend deep in the throes of reckless lovemaking. As a teenager, outside of physical injury, you cannot feel worse than having your mother catch you and your girlfriend doggy style on her kitchen floor. Oh, Willard. Mom Mom growled, slapping the lights off. Stomping furiously up the stairs, the slamming of her bedroom door functioned as a disastrous exclamation point. Now she wants to make noise. By the grace of God, those few days at Woodcrest allowed Melanie's aunt to calm down and let her move back in. I was only 16, but I was all in I was determined more than ever to get us our own place so Melanie and I could build a life together. I had gotten my driver's permit just before my 16th birthday. Reddy Rock and I loved to drive around West Philly after school every day, looking for people to battle. They were pretty easy to find back then. It would be a bunch of dudes standing on a corner in a circle, one of them with their hands cupped around their mouth, bopping their head back and forth the universal human beatboxing posture. We'd pull the car over, step out, strike the b-boy stance, and it was on. It didn't take but a minute for me to start scoolin' fools. I'm dropping punchlines, people waving and screaming a hey, shit. You hear what he said? The smart guys just quit when they realized I had won the crowd, because once the crowd is against you, anything you say just makes you look stupider. But some suckers didn't they would try to keep going, and then two words, scorched. Earth. By my junior year, I had developed a reputation around West Philly. I joined a crew of slightly older guys we called ourselves the Hypnotic MCS. The design of the group was based on Grandmaster Cause and the Cold Crush Brothers, we had a DJ and four MCS DJ groove on the tables, Jamie Fresh, Sheik Yadi, my friend Mark Forrest, aka the Lord Supreme, and me, the Fresh Prince. Reddy Rock would pop in and out, but he wasn't really feeling these dudes. I took my role in the hypnotic MCS very seriously. I attacked it with the discipline Dio had instilled in me. But back then, I hadn't learned yet that most people didn't have the same work ethic as me. I wanted to rehearse every day, on a specific schedule. They were looking at it more casually. Sometimes they would show up late to rehearsal, and other times not at all. I wanted us to perform at all the block parties and pool our money to buy equipment, pass out flyers to advertise ourselves, 
create our own cassettes. Because I was the youngest, they always kind of laughed at me and dismissed my ideas. I did finally convince everybody to put up $200 a piece so we could purchase the brand new SP-12 sampling beatbox. I dug in for a few weeks at the ice house and came up with my share. We now had a beatbox, four microphones, two turntables, and all the records we'd ever need. Because Groove was the DJ, we agreed to keep all the equipment at his house. We did a handful of pretty good shows together over about a six-month period, but mostly the equipment just sat there in Groove's basement unused. I was getting frustrated nobody wanted to grind and go get it. My work ethic and constant pushing slowly drove a wedge between me and the group. They resented me for always bugging them and ruining what to them was just supposed to be a fun hobby. I resented them for not putting the effort in to make this thing as good as it could possibly be. I remember being at rehearsals with them and finding myself barking out a dotio axiom, 99% is the same as zero. We started having arguments and fights over everything, over lines, over which breakbeats went best with what harmony, over who would take which verse every decision became a chore. Knowing what I know now, I can see that there was no way it could have worked, but back then, my mindset was that everything could be fixed. But finally, after months of no progress on recording anything, I went to Groove's house and told the guys that I was out. To them, I was the obnoxious kid who was killing everybody's vibe anyway. They sorta shrugged, shared a laugh between themselves, and threw me deuces. So I grabbed my mic and my headphones, and, in the honor of fairness, I offered to buy the SP-12 back from them. It's not for sale, Groove said. There was a new coldness in his voice. Man, man, y'all not even using that thing, I said. My dad will help me with the cash. They just ignored me and kept talking among themselves. It wasn't about the SP-12, it wasn't even about resentment. It was about power they were disrespecting me because they could. They knew I couldn't do anything. Aight, fine, I said. Just give me my $200 and y'all can keep it. They all kinda smirked at one another and then Groove said, nope. No argument. Nobody raised their voice. Just no after no. Outwardly I stayed cool but a fury was beginning to churn inside me. I had suffered bullying and abuse in my home and all through my childhood. And I was sick of that shit. Okay, I said calmly. I'll see y'all later. But as I started to leave, I realized that the SP-12 was sitting right there. So I walked over to it, I paused, then I snatched it up, violently ripping the cables from the wall, held it high over my head with the knobs facing down, and crash. I slammed it down onto the concrete basement floor. That thing disintegrated knobs, plastic, transistors, spraying everywhere. What th-a fuck are ya doing? Groove screamed. And then I hauled ass up the basement stairs and out into the street. They were right on me in the beginning, but I was the young one. Back in the day, how I was running was known as booking. I put my head down and didn't look back for eight blocks. When I finally slowed down, there was no one behind me. I was on my own now. A L L of the windows were broken out of Dadio's brand new Chevy van. The radio, and all of his tools, were gone. Paul had the van when it happened. And he was almost in tears apologizing to Dadio. Dadio was trying to calm him down. This shit happens, man that's why we have insurance, Dadio said. But something about Paul's inner code made this unforgivable. He felt like the van was in his possession and he had been entrusted with it. I had never seen him like this. Paul felt like he had somehow failed and dishonored Dadio. Dadio could see that thing rising up in Paul, the thing that led to him being in West Philly in the first place. Hey, Paul, look at me, Dadio said. You know how many times niggas done broke in and stole my shit. I know exactly who did it, Uncle Will, Paul said. Fuck them niggas, Paul, Dadio said. We got too much shit to do. Leave it alone. 
but Paul couldn't let it go. He was messing with a girl named Shelley who used to mess with this OL head named Black. Black ran Winfield. He was always on the corner in front of Mr. Bryant's store with seven or eight of his friends. Black was about six foot four and always had his shirt off. He didn't give a fuck. He would smoke weed outside in the daytime. Paul walked straight into the middle of the crowd, right up to Black. Did you touch my uncle's van? Paul said. Everybody on the corner laughed. Yeah, I did it, what you gon' do about it bloop. Within a couple of seconds, Black's nose was broken. But he didn't know yet. He wouldn't find out until later, when he regained consciousness. I'd never seen a fight like this except in the movies. Paul beat up everybody. Every dude on the corner either bleeding, running away, or asleep. Paul didn't come home that night. Or the next. He had disobeyed Dadia. I guess that was too much for him to bear. It would be 35 years before I saw him again. Hope M.O.M. Mom and Harry moved back into Woodcrest. My family wasn't one that talked about things. I was never privy to what she and Dadio had decided I didn't ask, they didn't tell. But whatever it was, he never put his hands on her again. It was midway through my senior year. I had just gotten my SAT scores, low 1200s. This was far from a perfect score, but for a black kid from an inner city school in Philadelphia, those numbers were more than good enough to get me really good options for college. Mom Mom was ecstatic. She was dancing around the house, calling all her friends at Carnegie Mellon and MIT you would have thought she was going back to college. My strong subjects were math and science. By 1986, more and more schools were beginning to offer computer science and engineering courses. Mom Mom set up a war room. She had a map of the United States, she was cross-referencing engineering schools with cities and states where we had family members, cost of living with distance from Philadelphia. With that information at hand, she narrowed down my options to her top five or six schools, organized in order of most likely to least likely acceptance. She then filled out all of the applications, handled all of the housing logistics, and weighed all of the travel and financial aid issues. At the time she worked for the school board of Philadelphia, so when it came to education, her organization and execution made even Dadio applaud. We had family friends in Wisconsin, and suddenly Mom Mom decided we were going to take a quick family trip to see them. The patriarch, Walter McCallum we called him Uncle Whatchamacallit, was tied with the admissions officer at the university's College of Engineering. She had already gotten my sister Pam into Hampton University, and I was up next. Her wildest dreams as a parent were coming true all of her kids were going to college. Mom Mom was the commander in charge of the will getting into college mission. All of a sudden, she was very comfortable with the idea that if two people are in charge, everybody dies. IT was a Friday night, and my girl Judy Stewart was having her birthday party up the block. I met up with Reddy Rock after school. Yo, you go into Judy's party tonight, he said. Nah, man, she played me. I DJ'd her party for the last two years and she got somebody else and didn't even tell me. Well, she didn't just get somebody else, man. She got Jazzy Jeff. Word. I been hearing about him, but I never saw him cut. Yeah, man. He's ill, Reddy said. He's from Southwest, though, and he's gonna be in our hood. We gon' stand for that. Reddy Rock always knew how to gas me up for a battle. Not that I needed much fuel. Yo, what's his rapper's name? I said. MC Ice. He can't touch you, though. Nobody can touch me. Reddy Rock loved when I talked dirty like that. He gave me a pound. My mind was churning with battle rhymes organizing themselves for tonight's slaughter. You know what, we're gonna hit that party tonight and smash these fools, I said. We gotta rep Winfield. Bet, he said. 
Ready Roxy and the Fresh Prince vs Jazzy Jeff and MC Ice. I'll meet you there at 8. A.I.I.T. Bet. Later. J. Ifera Allen Towns grew up on Rodman Street in southwest Philly, about 4 or 5 miles from Winfield. Jeff came from a musical family. His father used to MC for the jazz legend Count Basie. His older brothers played in funk and fusion bands, and his sisters were always singing Motown tunes. He was the baby of the family and was a musical sponge, absorbing and processing all of the incredible talent that was happening around him. At the age of 15, Jeff was diagnosed with cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. After various painful and difficult treatments, he managed to beat the illness, but his mother became understandably overprotective, and Jeff found himself spending his days in the family basement surrounded by 10,000 of his father's and brother's jazz, funk, and blues records. Jeff would spend all day digging through them, listening to everything from John Coltrane and Charlie Mingus to Stevie Wonder and James Brown, noting the different styles, the musicianship, the instrumentation. When he was 10, Jeff had begun DJing. His encyclopedic knowledge made him a musical marvel. Everyone called him jazz because of his ability to seamlessly blend complex jazz tunes with modern funk, disco, or hip-hop rhythms. Eventually, that got extended to Jazzy Jeff. A lot of you young guns might not know this, but back in the day, DJs were actually more famous than MCS rapping was still pretty rudimentary. We hadn't developed the rhythmic or linguistic ingenuity that we have today. Instead, DJing was the innovative and exciting center of attention. It's hard to explain to people who aren't familiar with old school cut-in, but Jeff's ability to scratch out rhythms and blend sounds was, and still is, for the most part, unparalleled. He pioneered techniques and styles in those Philly basement parties as a teenager that are still used by thousands of DJs all over the world today. He could manipulate records in ways that no one had seen or heard before. He could bend keys and time signatures and alter sounds, one of which I later named the Transformer Scratch, because it reminded me of the sound effect from the Transformers cartoon. He could make the vocal lines of two records talk back and forth to each other, creating conversations from two completely different songs. I could go on and on. But I'll stop and just say there's a reason why many, including myself, consider Jeff to be the goat of hip-hop DJing. Even today, over 30 years later, he's revered by DJing experts as one of the best in the world. The point is, I know I am the big famous movie guy, but back in the 80s, Jazzy Jeff was the star. It was me backing him up. Tea hat night at Judy's, I showed up early. I made my entrance into her basement, two tonely jeans, black on the back, white on the front, with fresh prints down the left leg in red letters and a matching two-tonely jacket. I had taken the lee patch off the waistband of the pants and had attached it to a silver rope chain around my neck. I was almost too fly for this party. As I stepped into the room, my mind flashed to the last time I had been in Judy's basement. The harrowing events documented in my first single, Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, actually happened right here. I was with one of Judy's girlfriends in that basement one night when Judy's father woke up at around 2 a.m. to the unmistakable sounds of exquisite lovemaking, my sounds, not hers. From the top floor I heard him bellowing and tearing down the stairs. Who the fuck is in my house? I bolted up and scrambled naked through the narrow back hall, snatching open the door to the rear driveway, which to my horror had since disappeared under 12 inches of snow. It was 31 degrees, and I had a choice to make. Where is he? Where is he? Judy's father roared. Decision made. I ran a full city block, but naked, back to my house, in the snow. I was outside for over 10 minutes making snowballs, trying to hit Harry's bedroom window. Finally, the window goes up, and Harry looks down. I had not heard my brother laugh harder before, or since. It also happens that Judy's basement was where I met Jeff for the first time. Whatever magic Juju Judy had going on in her basement in the mid-80s, apparently Jeff and I owe our careers to it. Thanks, 
Judy. W and I arrived, Jeff was still setting up. Judy introduced us. What up, man, I'm Jazz, he said. Prince, I said, pointing to my leg. I was thinking, this is Jazzy Jeff. He was wearing these big ass glasses, and he didn't have his name on his clothes anywhere how was anybody supposed to know he was Jazzy Jeff? There was a band-aid around the middle scratching finger on his left hand. Apparently, he had been scratching so much that the top knuckle of his finger now had a bend in it. Everybody was raving about this dude, but I was thoroughly unimpressed. If this joker is the best DJ in the city, I'm sad for Philly. A lot of the famous DJs back in those days were flashy, doing backflips and jumping over their turntables and all of that. Jeff was quiet, skinny, soft-spoken, and looked more like a science nerd than a samurai on the wheels of steel. I sat down and chilled while Jeff continued to set up. It's always good to show up early before a battle so you can clock your material. I was plotting all the punchlines I was gonna kick about his glasses and his band-aid, but I was really going to be battling ice. A few minutes go by and I say, yo, Jazz, where's ice? Jeff didn't even look up. I could tell this was a sore subject. Good question. I called him like five times. He never hit me back. Back then there were no cell phones you couldn't get in touch with people like today. Judy's guests were arriving now, but there was no sign of Ready Rock. The party was starting. I could see that Judy was getting nervous, and I could sense that Jeff wasn't feeling too great, either. My pleaser kicked in, full steam. Hey, I'll rock with you till ice gets here if you want, I said. Jeff, relieved, said, ah, that would be dope. Thanks. I hate having to talk on the mic. I got you, I said. There's nothing I enjoy more than talking on a mic. We both laughed. Judy squealed and clapped her hands. T here are rare moments as an artist that you cannot quantify or measure. As much as you try, you can rarely reproduce them and it's near impossible to describe them. But every artist knows what I'm talking about those moments of divine inspiration where creativity flows out of you so brilliantly and effortlessly that somehow you are better than you have ever been before. That night with Jeff was the first time I ever tasted it, the place that athletes call the zone. It felt like we already existed as a group and we just had to catch up to ourselves natural, comfortable, home. Jeff could sense my rhyme style. He always knew when my jokes were coming, when to drop the track out so people could clearly hear the punchline, and I could tell by which hand he was using what type of scratch was coming. He preferred different scratches with his left hand than with his right. Sensing this, I could draw the audience's attention to which scratch was coming by which hand he was transitioning to. He was choosing the tracks and adjusting the tempos based on what he felt best accentuated the narrative structure and the flow of my rhymes. And just as the music crescendoed, I'd throw down a dagger of a line and Jeff would drop the beat into the funkiest, hottest, party-rocking shit these Philly kids had ever seen in their lives. That night was crazy. When the party was over, me and Jeff stood out in the driveway catching our breath and cooling off. We were still hyped. Yo, the truck turner echo thing you did was blaze, I said. Your flow sits perfect locked to that chic bass line. Jeff responded. Next time, we'll use the bounce, rock, skate, roll and then transition to chic word. Word. Ideas poured out of us like a fire hose, creativity ricocheting back and forth between us. Everything he said set off three ideas in my mind, and my responses had him holding his head and walking around in circles. We never really talked about it, never really made it official, but that wild November night in Judy Stewart's basement, he became my DJ, and I became his rapper. From then on, we were DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, just two kids from West Philly partners, friends, brothers. And we still are today. Over the next couple of months, me and Jeff dug in hard. We practiced every day, performed every weekend. He lived in his mother's basement. 
it was his sanctuary, his magic workshop. When you entered, it felt like you were getting a sneak peek behind the curtain of the wizard. Jeff was the first friend I'd ever had who plain and simple outworked me. I think it would be a misrepresentation to say that he practiced a lot. It wasn't that he was practicing it was that he didn't do anything else. You'd never catch Jeff in the kitchen or watching TV. You wouldn't show up at his house and see him walking up the front steps coming back from the store. He didn't go to the store, I guess wizards don't do their own shopping. Jeff was standing in front of his turntables 14 to 18 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. It's literally the only image I can conjure of Jeff in his childhood home. Jeff was a mad scientist, and he loved technology. He was always waiting for a new gadget to arrive in the mail that you could only get from some 78-year-old guitar builder of questionable history in Vienna. Jeff was moving from solely DJing into beat making and recording. He got a Tascam 4-track recorder, and he was experimenting with creating his own records. He now had a mini studio. Jeff is three years older than me, so he had already graduated, but I had to still go to school and work at the ice house. So by the time I'd get to rehearsal around 4 p.m., Jeff had already put in 10 hours of work. He'd give me two tracks to write to, I'd show up the next day with one written, and he'd hand me six more tracks. This went on for the first few months of our partnership. DJ Jazzy Jeff was a hip-hop terminator. He didn't eat, he didn't sleep, and he absolutely positively would not stop until you were dead. I tried to keep up I would stay as late as I could, until Mom Mom or Dadio would call asking me if I knew what time it was. Those early months in Jeff's basement were among the most creative times I've ever experienced. Everything was cutting edge, everything was hot, it was experimental and inspiring. I never wanted to leave. We were seeking our sound, but we found ourselves. Oh any night, we were rehearsing in Jeff's basement and some random dude wearing a Lacoste polo shirt, tan cockies with a razor crease, and Adidas shell toes crawled through the basement window. He calmly went and took a seat in what he clearly thought of as his corner. The music was playing, and Jeff and I were deeply engaged in our artistic banter, so I guess he didn't want to interrupt us. Jeff didn't react to his presence at all. This went on for a few minutes, until I tried to break the awkwardness that obviously only I was feeling. Hey, man, you gotta watch wearing those shoes with them pants. If cockies touch shell tops, they could blow your ankles up. I was just trying to break the ice, but the dude looked at me, perceiving a challenge, and said, Oh, is that what we doin'? We bussin'? Because we can get started with those car door ears of yours. Not, 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 homie, I'm just messin' with you. I'm Will. They call me Fresh Prince. Jeff finally popped out of his nutty professor trance and snapped his headphones off. Oh damn. What up, JL? Jeff said. When did you get here? James Lassiter was Jeff's best friend from childhood. JL grew up one block over, on Hazel Avenue. When Jeff was sick as a child, his mother wouldn't allow him to go off his front porch, so JL would come over and sit for hours and hours with Jeff keeping him company. This routine continued long after Jeff's recovery and well into their adult lives. JL was a serious cat. When I met him, he was putting himself through Temple Law School. He was studying during the day and working at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital at night. He would stop at Jeff's for the last two hours of his day, part habit, part unwind, part front seat to the evolution of the greatest DJ who has ever lived. Our rise in the Philly hip-hop scene was nuclear. We had done every show we could, block parties, school dances, proms, basement parties, birthdays, fundraisers in church parking lots you name it, we did it. We had established a rep as fun, creative, captivating party rockers. Eventually, in early 1986, we scored our first real gig at a major venue, the famous Wynn Ballroom. Win was short for Winfield My Hood, My People, 
with my new DJ. And we smashed it. We were the hottest hip-hop duo in these Philly streets. But our big break came in September 1986, when Jeff was invited to compete in the new music seminar Battle for World Supremacy. The Battle for World Supremacy was an old-school DJ and MC battle competition held annually in New York City. All of the legends of hip-hop had performed and competed in it, Grandmaster Flash, Busy B, Mantronix, Mel Mel, and so on. It was like the Olympics of early 80s hip-hop. Local radio DJ Lady B is an iconic pioneer of Philly hip-hop. She was playing rap music before anybody in the city, back when it was only on what AM radio. She called Dave Funk and Klein, who was one of the event coordinators, and told him that she had a DJ in Philly who was changing the game. Lady B pressed Funk and Klein to put Jeff in the competition. Even though it was just two hours away by car, the drive felt like a pilgrimage. New York City was the mecca of hip-hop. I had never been to New York. To me, the idea that music could be my passport to new worlds excited and inspired me. Here I was, right now, walking through New York City, headed to the coolest event on the planet. And all because of rap music. The battle was being held in the Grand Ballroom at the Marriott Marquis in Times Square. We rolled up, ten deep, full swag, red Phillies baseball caps filled the room. We were intimated and in awe, but you couldn't tell it from all the noise we were making Philly was now officially in the building. Jeff approached the sign-in table. I was standing behind him, arms crossed, chin high, b-boy stance on swole. Mel Mel walks by to my left entering the ballroom. My b-boy stance got just a little less swole. And then Grandmaster Flash entered right behind him. For comfort, I put my arms by my side. And then I heard a sound over my shoulder, that outburst you hear when old friends haven't seen each other for a while. I vaguely recognized one of the voices. Where do I know that voice from? And then it hit me. I had never seen him in person before but I knew it was him. He wasn't rocking a b-boy stance, no flashy clothes, no entourage, but the crowd still parted when he walked through. The undisputed favorite for the MC competition, Grandmaster Koss. As he passed, it took everything I had not to squeal, I love you, Koss. Fortunately, he passed quickly, and I didn't play myself, but I'm not sure how much longer I could have held out. Jeff finished signing in, I put my hands in my pockets, and went quietly to find a seat. T here were two sections of the battle for world supremacy the MC competition, and the DJ competition. Eight competitors in each, three elimination rounds, last man standing wins. The battle was set up so that each competitor had three 30 second slots in each round to do their thing. They would go back and forth with their routines, and at the end, the judges would score them, partially based on their techniques and overall performance, but also on the reaction of the crowd. The MCS were up first, and it wasn't even a fair fight, round after round, rapper after rapper fell to the wit and charisma of my idol. Grandmaster Kaz was crowned the world's supreme MC, and I could hold out no longer, I love you, Kaz. The DJs were up next. Back in the day, this was the battle people really came to see. As the newcomer, in the first round, Jeff was paired against DJ Cheese, the previous year's champion. Most DJs had worked out two or four routines and repeated them throughout the competition. But Jeff had spent the previous week preparing nine separate 30-second routines. He realized that if there were three rounds, each round having three slots, that he would be able to go through the whole tournament without ever repeating a single routine. But he took it even further, each routine was timed perfectly to end in 30 seconds. So, whereas other DJs were looking sloppy getting cut off by the buzzer, or they had a 20 second intro and never really got their routine started, Jeff's perfectly timed routines had punchlines right at 29 seconds the effect was that Jeff's buzzer became a signal to the crowd to erupt. The first round is set to begin. Jeff walks across the stage, maybe a little overeager, 
just a bit too happy to be there, and extends a hand of greeting to DJ Cheese. Cheese looks Jeff up and down and flags him, refused to shake his hand. As Jeff returns to his DJ setup, his cheerful demeanor is gone, and his eyes have turned icy. If Cheese would have known what was coming, he would have just shaken Jeff's hand, or better yet, tried to break it off. Cheese was up first he came out strong. But Jeff fired back with one of Philly's favorites, a tricky rhythm scratch. People were looking at one another and murmuring, not quite sure what they had just seen. DJ Cheese is eyeballing Jeff, sensing that this is just the beginning. Nobody had ever seen cut in like this. The crowd was inching up onto the edges of their seats. DJ Cheese unleashed his second routine and once again nailed it. The crowd cheers big scores from all the judges. Then the audience settles down to see what other artillery the Philly kid has brought with him. And with no announcement and no fanfare, Jeff introduces the world to his Transformer Scratch. In 1986, that was the eyeless thing anybody had ever heard. And that was just the first 10 seconds. He finishes the routine slicing Pump Me Up by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. There's a verse at the end of that song that goes, I'm the bow-legged brother, there'll never be another I bought a mansion for my mother Jeff did a breakdown, cutting the last line into syllables, and I bought a mansion, for my and then he held it, letting the clock run out, and at 29 seconds, right before the buzzer, he released the last word, mother the buzzer sounded, and the crowd lost it. The judges were jumping up out of their seats and walking around with their hands on their heads. Jeff's scratches were so clean, sharp, and calculated that people realized they were witnessing the evolution of the art form. DJ Jazzy Jeff was now serving notice that the road to world supremacy rolled through Philly. Jeff was flawless that night. And when it was all said and done, the 1986 World Supreme DJ was a kid who spent most of his life in a basement in southwest Philly, my DJ, DJ Jazzy Jeff. Afterward, we all piled into our single room at the Marriott Marquis. We knew something big had just happened Eric B. and Rakim even came to the room to personally congratulate Jeff. We weren't quite sure where this was all going, but we had the sense that some important fuse had just been lit. We stayed up all night, laughing, dreaming, plotting, planning. That night was the first night I realized that the possibilities hip-hop presented me far outstretched anything else I had dared hope for. My whole life, my parents' hopes for me had been predicated on education and hard work. I was supposed to go to college. I was supposed to get a good job. I was supposed to move up in the world. And as the self-designated golden child, I had always committed to living up to my parents' hopes and dreams. I couldn't imagine it otherwise. But by the time we drove home the next morning, New York disappearing behind us, I was struck with an overwhelming conviction, I am not going to college. D. Anna Goodman had cash. He was about 5'6 and heavy set, not fat, but thick in a way that he could hurt you if he had to. Approaching 40, he was a Winfield O.L. head. When you would see him standing on the corner it was only briefly, because he was above those fools he was doing real shit. Dana was the little brother of Lawrence Goodman, founder of Pop Art Records, one of the first New York, based hip-hop labels. Lawrence was from Philly, but he was killing them in NYC. Those first few months back in Philly, me and Jeff were on fire. Jeff was now spending 80% of his time making records and 20% DJing. We had finished six or seven songs on Jeff's Tascam 4 track. He had mixed them as best he could, but Jeff was becoming increasingly frustrated that his equipment couldn't quite reproduce the sounds that were trapped in his head. I had recently purchased a Sharp 777, the original hip-hop boom box. It was one of the first times I noticed a major corporation responding to the demands of our burgeoning art form. The 777 was a loud ass heavy ass radio. You had to be strong to carry that thing around, and you had to carry it, because for some reason, if you sat it on the ground, it drained your expensive 10D batteries way faster. Best of all, 
the 777 had dual, high-speed cassette replication capabilities, so I would take the cassettes that me and Jeff made home with me, and I would stay up all night high-speed dubbing our demos. This was the old days where you had to do one tape at a time. It was dull and monotonous you know, like, building a brick wall when you're fucking nine but it needed to be done, so I did it. I then handed those tapes out to everybody. I didn't care if you even knew what hip-hop was, if you got two ears and a tape deck, then my name's the Fresh Prince it says it right here on my pants and I've got a tape you gotta hear. Overbrick High was situated in Hilltop, and Hilltop was run by about 30 dudes who called themselves the Hilltop Hustlers. One of the top rappers in that crew was Steady B, and Stead was Lawrence Goodman's nephew. The word on the street was that his uncle had just given him a deal and he had music coming out later that year. I wanted Stead to get my tape to Lawrence the problem was, I was from across the bridge in Winfield, and if there was one thing that a hilltop hustler would never do, it's help a nigga from Winfield. But then it hit me, Dana Goodman lives in Winfield. Maybe he'll pass our tape to Lawrence. Dana and Lawrence, like many brothers, had a bit of a sibling rivalry going on. Dana saw the money his brother was making with his record label, and he hoped to start a label of his own. He called up me and Jeff and said he wanted to meet. So we invited him over to Jeff's to hear us perform. Dana was wearing a dark blue velour Sergio Tacchini sweatsuit, the one with the red and white elasticated wrist and ankle bands. The sweatsuit was zipped open just low enough to reveal his seven or eight slim gold chains bouncing off the afro on his chest. He was that older dude who almost got away with dressing like the kids, except he had dress socks on. Dana always wore sunglasses indoors, outdoors, noon, midnight, basketball court, church. You never caught Dana not rocking his shades. That day, Dana pulled up in front of Jeff's house in a brand new, four-door, steel blue Audi 4000 CS Quattro 5 speed, and for the first time in my life, I saw a phone in a car. It was the first car phone ever it was a rotary dial, house phone that somehow worked in his car. Dana stepped out on Rodman Street, he was a boss. He was loud, he was a showman, and the sun was banging off his pinky ring. Me and Jeff were standing on his mom's porch, Dana saw us, threw his arms wide open, and in his low, weathered baritone voice, yelled out to the kids playing, and the neighbors passing, yo. There they go, pointing to me and Jeff. That's them, y'all. You better get the autographs now. That's DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Them boys bout to do something. He called me and Jeff down. Come here, y'all. Gimme some love. Me and Jeff stepped down to the sidewalk, and Dana hugged us like a proud father. Love what y'all did up in New York, holding it down for Philly. Me and Jeff smiled. Well, you know, that's what we do, I said. Just then, one of Jeff's neighbors, a dude a few years older named Keith, called out, I. Dana. Dat you, man. Oh, shit, it's Dana Goodman what you slummin', man. Keith and Dana shook hands one of those long, elaborate handshakes with multiple steps from a previous generation, which also didn't go with Dana's sweatsuit. What brings you round these parts? Keith asked. Oh, you know. I'm here to talk to these boys about a little business, Dana said. Business. Keith looked at me and Jeff. His energy shifted slightly, but our youth and our excitement blinded us to the subtleties. Keith pulled Dana aside, put his arm around him. You know this is Jimmy Towns' little brother, right? Dana looked over at Jeff. Jimmy Towns' brother. Keith got up real close to Dana and whispered something in his ear that we couldn't hear. Dana looked down, then started nodding, Yeah, yeah, I got you, man, this Jew's business. I'm trying to help them. Family, Keith said, loud enough for us to hear this time. He then said his goodbyes and went back down the street. Dana came down to the basement. Me and Jeff let him hear everything we had. 
Dana picked the two songs he liked the most, the first was called Just One of Those Days. Just One of Those Days features a slow, 92 BPM groove where I rapped about having one of those days where everything goes wrong. For the chorus, Jeff sampled Irving Berlin's Put In On The Ritz, a 1928 ragtime joint that was the first song ever performed in a film by an interracial ensemble. It was pure jazzy Jeff, mixing old time, highbrow music with the scratches and rhythms of hip hop. It crystallized our musical dynamic, Jeff's musical sophistication and in-depth knowledge married to my natural storytelling and humor. The second song was Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, the one inspired by Grandmaster Kaz's Yvette. This time, Jeff sampled the theme song from the famous 1960s sitcom I Dream of Jeannie. He used the brand new Roland 909 drum machine, and he detuned the toms to make them sound like a bass line. I told the story of the night in Judy Stewart's basement when my exquisite lovemaking almost got me frostbitten. Dana loved it, he was cracking up. Yo, did that really happen? Tell the truth, that happened for real. Yeah, man, I said, that was a rough night. He burst out laughing. Boy, y'all some talented, funny niggas, he said. Hip-hop has evolved so much over the decades that listening to those songs now I cringe they sound so simplistic and repetitive. But back then, what we were doing was revolutionary. Jeff and I played with the structure of songs in a way that no one else in hip-hop had up until that point. We had lyric-less choruses, we had verses that were half samples, half raps. I was building verses that constructed a full story each verse leading into the next, begging the listener to finish the song to find out what happened by the end. It was a new day dare I say it was fresh. Dana was bobbing his head to the beat, clapping his hands, stomping. And then finally, playing as if he couldn't take it anymore, he said, that's enough, that's enough, turn it off. Jeff hit the stop button on the four track. If we had been in a cartoon, Dana would have had spinning dollar signs in his eyes. But in real life, he thumbed the gold chains on his chest, and said, ah, man. What y'all say we make a record? Me and Jeff snapped we were hyped. Jumpin', high fiving, yelling we were so naive, we thought that was it. You just invite a guy to your house, and he says, let's make a record, and boom, you're a star. We didn't realize that Dana didn't even have a company yet. He had no distribution, very few connections in radio or television. And DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were his first foray into the music business. A week later, we walked into Studio 4, a professional recording studio that Dana found in downtown Philly. It's hard to describe what Jeff's face looked like when he entered the main control room. It was as if he were a 17-year-old virgin walking onto the set of a porno movie and finding out that he was the star. Dana presented us with a recording contract, and we signed it. We had never been in a real recording studio before, so we weren't really sure what to do or how it worked. Dana had at least been in with his brother on many of the pop art hits. He had ideas of how it should be and what he wanted to hear. The contract dictated that Dana was the producer and co-songwriter of our music. He started telling Jeff to change tempos, to shift pitches, to add cuts and adjust sounds. Jeff disagreed with many of Dana's creative choices, but in Dana's mind, since he paid for the studio time, he was in charge. Jeff was fuming, but this was our big shot, our one chance, so we didn't want to mess it up. Just one of those days got mangled in that recording session. The tempos between the verse and chorus were different. The song inexplicably changed keys. The mix was awful. Jeff still hates that track, even though we re-recorded it later. But girls got through the recording sessions mostly unscathed and still held up as a song. Despite Jeff's grumblings, it was decided that girls would be our first release as a single, and just one of those days would be the B-side. We'd release them to build up some hype while we recorded our first full album. The Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble single came out in March 1986, although nobody knew it, 
because it was on Dana's new record label, Word Up Records. No offices, no employees, no distribution the single wasn't even in stores, Dana was selling the vinyl out of the trunk of his car. Nothing was happening. To his credit, he was doing everything he knew how to do. He was a hustler he spent his own money, and he absolutely believed in DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Even though nobody knew we had a record out, Jeff's win at the battle for world supremacy meant that promoters started calling to put him on shows, and I came as a part of the package deal. We started hitting the nicer clubs around Philly, we played Delaware and Atlantic City. The shows were getting big enough that there were contracts, and on one occasion, we needed to sign and fax one back by 5 p.m. the same day or we'd lose the gig. Jeff and I were scrambling who the hell do we know with a fax machine? JL was sitting in JL's corner of Jeff's basement, in his own world, reading the back of an Ohio player's album cover, the one with the naked girl on the inside with the honey all over her. Jeff and I were getting more and more frantic, trying to prevent this $1,500 from evaporating as 5 p.m. approached. Neither of us had a fax machine, I figured mom mom might have access to one at work, but it was already late on Friday. Dottio didn't like that newfangled shit. And Word Up Records only had a rotary dial car phone in its mobile business office. JL sat there quietly, as Jeff and I became aggravated with each other. You got all of this computer shit down here but you don't have a damn fax machine. I said. You can get a sampling guitar pedal from a Nazi in Vienna and you don't have no way of faxing a damn contract. How is it my job? What do you do in the group? JL never looked up, and in a bored monotone voice, he said, as much to the Ohio player's girl as to me and Jeff, I have a fax machine. And that's how James Lassiter became our manager. T here's a great concept from Jim Ron, look at the five people you spend the most time with because that's who you are. This is an idea I've always understood innately. Deep down inside, I knew that my dreams would be made or broken by the people I chose to surround myself with. Confucius had it right, it's nearly impossible for the quality of your life to be higher than the quality of your friends. And by the grace of God, there has never been a single moment in my life when I have looked to my left or to my right and not seen an extraordinary friend, someone who believed in me and was down for whatever. JL was in his final year of law school, and while it may have been a casual act of convenience for Jeff and me to hire him as our manager, we quickly realized that JL was not a casual kinda guy. He started making contact with all of our venues and concert promoters and began requesting documentation and financial information about record sales and studio costs from Dana. And when he wasn't satisfied with the responses, he hired a New York City attorney to oversee all of our business dealings. JL was one of those guys who didn't care about fame or money, he wasn't flashy, and he didn't want fancy clothes or sparkly jewels. He prided himself simply on defending the people he loved. JL read the recording contract we had signed with Dana. He had highlighted and circled and x ed out clauses, which didn't really matter because we had already signed it. Perched in JL's corner, with a perplexed look on his face, he asked, did you two read this contract? Jeff and I kinda glanced at each other. I didn't read it, did you? I said. Jeff shook his head, and then to JL said, Nah. What does it say? That was not the answer JL was hoping for. It says that y'all are stupid. Dana was always upbeat, telling us how hard he was working and how much money he was spending to promote the record. Jeff had heard it a couple of times on what around midnight, and a few friends and family members had caught it, but it was getting spotty airplay at best. You gotta bribe radio stations, you gotta wine and dine people. You know, it's competitive. They be trying to john me up. They play in it, though, y'all just not catch in it. Just give me some time, y'all gon' be huge. As since I had secretly decided that I wasn't going to college, I stopped doing homework, I didn't study for tests, and I didn't even show up for a lot of my classes. As far as Dadio was concerned, 
if I was disciplined at the ice house, performed my tasks impeccably, and wasn't getting myself arrested or killed, he was cool. But mom mom was friends with all of my teachers at Overbrook, and she snapped. Mom mom's super most parenting mission was for me, and for all of her children, to go to college. For her, college was everything. It was what she had picked up and moved to Philly for. It was why she tolerated Dadio's drinking and violence. It was a big part of why she moved back to Woodcrest. To her, a college education was the fundamental bedrock of a successful life. And without it, I was doomed. Hope sustains life. Hope is the elixir of survival during our darkest times. The ability to envision and imagine a brighter day gives meaning to our suffering and renders it bearable. When we lose hope, we lose our central source of strength and resilience. My mother's hopes for her kids had sustained her through the darkest years of her marriage. But now, I had developed hopes of my own. I had hip-hop hopes. I had hopes for albums and being on stage in front of 50,000 people shouting hoo hoo when I told them to. These hopes were now empowering and sustaining me. I would have died if I had to give them up. I couldn't, I wouldn't. It came to a head one afternoon toward the end of my senior year. I hadn't come home after school, I had gone straight to Jeff's to rehearse. It was about 10 p.m. when I finally made it home. I could feel Mom Mom before I even put my key in the front door. Sure enough, Mom Mom was in the kitchen, waiting for me. Hey, Mom. I said, mock joyfully. Are you having a problem, she said evenly. Nah, I'm good, Mom. No, apparently, you're having a big problem. Or, at least, you're about to. What's up, Mom? What happened? I just talked to Mrs. Stubbs. After four years you've forgotten where your classrooms are. No, Mom, I'm just doing a lot of stuff. What are you doing that's more important than getting into college? You know these schools are going to look at your final senior grades. We have come too far for you to throw your life away now. What is your problem? Mom Mom's voice and her posture denoted anger, but I saw something else beneath that, she was terrified. My heart melted. Mom. I've been working with Jeff for almost a year. People say he is the best DJ in the world. Rap is blowing up. It's on the radio, it's on MTV, and Run DMC went to Japan. I'm telling you, Mom, we are making songs that are as good as what anybody else is doing. Every time we perform, people go crazy. We found a record producer who's putting up money, we have a manager. Nobody in Philly can rap as good as me. Everybody says we're gonna be stars. I just need some time to make it happen. No. You can't be a rapper, she said bluntly. What? Why not? Because I don't know what that is. You listen to me right now, you will not cut another class, you will not miss another test. You will complete every single piece of homework that is assigned to you. You are going to college in the fall. Period. Mom, just listen to the music. I've been hearing you hippity hopping around here your whole life. That is a hobby, that is not a career. Good night. She stood up from the kitchen table, turned to walk away, and I stopped her with probably the worst thing I ever said to my mother. Mom, I'm not going to college. I was here on the backs of generations who had struggled through hardship and sacrificed the blessed recipient in a long lineage of striving African Americans to have a stable, educated, middle class life in America. Mom Mom and Dadio's generation grew up in the throes of segregation and immense poverty. Gigi's family had escaped the Jim Crow South. My mother had fought through decades of school district bureaucracies, financial uncertainty and Dadio's bullshit to get me to this point. And she was going to be damned if I didn't go to college because of some music I was doing at basement parties with homeboys named Jazz and Ready Rock. Our hopes had finally collided. And these hopes were inherently incompatible with each other. One had to give way. 
one of us was going to have our heart broken. The thing I've learned over the years about advice is that no one can accurately predict the future, but we all think we can. So advice at its best is one person's limited perspective of the infinite possibilities before you. People's advice is based on their fears, their experiences, their prejudices, and at the end of the day, their advice is just that, it's theirs, not yours. When people give you advice, they're basing it on what they would do, what they can perceive, on what they think you can do. But the bottom line is, while yes, it is true that we are all subject to a series of universal laws, patterns, tides, and currents all of which are somewhat predictable you are the first time you've ever happened. You and now are a unique occurrence, of which you are the most reliable measure of all the possibilities. I've always loved the scene in the pursuit of happiness on the basketball court, in which Jaden's character shoots the ball and yells, I'm going pro. My character, Chris Gardner, discourages him from pursuing basketball but catches himself, don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something, not even me. You gotta dream you gotta protect it. People can't do something themselves, they want to tell you you can't do it. If you want something, go get it. Period. My mother's college education saved her life, which solidified for her a fundamental premise, a college education is the only armor against the brutality of this world. And without a college education, I would be condemned to certain destruction. This was not her advice to me this was the truth. To her, being a rapper was impossible. But I am not my mother. Just as her education saved and defended her from the hardships of her early life, performance and hip-hop had saved me from mine. It's clearer when I look back now. While we were gridlocked and colliding and arguing, the reality was, both things were true one was true for her, and the other was true for me. But at the time, neither of us could compromise because it would mean destroying everything we stood for. D. Adio was caught in the middle. Mom Mom was demanding that he make me go to college, and I was begging him to please understand what I was saying. It was clear that he was going to have the final word. Dottio was going to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner of the hopes and dreams of either his wife or his son. Dottio deliberated for about a week. He would take me for a drive, Mom Mom for a walk, he'd ask questions and listen to us talk. In the meantime, Woodcrest was as cold as the ice house. My mother and I were cordial we kept it on high end by. And then one evening, Dottio called us both into the kitchen. My mother and I sat at the table, and Dottio leaned against the stove. Dottio had been here before, except the last time he was sitting in my seat, when he was being told by his parents what he could and couldn't do, when he had so loved his camera, but he'd been told it was just a hobby, not a career. At his heart, Dottio was an artist who had been robbed of his dreams and his passions because they were unrealistic and impractical. But he also knew firsthand the viciousness of this world against an uneducated black kid. Everything Dottio ever did, somebody had told him he couldn't do it. He was supposed to get a job because there was no way he could start his own business, people told him there was no way white people would work for him, there was no way real supermarkets would buy ice from a black man. He lived against a ferocious headwind of doubt and discouragement, but he did it all anyway. So, Here's what we gonna do, Dottio said. You got one year. Your mother said she can get all them schools to hold your acceptance till next September. We're gonna help you and support you to do anything you think you need to do to succeed. But in one year, if it ain't happening, you're going to go to whichever one of them schools your mother choose. That work for you. In my mind a year was forever. I was ecstatic. He turned to Mom Mom. That worked for you. Mom Mom clearly didn't love it, but this was a compromise that kept her dreams alive. She only said one word. Yup. And with that, Dottio went back to work. My experiences with my father are a mixed bag, to say the least. But that night, in the kitchen at 5943 Woodcrest Avenue he displayed the most exquisite leadership I had ever seen. 
that was how a father was supposed to be. A few weeks later, my mother called the dean at the University of Wisconsin, a school where my application had been accepted. She told the dean everything. It's terrible, she said. My son wants to take a gap year. He's doing something called rapping. He's got a manager, and some company is paying him to record an album. It all sounds suspect to me, but we were wondering if you could hold his place until September 87. The dean listened patiently. I think that's incredible, Mrs. Smith. What? Mom Mom said. For a young man his age? He would never get that kind of life experience here. He should absolutely do it. My mother was floored. And certainly will hold a spot for him. If his album doesn't work out, he can attend next year. That's no problem. A few weeks later, in early May, about a month before my graduation, I was bagging ice at Akrak. In case you were wondering, bagging ice is just as dull and monotonous as it sounds. And you always hurt your back. The aluminum scoop held about four pounds of ice, two and a half scoops into a ten pound bag, which you would then spin to twist the top and then drop it into the tie machine and then toss the bag into the shopping cart. If you stack them correctly you could get about 24 bags into one shopping cart. Then you roll the cart into the freezer, take the bags out one at a time, and stack them. In a 4 hour session, one person could do 200 to 250 bags. It's repetitive and you just kinda zone out for a few hours while you do it. I always liked to do it at night because that's when Power 99 played hip hop. I'd listen to the Power 9 at 9 countdown, getting lost in my own world and staying up on the new hip-hop jaunts. I would rap along, memorizing my favorite songs, and shovel on beat, inventing my own rhymes. But that night, I was quiet. For the first time I understood the old saying be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. I had held my ground against my parents, and they gave in. But now I had to prove it. Number 5555. Five, five, five. We got Cool Modi's brand new track, Go See the Doctor. I was walking down the street, rocking my beat, clapping my hands and stomping my feet. I saw a little lady, so neat and petite, she was so sweet, yes, I wanted to meet I mean, I'm as good as Cool Modi, I thought, trying to psych myself up. But Mom Mom had gotten into my head. What if she's right? What if a rapper isn't really a thing? And only one year? Is that enough? This last year just blazed on by. Maybe I should go to college. I did do all of this with Jeff while I went to high school maybe I could go to college and still do music. Scoop. Bag. Scoop. Bag. Scoop. Bag. I am not trying to be living at home. I need my own spot, my own money, my own car. Number 4. The Beastie Boys are back with Hold It Now, Hit It. Now I chill real ill when I start to chill, when I'll my pockets with a knot of dollar bill sip and pints of ale out at a windowsill when I get my LL I'm chilly chill scoop, bag. Scoop, bag. Scoop, bag. Man, I'm definitely as good as the Beastie Boys. Except they're on the radio, and I'm bagging ice. Maybe bag and ice is my destiny. But, man, if I'm stuck here with Dadio in ten years, I am a sever my own head with the dull end of this ice scoop. I mean, Run DMC and Beastie Boys had to have their own versions of bag and ice, right? Or maybe they were flukes, one in a million. Number 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 three. Check it out, y'all hot off the presses from Stetsasonic's debut album, On Fire. This is a new one, you guys been asking for it, it's called My Rhyme. But I'm one in a million. Jeff S one in a million. Mom Mom is not my target audience. How she think she gonna tell if a rapper is good or not? She judge in stuff she don't even understand. And what about Melanie? You cannot keep a girlfriend if you run in off to some college somewhere. She'll be tossed up with some other joker in two weeks. Scoop, bag, 
scoop, bag, scoop, bag. And we're back, with number two. It's yo boy's old favorite, that's right, run. D. M. C. My Adidas. This was my jam, it snapped me out of my funk. I was back to shoveling on beat and rapping along. My. Auditas walked through concert doors and roam all over Coliseum or as I stepped on stage, at Live Aid all the people gave, and the poor got paid my shoveling picked up pace, completely involuntarily. That's the power of hip hop, I thought. My Adidas touched the sand of a foreign land with mic in hand I cold took command but my reverie was short lived. I couldn't get my mind off mom mom. I'd failed to protect her from Dadia. I wasn't brave enough to go with her when she left. And now, the hopes she had for me, the dreams that had sustained her through all her pain and trouble, I was spitten in the face of that. I couldn't shake the sense that I was failing her again. My Adidas finished playing, and Power 99 went to a commercial break. I realized I had missed the end of the song. Damn, I thought. Not even my Adidas could pull me out of this one. I rolled the final cart into the freezer. I was done for the night. I counted the bags while commercials blared new mattress sales, everything must go. Maybe I could sell mattresses, I thought. That shit can't be hard. I could do hip-hop mattress raps. Get a good night's rest, good sleep routines got twins and foals, got kings and queens I threw the shovel on the side, closed the machines up. And we're back, with the power 9 at 9 countdown. Tonight, we have a newcomer to the countdown shutting off the lights, I realized I couldn't find my keys. I'd lost my keys a few times before, and Dottio had had to come pick me up. I was dreading the thought of having to call him to come get me. Here I am, demanding my independence, about to have to call my daddy to pick me up because I can't find my damn keys. The phones have been off the hook all day from y'all wanting to hear these guys, so get ready for our hometown boys, Philly's very own, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. This is. Girls ain't nothing but I totally froze. My mouth was hanging open, for some reason my heart was pounding. I wanted to scream, I wanted to jump, but at the same time I didn't want to do anything to bump into the universe and knock my record off the radio. Then those words. Those words I knew so well and had repeated hundreds, maybe thousands, of times before, were coming out of the radio, listen, homeboys, don't mean to bust your bubble but girls of the world ain't nothing but trouble. It was my voice. That was me. On the radio. Me. My rhymes. My voice. I wanted to call people, but I didn't want to miss it. Just last week when I was walking down the street I observed this low Ely lady that I wanted to meet I ran outside, I wanted to grab somebody, to tell somebody, that's me, y'all, that's me. But it was 10 o'clock, nobody was out there. I started giggling, a knee-jerk reaction that I still have to this day when I find myself in extreme emotional circumstances. I couldn't stop laughing. It was a joyous, blissful laughter. The pure joy of a child waking up on Christmas morning. The joy of discovery. Of renewed hope. Of a new life. The joy of being right about me. Ignorance we didn't know shit. The tour bus pulled up on Woodcrest. We'd all agreed we'd meet at my house because my street was the widest. My whole family assembled to see us off. Mom Mom, Dadio, Gigi, Ellen, Harry, Pam was home now, too. But Melanie said she couldn't bear to see me drive away we had said our goodbyes the night before. The neighborhood kids had never seen a tour bus before, so they buzzed around, checking the tires, peering into the luggage bays, and talking to the driver. Somehow, Dana had done it. Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble lit up local radio in May 1986 finally. When it first came out in March it had stumbled, but by late May it caught fire. We were hearing that it was getting played in Delaware, New Jersey, and even New York City. I graduated from high school in June, 
which meant I had an entire month as a senior with a hit record on the radio, that's too much power for one 17-year-old to have. As I ran off stage in my cap and gown, waving my diploma, I ran to hug mom mom. But she jokingly refused to hug me, snatched the diploma out of my hand, and said, boy, this is mine. By July, Dana had me and Jeff locked in Studio 4 in downtown Philadelphia recording our debut album, Rock the House. Because Jeff and I had been making songs since the day we met, we finished the album at light speed. But Dana kept messing with the songs, remixing and re-engineering them, and ultimately ruining the production. Our relationship with him was already souring, but we didn't have time to focus on that. We had a hit song, and we had to figure out how to capitalize on it right now. We did a few shows up and down the East Coast with LL Cool J and Houdini, including a couple of sold-out gigs in New York City. Then we booked our first full tour, we would be opening for Public Enemy and Two Live Crew, two of the biggest hip-hop acts in the country at the time. We fed our luggage into the belly of the tour bus. My biological family ceremoniously presenting me unto my new hip-hop family. JL was the new father he was the mature one, he was the adult in the room. He gave mom mom and Dio our itinerary, complete with bus routing, hotel names and phone numbers, venue addresses and dates, agents names and contact info. JL was 21, going on 22. He was the oldest, and mom mom and Dio were relieved he was in charge. Omer was the youngest he was only 16, and even at that age his fashion sense was fire. He always had the hottest gear and was the only person I've ever known who traveled with an iron. Most groups had at least two dancers for the symmetry, but Omer's leg surgery had been so effective that we only needed him. He and I had grown up about ten doors from each other, he had been a witness to most of the major events of my life so far. He had seen me through Raleigh choppers, cowboy boots, he'd bagged more than his share of ice, he'd even lied to me as I was being deposited into the back of an ambulance. Oh yeah, man, definitely, you definitely dunked it. Omer wouldn't be graduating high school until next year, so JL had to walk up the street to his house to promise his mother that he would take responsibility for Omer getting his homework done and maintaining his honor roll status, Miss Brown who had already played a key role in the naming of the Fresh Prince had made this a condition of Omer being allowed to go on tour with us. Mrs. Rambert, you don't have to be concerned, JL said to Omer's mom. I graduated from Overbrook, will graduated from Overbrook, and I give you my word, I will make sure that Omer graduates from Overbrook. Over the next year, JL helped Omer do his homework in hotel rooms, on tour buses, at rest stops, and they even missed our day at Six Flags over Georgia because of Pythagoras. Reddy Rock had stayed out partying the night before, he was exhausted. He threw his bags on the bus and was fast asleep in his bunk before we even pulled off. Jeff had just gotten brand new anvil cases to transport his turntables, records and beat boxes. At the time, because of my excitement, I didn't notice, but Jeff was quiet and to himself that day. In subsequent years he would confide in us that because of his sheltered childhood, every time we would have to leave Philly, he suffered extreme anxiety attacks and other physical reactions. He would have 30 to 40 minute vomiting spells, but for the longest time, he never said a word. We had all decided that if we were going to be traveling around to all of these strange towns and cities, it would be unwise to go without security. And in the early days of hip-hop, security was defined as your biggest and tallest friend who didn't smile. Ours was Charles Alston, a.k.a. Charlie Mack. Charlie Mack was raised in South Philly, one of the rougher sections of town. His parents were separated, and he lived with his mom. They moved a lot during his early childhood, until the chaos of his home life pushed him into the streets. Charlie started hustling on the corners when he was just 11 years old. Not too long after, he graduated to gun toting and more serious drug dealing. By the time we met him, he was 6 foot 7, almost 300 pounds, and nobody messed with Charlie Mack. 
He showed up that day with a green trash bag full of ones and fives clearly the previous evening's revenues from his purveying of neighborhood pharmaceuticals. He had the trash bag slung over his shoulder like a ghetto Santa Claus. Charlie. You cannot walk around carrying a hefty bag full of cash, JL said. What you mean, what you mean, what you sayin'? I'm not going nowhere without my money, Charlie grumbled. Charlie's voice is way too deep, and he speaks way too fast to be nearly seven feet tall. And when he gets excited, he has no problem saying the same word or phrase as many times as necessary until you submit. My man my man my man my man, and again, and again, hold up hold up hold up hold up hold up. This will stop anybody in their tracks the timbre and speed of repetition are barely comprehensible but magically induce compliance on the part of the listener. So we let him calm down me, Jeff, and JL spoke to him later. We talked about our dreams and what we all hoped to build together. We offered Charlie a choice, he could continue to be a drug dealer, or he could take this shot with us to build real lives. We couldn't pay him as much as he could make on the streets, but when we could, we promised we would. Charlie paused, I could tell he was weighing the whole of his life. He had dreams, too. And in some deep, hidden part of his soul, he knew he was living beneath himself he had just needed someone to say it out loud. I think I can fuck with y'all, he said. He ultimately devoted his life to DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. It would prove to be a commitment that was not without twists and turns. But one thing was true from that day on, he never sold drugs again. BAGS are finally loaded. Everyone has said their goodbyes. The posse is mounted. I hug my family and step into the tour bus door well. Three dirty rubber stairs, the threshold into my new life, a stargate, the portal out of my childhood and into the infinitely unknowable on my own, where Dottio could no longer hurt me, but he could no longer protect me, either. Away from the shame of failing my mother, away from the fear in her eyes that seemed to say, he's ruining his life. As the doors began to close, I caught eyes with Gigi. She smiled that smile I'd seen in Resurrection Baptist Church every single Sunday of my life. Jews remember, lover boy, she said, be nice to everybody you pass on your way up, cause you just might have to pass them again on your way down. Tihi sun was setting as our bus rattled across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Pennsylvania had turned into Delaware Delaware had turned into Maryland, and the initial excitement had settled. The hum of the road lulled my heart into a reverie. The thought washed over me, I am in charge now. I had never been in love like I was with Melanie Parker. I wanted to build a life for us, to shield her from the chaos in the world. I wanted to do it right. From the time I was five years old, I always wanted to be married. I wanted my own family. Even my childhood games with my siblings, we used to play white family. Ellen was Kathy, Harry was Dickie, and I was Junior. Later, my fantasies as a teenager never involved having multiple girlfriends or wild orgies. My fantasies always involved one woman. I wanted to ravish her with my complete, undivided devotion and affection. I wanted to be the best man she's ever known I wanted to fulfill all of her dreams, solve all of her problems, take away all of her pain. I wanted her to adore me. I wanted to be so trustworthy and emotionally reliable that I would cleanse her impression of all men. And if I could have killed a dragon for her, climbed up her hair, entered the heavily guarded castle, and then have my kiss work as an antidote to the poison she'd ingested, that would have just been a little icing on my love cake. I was 18. From the day I met her, Melanie had been the center of my life. Healing the pain of her trauma became my constant preoccupation. The look in Melanie's eyes became the substitute for Gigi's approval. I've always needed a woman to achieve for. When I performed, I was now performing for Melanie. When I started making money rapping, in my mind, I was making money for her. I bound my self-esteem to the sliding scale of her happiness. If she was happy, that meant I was a good person. If she was unhappy, 
that meant I was a monster. W.E. arrived in Tallahassee on the first leg of our southern run. The rest of the guys would go to the venue early to set up and sound check, and because all I had to do was rap, I could arrive 45 minutes before showtime. On that first night, I walked into the dressing room to find the whole squad sitting around with six or seven girls. Jordache jeans and bamboo earrings everywhere. The dressing room smelled like the perfume section of a merry-go-round. I politely asked Keisha, Mercedes, and Cinnamon and them to leave. And I called a crew meeting. We gotta get these rules straight, I said. I don't want no girls in the dressing rooms, no girls on the bus, and whatever floor we're staying on in the hotel, I don't want no girls there, either. I don't wanna be smellin' no perfume and hearin' no giggling and shit. I'm in love with Melanie, we're in a relationship, and I am not out here for no foolishness. The guys all kind of looked at one another as if to say, he can't be serious. Reddy Rock raised his hand, and I pointed to him. What, man? Reddy Rock, somewhat confused, said, so, where we supposed to fuck all the groupies at? Hopefully, you'll be fucking them behind that preposition, I said. Will, that's crazy, man, Charlie Mack said. You're not out here by yourself. This is all of us. How you making lateral decisions? Look, man, I'm about to propose to this girl, we're getting married. And I am not messing it up because of a bunch of horny ass ghetto hyenas. Big bro, I respect that you in love and all that, Omer said, but that don't make me no hyena. I was going full choir boy. And the guys didn't like it at all. But when my mind locks onto an idea when I commit to a system of beliefs there are only two options, one, I complete my mission. Or two, I'm dead. W.E. didn't know shit. We didn't realize you had to pay the bus driver yourself, and if you didn't, he might just go home. We didn't know that some venues would skim money off the top that they'd lie to you about how many tickets they'd sold. We didn't know that unruly audiences would throw things at you on stage if they didn't like you pennies, bottles, batteries, shoes, and even an M80 explosive in Oakland one night. We didn't know there were all kinds of curfew laws and union rules in different states that meant your show would get shut down if you didn't shut up and get off stage quick enough. We didn't know that you had to grease the security guys at the venue if you didn't want your stuff to come up missing. We didn't realize that one inch on a map could equal 12 hours on a tour bus. People often say ignorance is bliss. Maybe right up until it's not. We punish ourselves for not knowing. We always complain about what we could and should have done, and how much of a mistake it was that we did that thing, that unforgivable thing. We beat on ourselves for being so stupid, regretting our choices and lamenting the horrible decisions we make. But here's the reality that's what life is. Living is the journey from not knowing to knowing. From not understanding to understanding. From confusion to clarity. By universal design you are born into a perplexing situation, bewildered, and you have one job as a human, figure this shit out. Life is learning. Period. Overcoming ignorance is the whole point of the journey. You're not supposed to know at the beginning. The whole point of venturing into uncertainty is to bring light to the darkness of our ignorance. I heard a great saying once, life is like school with one key difference in school you get the lesson, and then you take the test. But in life, you get the test, and it's your job to take the lesson. We're all waiting until we have deep knowledge, wisdom, and a sense of certainty before we venture forth. But we've got it backward venturing forth is how we gain the knowledge. Over the next few years, while our ignorance would rain down a deluge of pain and suffering, when I look back, I see clearly it could have been no other way. The universe only teaches through experience. So, even when you haven't the slightest clue what you're doing, you just have to take a deep breath and get on the damn bus. Why oh you couldn't have found three more different groups to put on the same stage than DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Public Enemy, and two live crew. But hip-hop was like that back then. 
I found myself studying the audience even more than the performers. We were all tapping into totally different aspects of the human spirit. Public enemy would ignite social consciousness people would stomp and yell and cheer, venting their dissatisfaction with authority. I noticed how the security energy in the building particularly in the south would heighten as Chuck D. riled the audience to rail against our shared sense of injustice. As part of their show, they had a stunt man dress up as a KKK member. They played out a scene in which he was sentenced for his crimes against humanity, and then in the most shocking moment of their entire show, they put a noose around his neck and hung him on stage. For 30 seconds his body jerking and convulsing in mid-air, while the crowd watched until his last shudder. And then silence, his lifeless body swinging above center stage and then, yes. He rhythm, the rebel. Chuck D would drop into rebel without a pause, as chaos and pandemonium was unleashed. And while I have experienced other performers who have matched the level of intensity public enemy could conjure, I have never seen it surpassed. Two live crew tapped into an entirely different kind of energy. Luther Campbell, a.k.a. Luke Skywalker or Uncle Luke, came out on stage and screamed to the crowd, he yi yi yi, and 15,000 people screamed we want some puss I, including the probably 8,000 women in attendance. I still haven't totally figured that one out. We had never heard of two live crew, yet in Florida they were the headliner. Their hit single was called We Want Some Pussy. They were giving the crowd permission to unleash, at least verbally, their inner hyenas. This was further amplified by the simulated lewd sex acts they included in their shows. And if I can keep it real, some nights they just skipped the simulated part. But what really caught my attention was how smart everybody was. This was an era when authority be it government, business, law enforcement, even many parents was skeptical and fearful of the growing influence of hip-hop and hip-hop artists. Rap concerts were met with stringent scrutiny, particularly when we toured through southern states. When you're on tour with Public Enemy and two live crew in Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Alabama, rest assured your ass was gonna get stringently scrutinized. Before the concerts in the South, there were always meetings with local sheriffs and chiefs of police to inform us of the local laws and statutes that govern the behavior that would be tolerated on stage. We were informed that any infringement would lead to an immediate ending of the show, and we would be forcibly pulled off stage and arrested. Needless to say, both public Filatio and hanging clansmen were frowned upon in Mississippi. Given the high stakes, these meetings would inevitably escalate into social debate and legal interpretation. Chuck D. knew the law he had local advocates, community leaders, and legal scholars arming him with the counterarguments and information necessary to defend his First Amendment rights. And when all else failed, he had bail money pre-organized. But what was not gonna happen was some local sheriff telling him he couldn't perform his show exactly the way he wanted to perform it. He hung a Klansman every single night of that tour. Luke Skywalker, on the other hand, wanted to get arrested. He saw it as supremely effective publicity. Uncle Luke was a brilliant entrepreneur, he owned his own record company, distributor, agency, and merchandising group, not to mention barber shops, supermarkets, and nightclubs. He hadn't yet worked out how to expand his businesses beyond his regional foothold. But he knew that if he got arrested in Macon, Georgia, that Baton Rouge and Shreveport, Louisiana, would sell out within 24 hours of the headline. And on top of it, he'd had a perfectly lovely time on stage. He was also well aware of the growing national and international spotlight that was shining on the question of art versus morality. At the time, Tipper Gore, then the wife of the senator, Al Gore, was leading the charge against profanity in entertainment. Back then, FCC rules forbade broadcasting profanity, and 2 Live didn't have a single record that didn't have profanity in it. Even record store owners were getting arrested for crimes of obscenity for selling their albums. So, Uncle Luke got a boat, built a radio station on it, and kept it offshore in international waters where he could legally broadcast back to the mainland. Luke saw 2 Live crew being at the explosive center of this battle, and he aimed to harness this fuel to expand his business globally. 
Eventually, the U.S. Court of Appeals ruled that rap was protected by the First Amendment. More than 20 years later, Luther Campbell ended up running for mayor of Miami-Dade County. I remember sitting in those meetings, wanting to raise my hand so bad and say, Excuse me, Mr. Sheriff Officer Sir, you don't need to look at me, cause my grandmother agrees with you. But honestly, you can probably just arrest them right now. Cause Chuck is definitely gonna hang a Klansman tonight, and Luke never gets past the first chorus before his balls are all the way out. Now, our show, Mr. Officer Sir, is good, wholesome, family fun. Jeff is the best DJ on earth. Ready Roxy can make the theme from Sanford and Son sound like it's underwater. Omer couldn't even walk till he was six, but now he's the best damn dancer since. Who might you know? Who's a good white dancer? Fred Astaire. And if there was ever a black kid you wanted your daughter, Becky Sue, to bring home, I promise you it's me. You won't have no problems out of us. Are we free to go now? I don't remember JL speaking once in any of those meetings. Instead, he filled legal pads with notes. He studied every single word, he later went back to research the statutes, he met with public enemies managers, made friends with tour promoters, picked Luke Skywalker's brain about major labels versus self-distribution. JL spent less and less time going with us sightseeing, to clubs, or to amusement parks, and more and more time studying the music business from any and every angle. T. Ouring had opened our eyes to the industry and the intricacies of how it actually worked. Public Enemy had a management company, accountants, A&R reps, and road managers. We just had JL Word Up Records, Dana's record label, still didn't have any other artists signed to it, Dana didn't tell us how many records we sold. Our record still wasn't available in any stores outside of Philly. But the breaking point for me happened when we found out that Dana had not been returning calls from Russell Simmons. Back then, Russell was arguably the single most important person in the hip-hop world. He had been representing artists and producing records since 1977. He co-founded Def Jam Records, the biggest hip-hop label in the 80s. And he had groomed, managed, and produced all of the biggest acts, such as the Beastie Boys, Run DMC, LL Cool J, and Houdini. Apparently, Russell had been trying to contact us for months already, but none of his messages were getting to us because he was trying to reach us through Dana. We were pissed. Russell absolutely loved DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. He was raving about the first line of Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble where I say, Ah my eye, my eye slash man this guy just walked up to me and punched me in my eye, man slash talking about how I was just trying to talk to his girl, man slash I don't even know her, man. That's the eyeless shit I've ever heard, Russell said. What rapper admits they got punched in the eye? Russell recognized our honesty, vulnerability, and self-deprecating humor unheard of in hip-hop at the time as a passport to places rappers had never gone. Russell wanted to work with us, unfortunately, Dana refused to talk to him. I've always marveled at JL's and Dana's opposite reactions to Russell's enthusiasm. Whereas Dana was threatened by Russell's interest, JL saw us as a potential teacher and a gateway to new opportunities. And JL had a plan, even though Dana controlled the recording of our music, JL controlled the management of our career. He agreed to turn over the management of DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince to Russell Simmons and Lear Cohen at Rush Management under three conditions, one, they would put Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince on tour with their biggest artists, two, they would hire JL to oversee our account, and, three, they would teach JL the business. Russell agreed. It is so painful when people I care about miss the opportunity to elevate. I've been in this kind of situation maybe 50 times in my career. I am trying to climb and fly as high as humanly possible, and I want to take the people I love with me. But invariably, at critical moments, when the necessity to level up presents itself, some people like JL rise to the occasion and others fold. Whether they don't see the grander vision, or can't take the heat of the fresh challenge, or they're trapped by some hidden, 
self-defeating narrative, over and over I have suffered the pain of waving from the bow of the new ship as they're left behind, standing on the shore. You gotta get us out of this Dana deal, I said to JL it doesn't work like that, JL said. So he can just hold us back and there's nothing we can do? Doesn't he have some legal responsibility? He has a contract, JL said. You just make the records. Let me figure this out. Hip hop was now a global business, and DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were primed to be packaged and sold to the world. We needed national and global distribution. Jive Records was based out of London. Jive would later become famous for masterminding the careers of Britney Spears, In Sync, and Backstreet Boys, but back in the 80s, they were the biggest hip hop label in Europe. With Dana controlling our record in the United States, JL orchestrated an international distribution deal with Jive to sell Rock the House overseas. Jive hired Dana's Word Up Records to be the official distributor of DJ Jazzy and Jeff and the Fresh Prince in the United States. On the surface, this appeared to be an easy win for Dana. He'd get to keep selling our records in the States while we'd gain a bigger profile worldwide and go into the studio on Jive's dime. Basically, Jive would cover all the costs, but Dana would still get a revenue stream at home. Dana couldn't wait to sign that contract. Dana got a big check and sold our international rights to Jive. Jive immediately remastered and re-released Rock the House, in March 1987, with a new cover and a new burst of energy, and it became a significant global hit. They were also able to sell this new version as an import in the United States. Dana realized that he had opted for a one-time payment instead of a royalty, and he could do nothing about the imports. So he demanded more money and threatened to refuse all cooperation with Jive. A legal battle ensued. And as soon as the lawyers started digging into our paperwork, they figured out that I had been 17 when I signed the contract with Dana. Under Pennsylvania law, Anyone under the age of 18 cannot legally sign a contract without a parent or guardian present. I had signed mine in the lobby of a studio before a recording session, therefore, in legal terms, our contract with Dana never existed. Just like that, Dana Goodman was out of the DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince business. Dana was furious. At first, he blamed Jive and Russell Simmons. But lacking the lawyers and money to go after them, he decided to exact revenge on the next best thing, me. People in the neighborhood started pulling me up, hey, man, Dana's really upset. Just watch your back. Then, one night, he pulled up outside our house, parked his car on the street, and just sat there. I was terrified, but Dadio never flinched. Not saying a word, he opened the front door, walked up to Dana's car, and leaned down into the open passenger side window. Dadio saw a gun on the dashboard. Can I help you? Dadio said. Where's that motherfucker at? Dana gruffly responded. Well, if the motherfucker you're looking for is Will, he's in the house. You're welcome to come in and kill him now. And the whole family's home, too, cause if you touch Will, you gon' have to kill us all. But we ain't acceptin' no fucking threats from you. Dottio immediately turned his back on a man who could easily have shot him and strolled into the house. I'm not sure if it was his military training or his upbringing on the streets of North Philly, but he taught me a valuable lesson that day, it's better to die than to walk around scared. I was in the living room, peeking from behind the curtain. I watched as Dana put his car in drive and drove away. A DVENTUREIF this book were a movie, we've now reached the montage scene where the music kicks in, for the love of money by the OJs, and everything goes great. Our hero can't miss, he's on the come up. Every shot goes in, every kiss burns with the passion of a thousand suns, he can't get to the bank fast enough to cash all the checks. His name dances off the lips and rings in the ears of the high and the mighty no longer emblazoned on the side of his pants, his moniker now bounces off his chest in 24 karat herringbone gold littered with ethically sourced diamonds. It became clear in this year that he was never going to college. Our debut album, 
Rock the House led by Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble as the first single, and now plugged into the international distribution system of Jive Records ended up going gold, selling more than 500,000 copies, and would eventually reach number 83 on the Billboard 200 chart. And while that wasn't necessarily considered earth-shattering at the time, Cinderella had made it to the ball. Now, I don't want to be the old guy at the end of the bar yapping about how much better music was in his day. How these kids don't know nothing about real rap. There is actually brain science that theorizes that the songs you hear in your teenage years become embronzed in your emotional memory, heightening their nostalgic power beyond any other period in your life. That's not what's happening here. I get that that's what happens with other people. But this is not some dopamine-induced opinion, blinkered by wistful memories of a fairy tale adolescence. No. What I'm saying is objectively, and factually true, the late 1980s was the greatest time in hip-hop history, period, full stop, amen. Please be seated, allow me to make my case. From the moment Jeff and I stepped on that tour bus in late 1986, through summer 1988, we performed nearly 200 shows. And I would like to list just a few of the hip-hop icons with whom we shared a stage, imagine this in my trying not to be an asshole voice run DMC LL Cool J Houdini Public Enemy 2 Live Crew Salt and Peppa Eric B and Rakim and WAE PMD UTFOJJ Fad Beastie Boys The Ghetto Boys Heavy D and The Boys Sir Mix A Lot Kid and Play MC Light Queen Latifah Grandmaster Flash Ice T Mantronics and Just Ice Easy E2 Short MC Hammer Doug E Fresh and Slick Rick Big Daddy Kane Bismarcky Roxanne Shante MC Shan and the whole Juice Crew A Tribe called Quest Leaders of the New School Naughty by Nature Shall I Continue, or We Good. This was one of the greatest periods of my life. Everything was new we were defining the culture. We were a part of the wave, the tsunami that was carrying hip-hop across the globe. Every artist was unique something happened every show that was a first in hip-hop. We were playing in front of crowds where sometimes 50% of the audience had never seen someone rap before. They were in awe. There was an intoxicating energy of discovery and adventure. This was a time in my life rich with first encounters and mind-expanding new experiences. The executive who ran our account at Jive was a Japanese woman named Ann Carly. At first, Jeff and I were a little confused at how she was going to direct our careers, and then she spoke. She had been at the heart of the initial bursts of hip-hop in New York City. She fed Jeff and me a global diet of the world's hip-hop colorings. I could feel my spirit of adventure awakening. I discovered the vital importance of travel at Lens critical perspective. Things that had been debilitating problems in my mind on the streets of West Philly barely existed in a rodeo arena in Omaha, Nebraska. I made a promise to myself that I would eat anything that the locals ate. I've eaten blackened alligator, sea slugs, camel, and chocolate-covered crickets. Everything tastes like chicken. It doesn't I just always wanted to say that. I wanted to see and do everything. On the back of the moderate but solid success of Rock the House, Jive Records was eager for us to record a follow-up album as soon as possible. In the fall of 1987, our first ever trip out of the United States was scheduled six weeks in London, where Jive was headquartered, to record in their company studios. But two weeks prior to our departure date, JL called me with that 1 a.m. phone call where even the tone of the ring makes your heart jump. Jeff was in a car accident, he said. Disoriented, I responded, what happened? Where is he? Is he cool? I don't know, I'm going to the hospital, I'll hit you back. Back then, there were no texts, no reaching people in their cars, no minute-to-minute -minute reports on how your loved ones were doing. You just made sure everybody stayed off the landline, you kept checking the phone for a dial tone, and you waited. And the longer you waited, the more graphic and disturbing the pictures your mind painted until you were absolutely certain that you'd never see them again. At about 3.15 a.m., the phone rang again. This time the ring was louder than it should have been, like it was ringing at me instead for me. I answered. Yo. He's cool, JL said. 
his right leg is broken, and he has a cast from his hip to his ankle. Other than that, he's fine. But the doctor said he shouldn't fly. We need to postpone the trip for about eight weeks. In the background I heard Jeff scream out, I don't give a fuck what that doctor says. In two weeks, I am maybe on a plane to London. And true to his determined spirit, two weeks later, we were checking into the Holiday Inn, Swiss Cottage. It was me and Charlie in one tiny cramped ass hotel room and JL, Ready Rock and Jeff and his full length cast in another. Just five Philly kids, dreary English days and dank English nights, but a private recording studio set aside just for us on Jive's dime. We spent more than a month in London, and I couldn't have told you a single thing about the city. We didn't walk through Hyde Park or visit Westminster Abbey. We didn't see Buckingham Palace or climb the Tower of London. We didn't sit in a thousand-year-old pub and eat fish and chips. And we sure as hell didn't go to no soccer match. We never even adjusted from our jet lag. We woke up at 4 p.m. every day, hit the studio by 6 p.m., worked until about 6 a.m., grabbed some free breakfast from the Swiss Cottage Buffet, and went to bed around 7 a.m. We kept that schedule up for almost six weeks. And it was bliss. Well, except for the one night that Jeff decided he wanted his cast taken off. His six-week appointment to have it removed fell while we were still in London, and his leg was starting to itch, but he didn't trust Britain's National Health Service to take it off. He was more comfortable if me and Charlie Mack did it. As a general rule, if someone asks me if I can do something, the answer is always yes, a delusional trait that both Charlie Mack and I share wholeheartedly. It's a cast, I'm saying, it's just a cast. Let's just take it off, Charlie said indifferently. I, too, felt confident in the basic simplicity of the operation. It was just a cast. I called room service and requested a steak knife. Little did I know that British hotels didn't carry steak knives, this would make the process of cutting a piece of steak far too easy for them. Undeterred, I said, well, can you send up 30 butter knives, please? The Swiss cottage butter knives had a tiny serrated edge at the tip, which suggests that they weren't actually butter knives. My plan was, I would give Charlie 15 knives, and he would begin cutting at Jeff's ankle, and I would take 15 knives and start cutting at Jeff's hip. The way the math played out in my mind, by the time we'd worn out the serrated edges of the butter knives, we should have met at Jeff's knee for a quick high-five celebration before making the last ceremonial cut. I had a vague memory that this toe ended, meat in the middle process was successfully employed in the building of the Panama Canal and equally in the construction of the United States Railroad System. The cutting began. Or the lack thereof. Butter knife after butter knife bent and fell, as confusion grew into frustration on Charlie's sweat-moistened face. Yo, these knives ain't doing shit, he said. I was 12 years old the last time I'd had a cast, and at the time they were made of plaster of Paris. Apparently, cast science had advanced since then, and Jeff's was made out of some new alien material that I later learned was fiberglass. About six knives in, I called a halt. Undeterred, I suggested that Jeff get into the bathtub. We'd make the water as hot as he could take it, thereby softening this puppy up. I assured Jeff it would come right off. He agreed. Me and Charlie helped Jeff into the bathtub, both legs fully submerged, and then we waited. Pretty soon, a look of concern washed over Jeff's face. Yo, man, y'all need to get this shit off, it's tightening up, Jeff said. I remember thinking, what would MacGyver do? MacGyver was a hit 1980s TV show where the lead character, Angus MacGyver, would get into all kinds of predicaments, only to come up with some ingenious solution. As I was attempting to channel my inner Mac, I heard the door to the hotel room open a few seconds later, JL pokes his head into the bathroom. By this point, Jeff is squirming and moaning in the bathtub, while Charlie Mack and I are on our knees holding two butter knives with 28 others scattered all over the bathroom floor. JL takes a long pause, 
presumably trying to puzzle out what he's seeing. Stumped, he shouts, what the fuck are y'all doing? JL, JL. Jeff squealed. You gotta get this shit off my leg. Why are you in the tub? JL had spent the previous two years working at a hospital. So, while it was not his expertise, either, he at least knew that you don't soak a fiberglass cast in hot water while it's still on somebody's leg. You can't get that cast wet like that. Just get it off, y'all, Jeff wailed. Stop bitchin', man, it can't be that bad, Charlie said. Get him out the goddamn tub, JL barked. You don't need to be yelling at US, JL, that don't help shit. Charlie snapped back. Me and Charlie got Jeff out of the tub as instructed and laid him on the bathroom floor. We had been keeping canned foods in our hotel rooms because Swiss cottage room service wasn't all it could have been. JL immediately went over and opened a can of beef stew. With the jagged edge of the aluminum lid, he came over to Jeff's cast, and whereas Charlie and I had been trying to cut vertically up and down the cast, JL made gentle horizontal moves across the cast, and like Grant through Richmond, in less than 90 seconds, he had made a full-length incision, which Charlie and I were able to easily pry fully open. Jeff was free. Angrily, JL threw the top of the beef stew can into the trash, and as he exited, he grumbled, y'all are as stupid as shit. I n medical scenarios, we may have been dumb and dumber. But in the studio, we were fire. Those recording sessions were probably the purest creative experiences I have ever had in my career. We recorded so many songs, and the record company loved so many of them, that they decided to attempt something that had never before been tried in the world of rap, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince would release Hip Hop's first double album. Jeff and I had no concept of what this album was going to do, whether it was something fans would want to hear, whether MTV would like it, whether radio stations would play it, whether hip hop heads would diss it. None of this crossed our minds all we cared about was that we were inspired and inflamed by the creative process. We were having fun we were best friends at the center of our new family, and we were on the cutting edge of a burgeoning global art form. We were riding high, but in hindsight, imperceptible seeds of impending discontent were being sown. Some people thrive at high altitudes, but others can't breathe. And what do people do when they climb a mountain and realize the air is too thin? They try to get back down as fast as possible. Quincy Jones called it altitude sickness. In high school, Reddy Rock and I had been best friends. We would ride around every single day battling and creating. We were inseparable. But as DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince began to take shape, human beatboxing was becoming less and less of a core art form within our group. The record company was also not interested in songs featuring human beatboxing. The result was that Clayt was being pushed to the fringes of our new family. I was telling him to not worry I got you, I said. In hindsight, it was too much change too fast, and the experience demanded emotional maturity that was far beyond what any of us possessed. And to make matters even more painful and complicated, Charlie Mack and I were becoming locked at the hip. We weren't just sharing a hotel room together we were sharing every aspect of our lives. There's even a song on the album celebrating my relationship with Charlie, Charlie Mack, the first out the limo, dot. The song developed from Charlie overdoing his security job he would sit in the front of the limo with the driver, and he would be pissed if me or Jeff got out before he did. He would bark, God damn, y'all, let me secure the perimeter before y'all step out. There are no songs on the album about Ready Rock. From 1987 until 1990, I did not step outside without Charlie Mack with me. Whereas Jeff and JL were quiet, introspective homebodies, Charlie and I were loud, raucous, center of attention party starters. We were always looking for something to get ourselves into. We both loved to party, we loved to talk, we loved traveling and gambling and fast cars, and women loved us. Charlie not only matched but also challenged my adventurous spirit. This joke I never wanted to sleep. 
if we were only in a town for 10 hours, he didn't see any reason to spend a single minute in the hotel room. Many a day he literally dragged me out of bed to go to Paisley Park in Minneapolis, or to go hear a speech given by some activist in Chicago, or demand that we take a picture on the strip, which is what Charlie calls the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Man, man, he'd say, you get to sleep all you want when you dead. The other part of our chemistry was that Charlie and I are both incredibly competitive and absolutely delusional in our high self-regard. We'd spend entire days arguing about who could run faster, who's a better driver, who could throw a football farther, who was more handsome, who was funnier, who was smarter, and, most of all, which one girls liked more. Charlie absolutely hated it when a woman walked past him to flirt with me. He could not figure out why a woman would want to waste time with me if she could have him. He finally begrudgingly concluded, Man, the only reason girls want to get with you is cause you're famous. To which I replied, Nah, Charlie, you got it backward, I'm famous because all the girls want to get with me. We were the yin to each other's yang, we filled in the gaps in each other's life experience. We saw each other's blind spots and augmented each other's deficiencies. Charlie, like Dadio, had sharp streetwise instincts he used to call it his ghetto radar. Charlie just knew when something bad was about to happen. We'd be out somewhere, everything would be going great, and out of nowhere, Charlie would whisper in my ear, let's go. I'd be like, what? Yo, we just go here. And then, more forcibly, get up. Right. Now. I said, let's go. I remember thinking that Charlie Mack was the human equivalent of an overly sensitive smoke alarm that keeps going off at 2 a.m. when there's no fire. And because it's a smoke alarm, you can't ignore it, because one day there may actually be flames. But Charlie Mack was an infallible, perfectly calibrated hood smoke alarm. Every single time, I'd be grumbling in the parking lot as the sound of gunshots rang out from the party we just left. We compensated for each other's weaknesses. Charlie knew the streets, and I understood broader emotional patterns. I was book smart and mainstream friendly. Whereas Charlie's physical appearance was scary and intimidating, I knew how to smile, make people feel safe, and get us in anywhere. Both of us were wildly deficient, but together we made one really capable person. I was Charlie's ticket into rooms into which he would never have been invited. And Charlie was the hammer that came down on anybody who dared to talk shit about me. He emboldened me to defend myself physically. Around this time, the chorus of criticism that I was corny and soft was beginning to rise. I didn't curse, I rapped about my high school experiences, I used a lot of humor. The shit-talking was that I wasn't a real MC or the worst that I wasn't black enough and my music wasn't real hip-hop. Jews punch the motherfucker in the face. Charlie would say. He won't say that shit next time. So, with him having my back, I started doing exactly that, if somebody talked shit, I punched them in the face. And then jumped behind Charlie. H.E.'s the DJ, I'm the rapper was released on March 29th, 1988. Anchored by brand new funk and parents just don't understand, the album would eventually reach number 4 on the Billboard 200, going triple platinum, selling more than 3 million copies. What was so groundbreaking about the record was that Half was a DJ-centered tour de force, a scratch album in which Jeff absolutely massacred the wheels of steel. And the other half was the rapper side, where I was allowed to let the hyper-creative, poetic playfulness of my 19-year-old mind run wild. Then, the unimaginable happened, it was announced that the 31st annual Grammy Awards would be the first to include a rap category. And Parents Just Don't Understand was nominated alongside Salt and Peppa's Push It, going back to Cali by LL Cool J, Cool Modi's Wild Wild West, and Supersonic by JJ Fad. This was the first time I ever saw Jeff cry. I was excited beyond anything I'd ever experienced, but I'm not an accomplishment crier. I wasn't mature enough to ask back then, but I always wanted to know exactly what part of it was so emotional for Jeff. 
Was he thinking about his cancer as a child? Was it his mother and his musical family who had been reaching for this for so many years and he was the one bringing this honor? Was he scared? Did he realize there was no going back that his old life was gone forever and that the bar was now set so high? Charlie Mack, who had recently joined the Nation of Islam, said, This the will a God. Y'all aligned with the will a God. You won. I'm telling you, you won. None of them records gonna beat your record. What God ordains, no man contains. Charlie Mack had been speaking in spiritual rhymes for a few months now. But in pure Charlie Mack form, on February 22, 1989, Bobby McFerrin won record of the year for Don't Worry, Be Happy, album of the year was George Michael's Faith, Tracy Chapman won Best New Artist, and the winner for Best Rap Performance was DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince for Parents Just Don't Understand, making us the first rappers ever to receive a Grammy Award. We ultimately ended up boycotting the actual ceremony because Nairas, the Grammy committee, refused to televise the presentation of the rap award. We felt like that was a slap in the face rap music had outsold the industry that year, we deserved to be there. Russell Simmons and Lear Cohen organized the boycott for Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, along with Saul Tentpa, Ice-T, Public Enemy, Doug E. Fresh and Slick Rick, Stead Sasonic, and many others. And even though we weren't at the Grammys, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince were everywhere else. Life changed forever well, almost. Jeff's mom planned a celebration dinner for Jeff and me after our first American Music Award. We showed up on the block as returning hometown heroes people were coming out of their houses to cheer and applaud and shake our hands. It took us 20 minutes to get into Jeff's mom's house. When we finally made it in she threw her arms around us, gushing pride and joy. Then she handed Jeff five dollars and a shopping list. Jeffrey, I want you to go to the corner and get me some bread, some baking soda, and see if they got them yams that come in a can. But, Mom, Jeff started. But nothing, boy, go get that stuff I told you to get. So, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince had to walk through our adoring fans up to Looney's. They didn't have the yams. Our Usel Simmons was orchestrating the global destruction of all barriers to hip-hop, and me and Jeff were one of his battering rams. We were the clean group, the respectable group for Russell, we were the perfect weapon against all naysayers. We were at the tip of the spear. We launched Yo! MTV Raps, blasting hip-hop into daytime television. When the Four Seasons hotels would not allow rap artists to stay during their tours, Russell convinced them to allow DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, opening the doors for future hip-hop artists to use the chain. Daytime radio was terrified to put rappers on live, so they always forced rappers to pre-record interviews to make sure we didn't say anything crazy. Me and Jeff were among the first wave to be allowed to speak live on the radio during the day. Our shows were getting bigger, the crowds were getting louder. One night in Detroit, at the Joe Louis Arena, I got overexcited and forgot the words to parents just don't understand. This had never happened to me before. My heart dropped into my stomach. There are few things more embarrassing than forgetting the words to the one song that 18,000 people spent their hard-earned money to come and hear. But something miraculous happened, the entire crowd began to sing the lyrics back to me. Every person knew every word. I held the mic out to the crowd, and they finished the song. It took everything I had not to burst into tears. Thousands of people saying my words back to me. I felt loved, protected, and cradled by a crowd of strangers. We were red hot, and unstoppable. At 20 years old, I was a world famous rapper, a Grammy Award winner, and a freshly minted millionaire, pun intended. I would drop the mic, but I need it for the next chapter. F or months, Gigi had been saving up to move to a 16th floor apartment overlooking the main line. It was a beautiful building set up for senior friendly living. Her house on North 54th Street had become a burden for her too many stairs, and generally inconvenient for her advancing years. With my first money, 
I surprised Gigi with the apartment she'd been saving up for. She had thought we were just going to look at it, but then the real estate agent handed her the keys. Lover boy, she said, with a gasp. How'd you do this? Well, Gigi, see, there's this thing called rap music, I said, putting my arms around her. Melanie and I moved into Gigi's old house on North 54th Street. My childhood home was now our new home. I had promised Melanie that I would take care of her, and here I was, providing the first safe home of her short life. I'd won. All of my dreams were blossoming into vivid THX sound and technicolor. I had conquered life. P-A-I-N-H-E was light-skinned, with light eyes. I hated dudes like that. I've always been intimidated by those Christopher Williams looking jokers. Women have always shoulder surfed right past me to gawk over I'll be sure. Or Eldebarge. I had just come home from a two week run in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Portland, and a bunch of the little ones in between. I used to run right off stage, into the car, straight to the airport, to get back to Melanie as quickly as possible. I didn't want to leave any room for my inner hyena to grab the wheel and drunk drive through my life. I was meeting Melanie at her aunt's house, I had the car drop me off there directly from the airport. We were going to walk from her aunt's to our new home. For old time's sake, we were going to pass over Brick High and hit the Sugar Bowl convenience store for a water ice and a soft Philly pretzel, just as we'd done a thousand times before. I always loved how much Melanie missed me. Even weekend gigs when I came home Monday mornings, she acted like I'd been gone for months. She knew how to make a dude feel glad he was home. When I walked in after the Northwest trip, she and her aunt were in the kitchen, cooking, just as they'd been so many times before. Being on the road can be excruciatingly lonely it feels almost like it dehydrates your heart. Her aunt was in her usual dark blue hijab with her glasses way down on the tip of her nose so she could see into the pots. The smell of the food seemed to soften and quench my parched soul. Melanie was in one of her art smocks that doubled as an apron. I always thought that was weird, paint is chemicals that smock did not belong in a kitchen. I looked at Melanie. Everything was the same except something wasn't. Her energy was odd, something was off. Because of my upbringing, it's almost as if I have a shock collar wrapped around my central nervous system. When I perceive that something is askew, that someone's external behavior is out of sync with what is going on in their heart and mind, my body experiences what I can best describe as a gradual rising electrical current. I feel a bzzzzzzz. And then it's like I'm shivering, but I'm not cold. The kitchen was hot, but I had the chills. We sat down. We ate dinner. We talked about the neighbor's dogs. Melanie's aunt had once been to Portland. She didn't like that section of the country too rainy. Melanie was laughing too much. Bzzzzzzz. After dinner we watched Trading Places. I know every word Eddie Murphy says in that movie, he was my idol. Melanie and I had seen it at least ten times, but tonight she kept laughing too hard. Bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
I love you. We were just friends, and then you were gone. I didn't know what you were doing out there. I was missing you. I swear to God, I won't do it again. What? I was right? But no. Why? I had been knocked unconscious in the past. My first day at Overbrick High when I was hit in the head with that lock, there is a blue flash, and then you're in a strange, alternate universe where all of the things you once believed are now up for grabs. Gravity, cause and effect, love, whether or not it rains in Southern California. This is impossible. I've done everything right. I'm winning. I'm the best. I've made a home for us. I've spent months arguing and fighting with the ravenous, slathering pride of ghetto hyenas to keep girls off the buses and out of the hotel rooms. I haven't touched or kissed or barely even glanced at another woman. I come straight home from the airport. We've talked about babies and making a better home than either of us had grown up in. How could you possibly do this to me? How could you do this to us? On the outside, though, I was strangely calm, because none of these thoughts were registering as actual feelings. I wanted to be angry I mean, you're supposed to be pissed when somebody cheats on you, right? But I felt nothing. Melanie was covering her face, crying on the couch. Dan Aykroyd was attacking Eddie Murphy. Eddie was pleading for his life, it was the Duke's. It was the Duke's. And I just stood there, numb. When somebody cheats on you, you have to do something. But what? I didn't feel any emotions, but I was not going to be a coward. Not this time. What do you do when somebody cheats on you? I knew I had to do the storm out thing. But I also knew I had to do something violent to punctuate my departure. I scanned the room for possibilities. Next to the fireplace I noticed one of those forged iron pointy things that you poke the logs with. But what will I do with it? I sure wish I had some emotion to give me a little direction. Nevertheless, I picked it up. The front entry to Melanie's aunt's house was a beautiful wooden atrium holding a hundred glass panels. I stood for a moment, looking at Melanie weeping, deeply uncommitted to my as yet undetermined but absolutely mandatory hissy fit. I calmly carried the iron pointy thing toward the front door and began to break the windows out one by one. I guess I smashed about 12, maybe 15, before I felt I had sufficiently done my performative duty as a cuckolded 20-year-old. I slammed the pointy thing to the ground it scared the hell out of me, it clanged a lot louder than I thought it would. Shit what if Melanie's aunt heard that? I thought. I should probably go. Melanie and I were supposed to be walking home together, but instead I decided to walk to Woodcrest alone. Mom Mom had finally had enough. She had kicked Dottio out while I was on tour, this time for good. Dottio had moved into the apartments above the Akrak office. I knew Mom Mom would be home alone. It was about a 22-minute walk. I could not believe I had just broken all those windows. I couldn't locate where it had come from within me. It seemed so strange to me to break things because I thought I should, not because I was at all emotionally impelled to do so. This discordance was hilarious to me. Out of nowhere I began to chuckle, replaying the scene in my mind. I was thinking, Will, you are an absolute lunatic. And that made me laugh even more. This whole shit was hysterical. By the time I got to Woodcrest, Mom Mom was sitting on the front step. Clearly, she had spoken to Melanie's aunt, she never sat on the front step. Her eyes were brimming, she was hoping to God that I was okay, but she was bracing for the storm. She knew her boy. When I saw her eyes, I felt how completely in tune she was to my pain. It wasn't just mine anymore, it was ours and like a blast of dynamite demolishing the dam holding back the river of my agony, I collapsed on the sidewalk, ten feet from where the tour bus had borne me away from her. Mom Mom runs down, throwing her arms around me, as I wail. My childhood home mutely staring down upon my anguish. I had believed that leaving Woodcrest would mean I'd never have to feel this way again. 
How could she do this, mommy? Why did God let this happen? Mom mom said nothing, she just held me. I was an adult now, my problems were beyond her fixing. I could feel her tears falling on the back of my neck. She picked me up and took me home. H heartbreak should be considered a disease it induces a debilitating state akin to mental illness. The pain I was suffering was so intense I would have preferred to have been stabbed or beaten or have a tooth pulled without Novocaine. My girlfriend had cheated on me, which was proof to my shattered mind that I was a piece of shit I reasoned that she wouldn't have cheated if I had been good enough. I had failed another woman. I desperately needed relief. But as there's no pill for heartbreak, I resorted to the homeopathic remedies of shopping and rampant sexual intercourse. Shopping, that next week, I flew ten of my friends from Philly to Atlanta and I closed down the Gucci store. Whatever y'all want, I got it, I said, slinging my Amex down on the counter. I had an Amex card now. And unlike my heart, it was unbreakable. Money was flowing like the Nile. We had just launched the DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince rap hotline. 1-900-909-JEFF was the first ever 900 number. Premium rate telephone numbers were a revolutionary new way to connect with fans, and, basically, the predecessor to modern social media. Fans called our number, and we would leave daily messages a few minutes long about where we were and what we were doing. It cost $2 for the first minute, and 45 cents for each additional minute. At the height of the popularity of the line, we were getting 5,000 calls a day. Do the math. My Amex card wasn't just unbreakable, it was invincible. Rampant sexual intercourse, up until this point in my life, I had only had sex with one woman other than Melanie. But over the next few months, I went full ghetto hyena. I had sex with so many women, and it was so constitutionally disagreeable to the core of my being, that I developed a psychosomatic reaction to having an orgasm, it would literally make me gag and sometimes even vomit. In every case, though, I had hoped to God that this beautiful stranger would be the one the woman who would love me, who would heal me, who would make this pain go away. But invariably there I was, retching, and wretched. And the look in the eyes of the woman even further deepened my agony. I was doing the very thing I hated. Dio for hurting women. I was miserable, so I purchased my first house, a mansion facing Marion Park, in the rich neighborhood across city line. I had seen it in my dreams bleached white hardwood floors, two story ceilings in the living room, and a jacuzzi in the master bedroom, not in the bathroom in the bedroom. The first thing I bought for the place before beds, couches, towels, or even silverware was a pool table. I eventually got a bed. It was the first time I'd ever slept in a king-sized. Me and Harry had slept in the same bed most of our childhood. Me and Charlie Mack had room together on the road. I realized that first night on Marion Road that I had never really slept alone. I didn't like it. My heart was bleeding I was dying in love with Melanie Parker. I wanted her back. My mind at the time still correlated performance with love. The entire basis for my self-esteem was foundationally dependent upon whether my woman was happy. My self-image was inexorably bound up in women's opinion and approval of me. I figured that since I was not receiving the love I so deeply craved, it had to be because of a deficiency in me as the lead character. If I had performed the role of boyfriend better, she wouldn't have cheated. As you can probably imagine, that bought me a first-class ticket on a bullet train to agony. Melanie worked at the merry-go-round in the gallery, a mall in downtown Philly. I had it all planned, a grand, romantic gesture of forgiveness. I was going to walk in, our eyes would meet, I would forgive her, and she would fall into my arms, gushing tears of gratitude and remorse. Then I would tell her that I wanted to marry her and that no wife of mine has to work in a shit-ass merry-go-round. We would give her boss the middle finger, hop into my brand new Benz 300 CE, and I would take her to her new Marion Road mansion, the one with the jacuzzi in the bedroom, not the bathroom. Parking at the gallery was rough, 
so Charlie Mack drove us. That way he could sit in the car and keep it parked right in front of the store so I could Romeo flex into the merry-go-round, sweep her off her feet, and carry her over the threshold to the awaiting bends. Beep beep. Charlie hit the horn. Yo, man, you know I don't have no license. So, if the cops come, I am a just dip, Charlie said. This joker was messing up my whole production. Why don't you just get your goddamn license? I yelled. You know I got a gun charge. I can't get it yet. Jews go get Melanie, man, hurry up before 5 to 0 roll up. I ran into the store. It was a quiet day, the place was mostly empty. Melanie was behind the counter, folding Jordache jeans. She didn't see me I got to watch her for a few, I would have watched her longer, but Charlie didn't have a license. In those few moments, I knew I didn't want to be without her. Whatever was empty inside of me felt full when I saw her. All that ached was soothed, all that was thirsty was quenched. She looked up, and our eyes met. There was a brief but undeniable moment of clarity. Melanie absolutely loved me. And I loved her. Bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
his chin barely reaching my chest. He just stood there. I knew that meant I had to bend down so he could talk to me. I lowered myself like a silverback in the wild surrendering to the Alpha. Buck whispered in my ear, just cause you a star, don't mean I won't make you see some. The logic of his analogy wasn't entirely flawless, but the underlying point was well taken. I never joked about Buck again. Marion Road was now party central. At any given time, there would be twenty or more people in the house, blasting music, shooting pool, thousands of dollars worth of Philly cheese steaks littering the kitchen. I probably could have just bought overbrick pizza for how much money I spent there. There were boxing matches in the backyard, and a basketball court in the living room. And non-stop gambling on everything. Needless to say, this environment was not conducive to Melanie's artistic aspirations. Willard, can you turn the music down a little bit, she'd say. My bad, babe, give me about an hour. I'm scoolin' these fools. I felt like my forgiveness had been such a gigantic gesture of love that she should be grateful to even be here. The truth was, I never actually forgave her. Teehee weekends were when it really turned up. It was not uncommon for $150,000 to change hands between Friday night and Sunday morning. My boy Bam was the best pool shooter, he was always taking our money on the table. But one Saturday night, I caught fire on the pool table, I could not miss full-length bank shots, combinations, eight ball spot shots, perfect English dropping the cue ball into sweet positions, everything went exactly where I was calling it. Buck found himself on the short, sorry. I mean unfortunate end of a $30,000 losing streak. He sent one of his boys to go get more cash. But Buck lived in Southwest that was at least a 45-minute round trip so he threw his car keys on the table. The room erupted oh shit. My heart jumped for a minute, but I ain't no bitch. I threw the keys to my brand new seafoam green Benz 300 right next to the keys to his custom black convertible BMW 325i. Rack em up, I said. I ran four balls off the brake, high balls. The room was church silent. Bucky sized up his first shot easy too, ball in the corner, left himself great position on the seven in the side. A little too aggressive, though, left himself out of position in the corner, he had to bank the four back under. But Buck ain't no bitch, either. He ran the entire rack, and all I could do was watch helplessly, chalking my custom pool cue for a shot I may never get to take. Bucky lined up the eight ball. Bank shot, cross corner. The eight was sailing in slow motion toward the corner pocket. The gravity of the eight ball was preparing to snatch my car keys with it into the abyss. A roar brewing as the ball approached, a woo but No. The eight ball clips the titta just enough to rattle it around and stand up in the jaws of the pocket. The room explodes. I've got new life. But I gotta do some real shootin'. I've still got three balls to pocket before I get a shot at the eight ball duck in the corner and if I miss one, Bucky's back on the table, and he's not gonna miss. My first ball is the dreaded straight shot, full length of the table. I don't play with it I line it up, dead center of the pocket, two to go. Second shot would be in the side pocket, but my third shot's in the corner, meaning I gotta put some English on the cue ball, draws, meaning hitting it low to cause it to spin backward. If not, it could roll straight into the corner pocket, scratching and ensuring Bucky's victory. My concept around shooting pool was to never ponder the shots too long. Line it up, hit it. Line up the next one, hit it. No time to let my mind punish me with doubt or indecision. Charlie Mack always used to say, scared money can't make no money. That would become a motto for my life. But that night, it was an ice-cold mindset that made me unbeatable. And just like the rest of the night, I couldn't miss. All Bucky could do was watch helplessly, chalking his pool cue, for a shot he would never get to take. I ran the table, tapped in the eight ball, and respectfully picked up both sets of car keys. Bucky was furious, 
but he was way too gangsta to let you see it. He stormed out of the house, slinging the door open, only to realize he might need to call a cab. I ran out behind him. Yo, Buck, I said. Not now, nigga, gimme a minute, he said, with all the gangsta that a dude preparing to hitchhike could muster. Buck, here. I held out his car keys. I'm not talking your damn car. What, he said, confused. You're my boy. I'm not keeping your car, I said. You serious, he said, looking at me like I had four heads. Buck, I'm not gonna invite you to my house and then take your car. I'm an asshole, but not that much. I shoved the keys into his hand. I didn't recognize it in this moment, but I would see clearly later, that this was a gesture of humanity that was non-existent in the environment in which Bucky was forced to survive. He noticed it, and he became visibly emotional. Why you trippin', Buck? It's not that serious, I said. He gathered himself, shook the keys in his hand, and said, cause I would have kept your car. I turned to go back into the house. Bucky chirped his car open, and yelled to me, hey. If anybody ever fuck with you, they got a problem with me. And he meant it. At the time, I didn't correlate my cravings and my generally erratic behavior with the wounded state of my heart. When I bought a candy apple red eye ros and dipped the rims in a matching candy apple, I wasn't perceiving that as a medicinal reflex. Nor did I connect the purchase of my custom Suburban with four 18-inch woofers taking up the entire back half to my feelings of inadequacy, loss, and betrayal. I just thought it was fun that when I was picking up someone, I wouldn't have to call ahead I would just put my volume on about seven, and they knew who was coming. I was spun out and I was acting out. I bought my first motorcycle, a blue Suzuki Katana 600. I didn't even know how to ride, and I crashed it in the first week. But I was ballin' way too hard to drive a banged up bike, so I bought a new one, the red one. JL crashed that bike, the damage wasn't too bad, just some scuffs on the side panels. But then, not to be outdone by JL, Harry totaled it. I figured this was a sign maybe bikes weren't for me so I bought a turquoise T-top Corvette. I lined all of my cars and motorcycles up in front of the house and invited Dadio over so he could see how well I was doing. Dadio pulled up in his two-tone blue Chevy work van. He always believed that vehicles should have a utility. I stood proudly out front as he got out of the van. We hugged. I just got the vet last week, I said. These are all yours, he asked, looking disdainfully at my fresh new fleet. Yup. I said proudly. My arms were respectfully by my side, but in my mind my b-boy stance was unswole. Boy, why you need three cars, he said. You only got one ass. This wasn't exactly the response I'd been hoping for. But his mathematical opinion fell on deaf ears, because the 1988 Grammy for Best Rap Performance went to DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince for Parents Just Don't Understand. M. Elanie and I weren't having sex anymore. Something had been broken. We both wanted nothing more than for it to be fixed, but we were barely 20 years old. Our romantic dreams were far too fragile to survive the brutality of our immaturity. I started going to Los Angeles a lot. It was the first time I realized the vibrational power of a city. As soon as the plane would touch down at Lax, something inside of me would awaken and align. Something I was, and something L.A. was, clicked into harmonious agreement. The energy of the town excited me. I needed less sleep, I was always refreshed, my skin looked better, I was eating right, I wanted to work out. I was inspired. I have since realized the critical importance of environment. Choosing the city you live in is as important as choosing your life partner. And I had just met Tanya Moore. She embodied the sunshine and the possibilities that defined L.A., the quintessential West Coast rider. Fine as hell, sophisticated, but sharp in the streets. She knew what neighborhoods to walk in, and which ones to drive around. 
She knew that my red Phillies baseball cap should come off at lax, and I could put it back on as soon as the flight home crossed the Mississippi. Pooh Richardson was the star shooting guard for UCLA, which, next to millionaire rapper, was about as good a gig as a 22-year-old black kid could get. He was born and raised in the heart of South Philly, and he walked around UCLA like the damn mayor. Pooh was everything on that campus, and when his Philly homeboys showed up, he laid it out. Pooh was dating Tanya's cousin Tigia, who basically managed Pooh's life. She handled his food, his press, she would clear the room when he needed to get ready for practice. It was a relationship mindset that to me at the time seemed so mature. Pooh was the star, but he literally wouldn't know where his sneakers were. His one job was to play basketball while Tigia did everything else. When I saw them together I knew I wanted that. They were partners in the Pooh Richardson going to the NBA business. He ended up playing 10 years in the league. Me and Charlie Mack rolled up to Pauley Pavilion where UCLA was playing Stanford. We saw Pooh in the locker after the game. Philly is in the building, he screamed. The first thing a Philly dude notices when one of his homeboys moves to another city is how bad his fade haircut looks. Philly is known for the fade we invented it, and we do it right. Yo, man, your barber is slippin', I said obligatorily. I probably would have said it no matter what it looked like. When you're from Philly, and somebody gets their hair cut in another city, you have to say it looks bad. Yeah, we haven't figured that one out here yet, Pooh joked, touching the sides of his fade. If you're from Philly, you have to say something like that, too. He introduced me to Tigia and her cousin Tanya. I must have been too obvious in my appreciation of Tanya's beauty, because Pooh grabbed a towel and held it up to my mouth. Yo, man, you slobberin, I don't want you to slip and fall on your spit. I shoved the towel away, slightly embarrassed but keeping my smile and my charm on blaze. Man, man, go ahead with that shit. I laughed, turning to introduce myself to Tanya. There must be something in the water in Philly, Tanya said. They're growing y'all real nice out there. Who jumped in? Yo, Tanya, I'm telling you, this nigga is the next one. You better lock him up now cause he's going from here to the moon. I was thinking, lock me up. Shit, she had me at real nice. JL was the only one of my friends who'd ever seen me cry. On a train ride to New York one day, I'd broken down when I told him the story about Melanie, sobbing into his chest. JL is not an emotional guy, and I was not holding back. He would later tell me that in that moment, he devoted his life to me. JL said he knew he needed to protect me. JL pulled me up one day. Hey, man, you gettin' into a lot of fights lately. What's up? There was a couple of months stretch when I literally got into a fight every weekend. I'm not sure if it was knowing that Bucky had my back, or that Charlie Mack was standing right beside me or if it was the only elixir that could satiate my raging heart but I started sucker punching everybody and anybody who even looked at me sideways. I was angry, because even a Grammy, millions of dollars, and a candy apple red IROC didn't even begin to fill the holes inside of me. The thing about money, sex, and success is that when you don't have them, you can justify your misery shit, if I had money, sex, and success, I'd feel great. However misguided that may be, it psychologically permeates as hope. But once you are rich, famous, successful, and you're still insecure and unhappy the terrifying thought begins to lurk, maybe the problem is me. Of course, I dismissed that foolishness quickly. I just needed more money, more women, more Grammys. Tehe Record Company was ready for our follow-up album to He's the DJ. Three million records sold, first ever Grammy Award in rap, but this new album was gonna smash all of that. JL wanted us to do preliminary recording in Jeff's mom's house. Whereas I had bought cars, clothes, and houses, Jeff had converted the basement into a Star Trek, level home recording studio. JL thought it would be the most cost-effective approach to get our ideas down in southwest Philly, 
and then go for the final recording back to London. Jive owned the recording studios there, and we got preferred rates. But me and Jeff had other ideas. Jeff had heard of a famous recording studio in the Bahamas Compass Point Studios in Nassau. He suggested we record there. After all, Mick Jagger, Grace Jones, David Bowie, Sada, even Iron Maiden had all recorded at Compass Point. Since we were big time now and had a multi-platinum album of our own, it only seemed fitting that we record where multi-platinum artists record. Jeff couldn't wait to dig into the studio and check out the tech. I couldn't wait to check out the two massive casinos that had just been built in Nassau. We were hyped. JL protested, but he was outvoted 2 to 1. No filibusters in Jeff's mom's basement. That next Friday, we were off to the Bahamas all ten of us. I had never been to the Bahamas. It was 90 degrees and sunny when we landed. Our luggage and equipment got held up in customs, so we hit the beach. Rum punch and chicken fingers until the sun set, then we hit the casino till sunrise. And that's how the recording of our new album went for about the first week or so. We had scheduled six weeks to record, and we had locked out the studio, meaning, we had to pay whether we used it or not. Our first full session in the studio day nine in the Bahamas was more like a night in a club, Jeff was DJing while we all sat around with girls and food and drinks. Occasionally, I would get up on the mic, more performing for the crowd than trying to innovate or create new music. After that first session, JL pulled Jeff and me aside and warned us that we were burning through $10,000 a day, and that if we didn't start recording, he was pulling the plug. Me and Jeff were kind of offended. You don't understand the creative process, I said. This environment, the people, all the stuff we're doing is our inspiration. Yeah, Jay, Jeff chimed in, don't block the flow. Just let us do what we do, and you do what you do, I said. JL nodded, very slowly, as if to say, okay, I see how it is. One month, and a couple of hundred thousand dollars into our process, and the red recording light hadn't come on once we had still not completed a single song. I guess JL was justified in doing what he did. At the time, I couldn't believe he did it. I would never have done it to him. But I guess he felt that the times were desperate, so he employed equally desperate measures. It was a Friday night. About 20 of us were lounging around in the studio. Our LA squad had flown in to help with the creative process. I was about five rum punches in, and I had graduated beyond chicken fingers into jerk chicken, black beans, and rice. I guess it was hot in there because I had my shirt off. It doesn't matter how old you get there are some childhood images that will always bring a chill down your spine or make your stomach drop. I was holding court in the middle of Compass Point Studio A when the door started to open. I first caught a glimpse of JL pushing the door wider, and then... Dadio. The room froze. Those who knew, knew the other guests guessed. Dadio calmly took in the scene. His eldest son, topless. Rum punch and jerk chicken stinking up the room. Bahamian bikinis bouncing and misbehaving. And we were at work. To Dadio, this was Sodom and Gomorrah. He paused. Then, everybody get the fuck out, he said. I need to talk to Will and Jeff. We landed at Philadelphia International Airport at 2.38 p.m. I slept the entire flight. I don't remember takeoff, or landing. I'm not sure it's an actual medical condition, but I'm pretty certain I was in an embarrassment coma. James J. L. Lassiter had dropped a dime on me and tattled to my daddy. The whole shit was a debacle. But within two weeks, our third album, and in this corner, was at least finished. In the tragic aftermath of his Grim Reaper, like appearance at Compass Point, Dadio had made an aggressive, but nonetheless convincing, assessment of our behavior. You boys are fucking off an opportunity that most people can't even dream about. You got a major corporation financing your project, and you got girls and shit sitting around in the studio. Keep your dick out them people's money. 
You can bullshit, just don't bullshit while you on the clock. This shit ain't gonna last forever. While Dottio's Bahamian intervention had saved us from further immediate catastrophe, the first domino had already been tipped. With no budget left, we quickly cobbled together the best tracks we could come up with. But there was no real vision or continuity to the album. Me and Jeff were unfocused, and out of sync. And in this corner was doomed from the start. Destruction T he downward spiral had begun. And in this corner came out Halloween 1989 and achieved full crickets. In a desperate attempt to salvage something from the mess, we sprinted out onto the road to perform and promote and do anything we could to inject some life into the album, but it was dead on arrival. The winter of 1989 was a progressively abominable shit show. It began with Ready Rock. He had recorded a bunch of songs, none of which ended up making the album. He was one of the best beatboxers there ever was, and in our live shows he definitely got some of the biggest cheers. But hip-hop was changing beatboxers were becoming less central to the art form. He felt disrespected and disregarded. As a result, our disagreements became division, division became open conflict, until Reddy and I were damn near at war. See late started showing up late for everything, flights, sound checks, meetings. He'd sleep all day and be in a stank mood all night. Throughout the tour, our arguments escalated in both frequency and intensity. In his mind, he and Jeff were the main attractions, and they were carrying me. Me and Jeff are the only talented ones around here, the rest of y'all just riding our coattails, Clay shouted, during one of our innumerable collisions. It all came to a head one night in Kansas City. During our show, we would introduce Ready Rock at about the halfway point. He'd come out, and me and him had a 15-minute routine before he'd go off and me and Jeff would close the show. He had a grand entrance I'd be rapping, and at the end of my verse I'd shout, Ready Roxy, give Jeff a hand. I'd dramatically point to the side, the spotlight would come on, and he would do a helicopter sound effect with his mouth that would shock the hell out of the crowd. He could open and close his hand around the microphone, shifting the frequency to give the illusion of the helicopter passing from left to right. The crowd loved it. But this night, I shouted, I pointed, the spotlight panned, but no ready rock. Jeff just kept the beat going, and after another four bars, I said it again, ready Roxy. Give Jeff a hand. Clay didn't come out. Without missing a beat, Jeff launched into the next track and we continued the show as if nothing had happened. It is unbelievably painful for me as I write this chapter because these conflicts and misunderstandings had such simple solutions, yet our immaturity demanded that we had to suffer excruciating consequences in order to learn the most basic lessons of human relating. It's so obvious to me today how hurtful it must have been for Clay to go from being my best friend and my creative right hand to someone who was increasingly being excluded and alienated and asked by photographers to step out of pictures. And what's worse, we never even talked about it. But that night, we were two young rams. After our set, I went raging backstage. Where the fuck is Clay? I screamed. I blast into the dressing room, and there he is, sitting in my chair, sunglasses on, calmly eating a bag of Doritos. Man, where the hell were you at? Clay didn't respond he just sat there crunching. Why you ain't come out? I roared. He continued crunching. After a few seconds, he swallowed and said, I just didn't feel like performing tonight. I was shocked and incensed, but I said nothing. We stared at each other. Each second our new reality was hardening. In my heart, he had about ten seconds before the concrete set. Nine, eight, seven, six. Crunch. Crunch. Stare. Five, four, three. Crunch. Stare. Two. Aight, cool, I said, as I turned and walked out. I never called for Ready Rock again. Teehee next night, Jeff and I altered the set. Clayt was standing there at the side of the stage. 
the part in the show came where he'd usually be called out, we skipped over it and went to the next song. Same thing in Dallas, same thing in Houston, same thing in San Antonio. We stopped speaking. Clayt started riding on other groups' buses, and when he rode with us, he stayed in his bunk. One day, near the end of the tour, we heard a strange sound coming from his bunk. Click clack, snap. Click clack, snap. Charlie Mack's bunk was directly above Clayt's. Charlie, irritated by the sound, leaned out of his bunk to investigate. He opened the curtain to Clayt's bunk. Yo, man, what the hell is you doing? Charlie screamed, jumping down from his bunk. Clayt was cleaning a semi-automatic Uzi submachine gun. He didn't have any bullets, but he was practicing chambering around and pulling the trigger. Click clack, snap. Click clack, snap. Gone was my high school friend the easy laugh, the excitement of battling on the street corners around Overbrook, the joy of stumbling onto a new sound. Left in his place was a person I no longer recognized. In my entire life, few things have been more painful than watching someone I love self-destruct. Dottio used to say, you can stop a homicide, but you can't stop no suicide. Reddy Rock was making good money doing what he loved. He was performing in front of thousands of people and seeing the world. He had a crew of friends who would die for him. Yet, there was some blind or broken part of him that, for some reason, couldn't perceive the full scope of the opportunity stretching out before him. He had made his way into the abundant part of the Great River only to scratch and claw his way back to the desert. Throughout my career, I have seen this pattern over and over again. I have given hundreds of jobs to people, many of whom have ultimately cracked and crumbled under the pressure of the possibilities. As the great Negro poet Charlie Mack once put it, pressure busts pipes, homie. We all have to contend with the natural processes of destruction. Everything is impermanent your body's going to get old, your best friend is going to graduate and move to another city, that tree you used to climb in front of Stacy Brooks's house is going to crash down in a storm. Your parents are going to die. Everything changes, it rises, and it falls. Nothing and no one is immune to the entropy of the universe. That is why self-destruction is such a terrible crime. It's hard enough as it is. When we got back to Philly, Reddy Rock grabbed his bag, I grabbed mine. There were no goodbyes, no eye contact. I watched him walk off down Woodcrest, he never looked back even once. Because of my childhood experiences with Dottio's destructive streak, I've always had very low tolerance when I recognize similar energies within people around me. The funny thing is, it's always crystal clear to me when I perceive them in others, but I'm blind as a bat to those same energies within myself. The first, and only real, single from the third album was called, I Think I Can Beat Mike Tyson. I've often used Mike's invincibility at the time as a metaphor to explain the distinction between natural destruction and self-destruction. Imagine you were to secure a title fight against Mike Tyson in his prime. Fearful for your life, you hire legendary trainer Freddie Roach, you commit to the perfect diet, the perfect training regimen, you do everything within your power to prepare yourself to face Iron Mike. You step into the ring in impeccable physical and mental condition, and Mike destroys you within 15 seconds. You did everything you could possibly have done, and still lost. You're just not as good a fighter as Mike Tyson. That is a bearable loss, that is what I'm calling natural destruction. But if you were lollygagging during training, didn't really eat right, and let your boy Pookie train you and then Mike knocks you out in 15 seconds now you have to face an unbearable loss. You have to live the rest of your life not knowing what might have happened had you done your best. In the back of your mind, forever, you will know that you didn't only lose to Mike Tyson, you lost to yourself. The fight wasn't you versus Mike it was you and Mike versus you. That's how I feel about and in this corner. The music business is fickle some records work, some don't. Sometimes there's a track that you think is going to be a hit, and no one feels it, 
then the one you weren't even thinking about becomes a monster. That's the natural way, the inevitable ebb and flow of the universe. But if you piss away $300,000 on rum punch and chicken fingers, and your father has to fly in and drag your ass home, and then you throw together a bunch of tracks in your best friend's mother's basement, you're manifesting an unfair fight. It's two against one, it's you and the universe versus you. It's respectable to lose to the universe. It's a tragedy to lose to yourself. AAND in this corner flopped, hard. We were coming off 3 million records sold triple platinum sales and the first ever Grammy Award in rap. Expectations and investments were very high. And we crashed and burned. We knew the album was a swing and a miss. But it didn't become real until we went out on tour again. The crowds were thinner. People weren't as hyped to see us. They were no longer singing my lyrics back to me. And our performance fees were cut by almost 70%. We made it okay in our minds by thinking of it as promotion. In retrospect, I could feel the impending onslaught, but I couldn't figure out what to do, or how to stop it. And I certainly didn't think it was going to get as bad as it did. By this time, Melanie and I were living in that dreadful demilitarized zone between the bliss-filled old days of romance and hopeful possibilities, and the fast-approaching inescapable days of resentment, rage, and destruction. Trapped in that awful quiet lovelessness where two people coexist in the same house but rarely in the same room. Where the air is filled with apathetic words, not yet dipping into vitriol but purposely devoid of kindness. That unique hell where you know it's done but it's not over yet. Emmy and Charlie were spending more and more time in L.A. The second I would land, Tanya would be at the airport with a rental car, keys to the hotel, dinner reservations, whatever I needed. L.A. girls always seemed organized and business-minded. They were always fly, and always pursuing some kind of dream or opportunity. There was something about the culture of Los Angeles that bred an upwardly mobile mentality. Tanya never asked me for anything, this was just how she got down. She made me feel at home. We knew each other for almost a year but we never even kissed. I could faintly sense that Tanya and Los Angeles were about to play some significant role in my survival. I guess I was kind of unconsciously locating the lighthouse and the lifeboat for the storm that was darkening on the horizon. Gigi's words were ringing in my mind, Jews remember, lover boy, be nice to everybody you pass on your way up, cause you just might have to pass them again on your way down. Becoming famous is about as much fun as the material world has to offer. Being famous, bit of a mixed bag, but fading famous sucks ass. I could read the writing on the wall some of it was in my own handwriting. I saw the crowd's silent faces at the end of our sets. I noticed how business calls that once got returned in two hours were now taking two weeks or didn't get returned at all. And most alarmingly, my Amex wasn't quite breaking, but it was bending like a motherfucker. And in the middle of all of that distortion, the subtle compass within me kept pointing west. Charlie could feel it, too. He took it upon himself to push and to dig and to cajole everything within his power to excavate and manifest a more positive future. Charlie was shameless. He would introduce me to absolutely anybody within shouting distance, even people he didn't know. Little Richard. Little Richard, he bellowed across the Soul Train Awards. Then, excitedly to me, Will, that's Little Richard, he with Diana Ross. Come on get the picture. Damn, Charlie, they talkin'. Jews leave them alone, I said, wildly embarrassed. You want the picture, or you don't want the picture. You gotta be seen with people. Then he dragged me over to Little Richard and Diana Ross, and basically listed my entire discography for them. I know y'all heard it he got a Grammy. Y'all, like, in the Grammy club together. Charlie Mack is bigger than most human beings, and certainly bigger than most people's security. So, once he decided he wanted something like a picture, or a conversation things tended to gravitate out of his way. L.A. illuminated the limits to my fame. I was huge in the world of hip-hop, but in Hollywood, 
I was nobody. At a Lakers game, I was nobody. At the Roxbury, I was extra nobody. When Eddie walked in, he shut it down. It was humbling, it was embarrassing, and it was frustrating. I remember one night in LA, the DC Go Go Band EU, Experience Unlimited, was playing at the Palladium. They had opened for us in 1988 and 89 and we had developed a friendship with the lead singer, Sugar Bear, and the rest of the group. Spike Lee had just put their song to butt in his movie school days, and EU was now the hottest group in the country. Charlie and I planned to take a break from the emotional battery of being nobodies in Hollywood and just for a night retreat to the world of music. We headed to the Palladium and rolled up to the backstage entrance. Hordes of groupies and fans all pleading with the bouncers about how their cousin left a ticket, but the will call is closed the usual crap that makes security guards just look over their heads and ignore them. Charlie does his usual thing, stepping up to the front and speaking for me. Hey, my man, I'm here with the Fresh Prince. The who, the security guard says, looking past Charlie to me. I always hate these kinds of moments where I have to stand there and try to look recognizable. Because now, everybody is staring at you to see if you're famous enough to pass the bouncer test. You're out on a limb. And when you just flopped an album, it's a thin and rickety branch. The Fresh Prince, man. The Fresh Prince. You know, Jazzy Jeff and M, Charlie clarified. The bouncer looked at me with the universal glare that signifies I'm foraging through my visual Rolodex and nope, you're not in there. If y'all ain't got tickets, y'all gonna need to move to the back. Just then, the door opens, and Sugar Bear from EU sticks his head out and looks around. I made a rookie error I overcommitted. But when I saw a familiar face, he felt like one of those round life preservers being thrown to me as I was drowning in a deepening sea of insignificance and irrelevance. Before I could stop myself, I blurt out, Hey! Sugar Bear! Sugar Bear looks right at me. There's a moment of recognition. I point at the security guard as if to say yo, man, tell this dude to move and let us in. Sugar Bear pauses, looks at the security guard, Subtly shakes his head. He scans the crowd to see if the person he was really looking for is out there. They're not, so he turns and goes back inside. I turned and gracefully made the ex, famous person's walk of shame. Inside, I was raging, but as is my habitual emotional way, on the outside, I was totally calm. I didn't know where I was going, but block after block, I just walked. Charlie said nothing but kept step right behind me. We walked for miles in silence. What the hell was happening? Since we came off tour, Jeff had retreated to his mom's basement. His reaction to the looming winter of our careers was to hibernate he had turned down a chance to do a show in Africa and a tour in Australia. I was pissed that he was hiding it seemed like cowardice on his part. And it activated my most violent trigger, I'd been fighting my entire life to not be a coward. I believed that we needed to go head to head with the obstacles that were building against us, but I couldn't do it without him. I felt like he'd betrayed me. JL was complaining about me and Charlie being in LA so much. Y'all are wasting your time you need to come home so we can get back into the studio, writing and recording, JL said. Melanie and I were barely speaking. And here I was, in the empty streets of Hollywood, on a Thursday night, anonymous and adrift. Charlie Mack was like an old-time boxing trainer whose fighter had just got his whole ass handed to him in the previous round. If we weren't on Hollywood Boulevard, he definitely would have been pouring ice water down my shorts. I was hurt bad. But I knew I had another round in me. We approached the crosswalk, the red hand beckoning directly to me. Halt. Stop. Breathe. Think. My rage settled. Contemplation churned into passion, then a decision. That will never, ever, happen again, I said. I promise you that. Charlie didn't open his mouth, he just nodded his head. He knew something profound was happening inside of me. 
and he was down for whatever. The light changed, and we walked on. I didn't pay my taxes. It's not like I forgot, it was more like. I just didn't pay my taxes. In January 1990, Uncle Sam decided that I'd had enough fun and he wanted his. I owed the IRS taxes on around $3 million of income. I think somewhere above a million dollars, Uncle Sam shifts from ornery to irritable and everything north of about $2.3 million makes him aggressive and cantankerous. So, as was my general approach to problem solving during this period of my life, I dumped it on J.L. Wade, you didn't pay any taxes, he said. He was on the phone, but I could tell that he sat down. To this day, J.L. is the most frugal, sensible, and fiscally responsible person I've ever met. He doesn't spend any money on anything ever. No fancy cars, no jewelry, no trips, no jacuzzi in his bedroom nor his bathroom. While Jeff and I were spending our spoils wildly, J.L. never moved from his childhood bedroom. He was taking this very phone call in his mother's kitchen. Not, nah, nothing, I said. Like, nothing nothing. Yeah. No I mean, yeah. Nah. Y'all are stupid as shit, J.L. said. Y'all understand this is a big problem, right? I didn't notice in the moment, but J.L. kept saying y'all, denoting a plurality of stupidity. I would later discover that Jeff hadn't paid his taxes, either. And to make matters worse, J.L. had been lax on billing us for his commissions, so not only had we spent all of our money, we had spent J.L.'s cut, too. We were all broke. J.L. hired a tax attorney, for me and Jeff he paid his taxes, scheduled a meeting, showed them the notices from the IRS. He also engaged an accounting firm, Gelfand, Rennert and Feldman, to oversee our hypothetical future earnings. First went all the cars. Then my motorcycles. Stereo systems are very expensive when they go in they're worth damn near nothing when they come out. Then the excruciating decision was made IRS, attorney and accountants unanimously agreed, I would have to sell the lower Marion house, pool table included. I was rich and famous, minus the rich, and minus the famous. I was worse than broke I was in the hole. The walls were tumbling down. I had enjoyed Sodom and Gomorrah way more than I was enjoying Jericho. T here's a strange thing that happens when someone falls, your demise somehow proves to everyone you've ever disagreed with that they were right, and you were wrong. They develop a smugness and seem to get a brutal enjoyment out of the fact that God is finally punishing you. People tend to have a schizophrenic relationship with winners if you're down too long, you become an underdog and they feel impelled to root for you. But if you're ever unfortunate enough to be up too long, you better get a helmet. One night, in the middle of what would become the final racks of eight ball ever played on my first pool table on Marion Road, Melanie came down the stairs. She was looking fine as hell, wearing a royal blue miniskirt and matching leather jacket. She had on three-inch heels she never rocked heels. Big bamboo earrings I had bought her that she'd never worn before. Her makeup was perfect, no glasses tonight, eyeliner. Her cleavage would certainly not have been approved of in her aunt's house. So why did she think it would be approved of in mine? She pranced through the gauntlet of me, Charlie, Bam, Bucky, and a couple more of my JBM boys. Everybody looked but nobody made a sound. The JBM had a code they were always respectful of each other's women. Where you going? I asked, as I missed an easy 11 ball in the side. Out, Melanie said. All I could think was, why the fuck is she doing this right now? Is she really going to challenge me in a room full of Philly's hardest gangsters and killers? In the middle of the IRS seizing all my shit? Wearing clothes that I paid for? Making me miss an easy ass 11 ball in the side? Bzzzzzzzzzzzz. Where's out? I said, as Charlie lined up his next shot, about to take a hundred dollars that I didn't have. I don't know. She shrugged. Out. I think you're not going out, I said, 
drawing a line in the sand and trying to save face. You should go ahead back upstairs. Whatever, Willard, she said, as she moved toward the door. If you walk out that door, I promise you it's gonna be a bad look. We stared at each other. Each second our new reality was hardening. In my heart, she had about ten seconds to go back upstairs before the concrete set. Nine, eight, seven, six. Charlie sunk a high ball in the side. Five, four, three. Eyeliner. Cleavage. Bamboo hoops. Two. I'll see you later, Willard. Melanie walked out. A an hour later, I was in the house alone. Melanie and I were no longer in that loveless demilitarized zone. The bliss-filled old days were finally giving way to the days of resentment, rage, and destruction. Melanie's taxi pulled up around 2 a.m. I was waiting for her out front. I had collected everything I'd ever bought for her clothes, shoes, bags. Anything that would burn. I had drenched everything in lighter fluid. Our eyes met. I struck the match. Whoosh. A.S. I write this chapter, I have never seen or spoken to Melanie again. I've reached out on multiple occasions over the years with no response. She was the victim of one of the lowest points in my life. Yes, we were young, yes, we hurt each other, but she did not deserve how I treated her, she did not deserve how it ended. See Harley Mack was in love with Mimi Brown, one of the most iconic DJs in Philadelphia history. She was the seductive, sultry voice of our childhood imaginings, and seeing her in person did not disappoint. Charlie missed no opportunity to get me to the station. I kept finding myself doing interviews at WDAS-FM, on Mimi's show. It was like Charlie was now my publicist, and he had one contact in the music industry, Mimi Brown. This was my third interview with Mimi in the span of two weeks. She had launched a show called Rap Digest I was running out of things to talk about, but Charlie felt we weren't quite hitting the critical points we needed. Mimi, oh my god, oh my god I'm telling you. The people just love hearing y'all talk. Y'all lighten them phones up. We gotta keep doing this. Charlie gushed romantically. Mimi had been an early supporter and advocate for DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. She was one of the first to ever play our records, and she was one of the Philly pioneers pushing hip-hop onto daytime radio. And she loved the hometown boy. It was always the same with Mimi, whether we were hot or cold, big record or no record she wanted her studio to feel like home. We were always welcome. It was a win-win when Mimi got a great interview, I felt respected and appreciated, and Charlie got to shoot his shot. The studio was a cozy little soundproof room with glass on two sides. People within the station could walk by and look in on the interviews and talent who showed up. Mimi and I were always a particularly appealing attraction we laughed and joked a lot, and we played an interesting mix of hip-hop and R&B that was revolutionary at the time. It felt like a live show as we interacted with the staffers behind the glass. One afternoon, I started rapping live, which doesn't sound like much today, but I promise you it was jaw-dropping back then this was one of the first times it had ever happened on Philadelphia radio. You have to understand, this was a time when many radio stations' promotional taglines were all music no rap. Behind the glass, the crowd grew and started going crazy some because they realized they were witnessing the birth of a new era, and others because they probably thought they were witnessing the death of Mimi Brown's career. As I play and perform to the glass, I'm stopped in my tracks as I realize. I'm face to face, eye to eye, with Dana Goodman. He had heard me on the radio and decided to show up. If the motherfucker you're looking for is Will, he's in the house. You're welcome to come in and kill him now. Dana stares, emotionless, and whispers into the ear of the dude with him. The dude nods and moves toward the door of the studio. I keep performing, my eyes steady on Dana. I try to signal to Charlie, but he's staring at Mimi. The door opens. The man enters the booth and stands beside Charlie. 
Charlie's ghetto radar is once again on point. Charlie slides almost imperceptibly into striking distance he's no longer looking at Mimi. I finish rapping, the crowd applauds, Mimi and I sit down to continue our interview. You need to thank Dana Goodman, the man yells out. Yo, my man, they're live on the radio. Cool out, Charlie whispers. You need to thank Dana Goodman, the man yells out, louder this time. Homie, we can do whatever you want to do outside. But you gon' be quiet in here, Charlie said, more forcefully. The dude put his palm on Charlie's chest to shove him away. Tell your man to thank Dana G before his lips could form the first O of Goodman, Charlie cracked him with a straight right hand dead on the button, and dude's head explodes like a watermelon. It was as if Charlie had shot his fist out of a cannon. The guy crashed into the metal rack holding the eight track cassettes, scattering them all over the room. Dude was down and out. Charlie grabs me, and Mimi and runs us toward the back parking lot. Charlie, Dana's out there, I shout. Just keep going, keep going, Charlie says. We exit into the back parking lot as station security grabs Mimi. Charlie throws me into the car, and we're out. I had never been in a jail cell before. It was way too small, and there were way too many of us in there. Frankly, I felt like we all deserved better. Apparently, there is an arcane law in Pennsylvania the master-slash-slave clause that states that if one person commits a crime under the control or direct influence of a master, then the master is legally liable for the actions of the submissive-slash-slave party. The man's legal team argued that because of my dominant relationship with Charlie, I was culpable for his actions. Charlie was never even arrested, even though it was he who had broken the man's left eye socket and irreparably damaged his cornea. Clearly, the man's legal team thought that I was a deep pocket and logically reasoned that I was a bigger financial target than Charlie. The joke was on them. I didn't have a dime to my name. But as I sat in that jail cell, Facing aggravated assault, criminal conspiracy, simple assault, and reckless endangerment charges for a punch I hadn't even thrown, I finally understood a term I'd heard many times before, rock. Bottom. I was literally lying on a cold stone floor. Everything I had, everything I built, the woman I loved, was gone. I was broken. And as I lay there in the fetal position, trying to figure out how the fuck did I get here, I made the horrific error of clinging to the universal, rock-bottom axiom of hope, well, I guess it can't get any worse than this. H. Hopefully none of you will ever need this information, but if you can at all avoid it, do not get arrested on a Friday. I was released on Monday morning, no one gets let out on a weekend. I went straight to Woodcrest to see Mom Mom, I hadn't spoken to her, I was sure she'd be a mess. The crazy thing is, when I saw the police car in front of Woodcrest, it never even crossed my mind that they were there because of me. One of my childhood friends, Lil Reggie, had recently become a cop. He had the kind of heart that everybody wanted in a police officer. Reggie was the man in the neighborhood, Mom Mom loved him, and everybody respected him. When I walked in, Mom Mom and Reggie were sitting in the kitchen. She hugged me. B Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z. Damn it, my shock collar. What the hell has Reggie been saying to my mom? I gave Reggie a pound, we hugged and caught up a bit. He had heard about everything that had happened with Charlie and my weekend in jail. I want you to know that I got your back, Reggie said. B Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z. Uh huh, for sure, Reggie, I know that, I replied. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I need you to keep it 100 with me. B Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z. Do you happen to know? He listed four names. All four were guys from the JBM. Guys I had been gambling with and not taking cars from for the past two years. My heart jumped into my throat. I felt like I had to swallow it back into my chest. I might know M. Why? Willard, do you know them, or not? Mom Mom blurted, cutting through all my bullshit. 
Look, Reggie said, I'm here to help. You know what they do, right? What they're into. I nodded. Will, you got a good thing going with your music. Those guys are bad. They're being watched by the FBI. And the feds are about to shut it all down. Word is that they have photos of them coming in and out of your house, of you driving their cars, and traveling with them. Do you know that it's a crime to give and take money from them? I couldn't breathe. It really doesn't look good, Reggie said. You need to get away from them. Right now. The FBI is coming with the thunder and sending a big rap star to prison would just be a cherry on top. Mom Mom's face was stone, but the volcano inside was churning and boiling. This was exactly why I needed to take my dumb ass to college. You didn't get involved in any of the stuff they did, right? I can't help you if you don't tell me the truth you clean, right? Reggie said. Yeah, yeah, totally. We just played pool and partied, I said. All right, but you need to lay low for a minute. Maybe get out of Philly. It's about to get ugly. I called Tanya and asked if I could come stay with her for a little while. She was ecstatic. The problem was, I couldn't afford the plane ticket. My Amex was finally broken literally. I decided that I needed to take a chance. I called Bucky. We met in Fairmount Park, near the plateau. I pulled up behind his black 325i and jumped into the passenger seat. I loved his car he had the Alpine CD changer that held 12 CDs, when I got mine, I could only afford the 6 changer. I told him everything that the feds were circling, that I was moving to LA, and that he should leave, too. He kinda chuckled, laid his head back on the headrest like he knew that he had been living on a runaway roller coaster that had always been predestined to come to a fiery end. He closed his eyes, we sat in silence. It was about 6 p.m. There was a flight to L.A. in two hours. I hated that I had to interrupt him to ask him for money. Hey, Buck, I need to hold something to get out to L.A., I said quietly. What ya gon' do in L.A.? Buck asked, not even opening his eyes. I don't know for sure. I just love it out there. There's a chick out there I'm feeling. Our album crashed, so. I might try acting. You could definitely do that acting shit, he said, smiling as he seemed to replay some of my funniest highlights. You the dumbest nigga I know for sure. He was laughing out loud now. How much you need? Buck asked. Nothing heavy. I need to get out there, get an apartment, be able to move around a little bit. Aight, I got 10 G's here. You need more than that we can run to the spot. Nah, that's straight. Buck had a secret compartment under the driver's seat floor mat. He grabbed the 10 G's, reached into the back seat, shook a tasty cake butterscotch crimpet out of a brown paper bag, and stuffed the cash into it. He handed it to me, but when I grabbed it, he wouldn't let it go. He looked straight into my eyes. You know you're not better than me, right, he said. Of course, Buck, I know that, I said, somewhat confused. I'm just like you. We the same. He got quiet for a moment, then said, I could do all that shit you do. I just fucked up. We just born in different spots. Yeah, that's real, I said. Bucky let the money go. Just do right, man, he said. No doubt, Buck. I am a get this back to you quick. He chuckled again, as if somehow, he knew he would never need it. When I get my feet, you should roll out to LA. Bucky chuckled the same knowing chuckle. Sure, man, I'll do that. He gave me a pound. I made my flight. Three days later, Bucky was dead. A-L-C-H-E-M-Y-T Anya had secured us an apartment in Marina del Rey. She knew somebody who knew somebody, and it was only 1,300 bucks a month. I didn't really care. There were $7,700 left in Bucky's brown paper bag. 
he had been shot in the head in front of his house. It was a setup. Reggie explained this was the classic playbook when the feds close in, everybody turns on each other. I didn't leave the apartment for weeks. Part fear, part exhaustion I was in shock. My entire life had collapsed. I guess my depressed and debilitated state elicited a divine act of mercy from Tanya, we never really talked about it, but we both knew she was my woman now. And she set upon the harrowing task of breathing my spirit back to life. We spent every moment together. Tanya coddled, comforted, and cared for me, she cried with me, and helped me mourn. We would talk for hours, I met her mother and her grandmother. She didn't cook, but she could order the hell out of some takeout. We fell in love. I could have hidden in that apartment with her forever. But then, after a few weeks, as if some cosmic egg timer had sounded at a frequency just beyond my hearing, but well within her sonic range this phase was over. Tanya shifted gears like a drunk trucker crossing the Texas panhandle. Okay, she said, that's enough. It's time to get back to life. What? I said, as the cold water of reality flooded our Marina del Rey love nest. You've gotta do something, she said. You took a break that's good. You needed it. But that brown paper bag is almost empty. What are you gonna do? What do you mean, what am I gonna do? I said, getting agitated. Which part of what are you going to do, is hard for you to understand. Tanya replied, with equal and opposite agitation. You have to get out. Get out and do what? Go where? I shouted. I don't fucking know, she clapped back. But whatever it is, you ain't gonna find it in this kitchen. Just go. I don't know go back to Arsenio. The Arsenio Hall show was the biggest talk show in America at the time. Everybody who was anybody appeared on Arsenio. He was like the Panama Canal of celebrity all roads to public success ran through the Arsenio Hall show. Charlie had been dragging me there for months. We gotta stay where it's happening, he said. Arsenio and I had become kinda halfway friends during the height of me and Jeff's Grammy run. We had appeared on the show and Arsenio had taken a liking to me. Go to Arsenio and do what? I yelled. Arsenio likes you. Just go to the show and hang out. Meet people. You sound crazy as shit, I said. So, you want me to go to the Arsenio Hall show and stand around like a dickhead so I could might meet somebody? Yes, exactly so you could might meet somebody. I'm not doing this with you. That's dumb, and I'm not in the mood for this shit. I arrived at the Arsenio Hall show about 4.30 p.m. 5 o'clock was showtime. That half hour before was prime mingle time. Charlie Mack was in his world. Yo, man, Eddie here tonight? I am a go grab him, Charlie said. Eddie Murphy was appearing on the show that night. He knew who I was he kept calling me Young Prince. Arsenio was a lightning rod for magical moments. Many people would argue that Bill Clinton playing the sax on the show solidified his presidential victory. Michael Jackson, Mariah Carey, Miles Davis, Madonna Magic Johnson even appeared on Arsenio 24 hours after his HIV announcement. As I stood backstage, I felt the electrical currents of possibility pulsing and receding it was like a lush forest with ripe fruit on every tree. The show was a flashpoint, a nexus, a cosmic garden of opportunity that Arsenio knowingly and purposefully cultivated. If Tanya had just said that, I wouldn't have been a dickhead. Charlie and I went almost every day for months. His routine was that he would accost famous strangers and drag them against their will to come meet me. I met everybody politicians, actors, musicians, athletes, executives. Benny Medina was an A&R exec at Warner Brothers Records. I didn't know who he was, but apparently, Charlie thought he was important enough to be accosted and dragged. Benny had worked under Barry Gordy at Motown. At Warner Brothers, he now oversaw some of their biggest hip-hop acts, including Queen Latifah, De La Soul, 
and Big Daddy Kane. He was about 5 foot 7, stocky build, brown skin, curly hair, rockin' hot gear you could tell he thought he was fly. He knew how to work a room. He was an unapologetic, straight down the middle mover and shaker. Benny could smile when it was time to smile which was most of the time but he could get real gully if somebody impeded the movement or desires of one of his artists. Hey, Will this is Benny Medina. Benny, this the fresh prince you know that, though, Charlie Mack said. Benny knew all about my music. We talked for a bit about hip hop and the impact technology was having on the music industry, and the future of video on demand, and then out of nowhere, he asked, do you know how to act? Act. You mean to perform actions in order to elicit joy and passion from those around me? You mean to warp my perceptions of myself as a means to hide myself? You mean to believe deeply in stories that don't exist, that never existed, that could never exist? You mean to play the role of who everyone around me wants me to be, rather than who I actually am? As a general rule, if someone asks me if I can do something, the answer is always yes. Yeah, definitely, for sure, I can definitely act, yes, sir, I said, employing too many words. Yes. I figured you could, Benny said. I can see it in your music videos. I might have something to talk to you about. Let's keep in touch. I didn't think anything of it. In Philly, we always clown dudes like this. Being Hollywood is like the worst thing you can be it's the definition of insincerity. Moments like that happen all the time in LA. I moved on and forgot about it. Yet, that quick three minute Hollywood chat would turn out to be one of the most important conversations of my life. B. Any Medina is the real fresh prince of Bel Air. Benny was an orphan who grew up with extended family in the projects of East Los Angeles. Then, as a teenager, he was taken in by a friend's wealthy Jewish family who lived in Beverly Hills. Benny was Afro-Latino and found himself at Beverly Hills High School. He was a good kid, yet the chasm between the two worlds created a constant culture clash that was a combustible source of tension and humor. By the time I met him at the Arsenio Hall show, Benny Medina was plotting a move into television. Tehe Universe is not logical, it's magical. A major aspect of the pain and mental anguish we experience as humans is that our minds seek, and often demand, logic and order from an illogical universe. Our minds desperately want shit to add up, but the rules of logic do not apply to the laws of possibility. The universe functions under the laws of magic. I was in Detroit a few weeks after my Hollywood chat. JL had booked a couple of shows to help us to dig out of our collective financial hole. The Joe Louis Arena was always crazy we loved playing there. We were back down to one hotel room. Strangely enough, it was soothing for all of us to be together again in such cramped quarters. Jeff had headphones on making beats, Omer was watching TV, Charlie was cutting his toenails. I hated when he did that. I felt like goddamn Braveheart in there like I needed a Scottish battle shield and to paint my face blue. None of us knew that this was the last time we'd ever tour together. JL burst into the room. Yo, get up. Quincy Jones wants to talk to you. Quincy Jones? To me? For what? What I do? I was still shell-shocked from the last chapter. Did you meet somebody named Benny Medina? JL asked. Yeah, the Warner Brothers dude. Well, he works with Quincy, JL whispered, almost knocking my front teeth out jamming the phone into my face. I told you, Charlie said. Hello, Mr. Jones, how are you? I said with the tone and diction that would have made Mom Mom, Dadio, and Gigi proud. I'm great, sir, thank you. Detroit. Yup. Joe Lewis. We perform tomorrow night. Yo, man, what he sayin'? We can't hear him. Charlie Mack said, pausing his fusillade. SHHH. JL hissed. Yo, don't shush me, Jay, I'm a grown ass man. 
Will you shut your grown ass up? Jeff chimed in. Um, sure, I said. When is it? Oh, wow, okay. Um, well, yes, definitely. I don't perform till tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. I will see you then. I put the phone down slowly, the whole squad staring at me, like I just took a pregnancy test. Quincy Jones wants me to come to his birthday party, I said to myself as much as to the squad. To perform. Omer asked. Nah. Him and this dude Benny Medina have an idea for a TV show they wanna pitch. When do you need to be there? JL asked. Tonight. Q. Uinsa Jones's party fell on the same night as the Soul Train Music Awards. He was being honored with the Heritage Award for Career Achievement and the birthday slash after party was being held at his Bel Air mansion. JL got me on a 3 p.m. out of Detroit and I landed in LA just as the sun was going down. It all felt surreal, a little head spinny. I had flown by myself, which was uncommon and uncomfortable, and now, as traffic backed up on the 405, I had a moment to contemplate, why the hell am I driving to Quincy Jones's house? It was about 30 minutes from Lax to Quincy's. When I pulled up, there was valet parking. Quincy Jones had valet parking at his house 20 red-coated valet parkers in his driveway. It looked like the British were coming. It was right up there with Sue Ellen Ewing's fucking breakfast horse. By the time I arrived, the party was on full bang. Everybody was there, from Steven Spielberg to Tevin Campbell, Stevie Wonder and Lionel Richie were arriving as I pulled up. That was too much for me, I knew I didn't belong here. And right before my fragile self-image convinced me to bounce, I saw Benny Medina, a familiar face a life preserver as I was drowning in yet another sea of insignificance and irrelevance, etc. Hey man, Benny called out, you made it? I wanted to say, yeah, man, fuck you, I'm out. But instead, I said, yo, man, don't take that jacket off trust me, you won't see it again. Benny was wearing one of those Versace, Picasso looking jackets. He laughed, tugged on the lapel, and said, if tonight goes well, it's yours. Let's go meet Quincy. I just thought that was too fast. Couldn't I at least get a drink first? Or one of them little toast points with some cheese or some salmon or something. Damn. Your Jews gone rush me to meet Quincy Jones from the driveway. I need to stretch, you're gone have me pull in a hammy out here. The center of the party was in Quincy's massive living room two-story vaulted ceilings, and a couple hundred of Hollywood's heaviest hitters and A-list rainmakers. Quincy was holding court, a sorcerer in a designer jacket with a piano keyboard embroidered down the left side. Benny and I enter, and before Benny can make the introduction, Quincy and I catch eyes. Hey. Quincy yells out. The Fresh Prince is here, y'all. That would have been embarrassing if anybody had actually given a shit. But it didn't matter to me, because the most important person gave a shit. Quincy is like that he loves and enjoys people. Every person is a unique work of art to him. He doesn't play celebrity favorites, he genuinely finds something interesting about everybody. Quincy bounds across the room, arms open, and grips Benny and I in a single embrace. Welcome man, welcome, Quincy gushes. Thank you, Mr. Jones. This house is amazing. I gush right back. Oh, you like this? This is Bel Air. Benny trying to set the show in Beverly Hills. I keep telling him, man, fuck Beverly Hills. Bel Air make Beverly Hills look like public housing. Did Benny tell you about the show? Well, a little bit. I mean, uh, he told me he grew up in Watts. And he moved in with a rich family where you from? Quincy said. Philly, I said with the requisite swag and pride that Philadelphians use to make sure you know that our city is better than yours. Ah, man, I love Philly. He leaned in and whispered, 
I had some things happen in Philly we not even gone talk about. Then he laughed and nodded, signifying some unspeakable wilder days in his youth. Okay, that's it, it's perfect, your character's from Philly. Will from Philly. Then he goes to Bel Air. He was back at full volume now. Quincy had clearly been tasting a little bit, I figured it was his house, and his birthday, and his achievement award, so if he wanted to be drunk and loud, then goddamn it, Quincy, you be drunk and loud. Brandon. Brandon. Quincy hollered across the room at a forty-something-year-old white guy. The guy seemed low-key, understated attire, but everybody was fully attentive while he was talking. Well, until Quincy interrupted him, shouting his name, startling him and pretty much everyone else. Quincy waves him over. Brandon. It's Philly to Bel Air now. Brandon Tartikoff was the head of NBC, and the most powerful decision maker at the network. He decided which shows were financed and aired on the station. He approached with his second in command, Warren Littlefield, Littlefield would ultimately end up running the network. Y'all come meet the Fresh Prince. Quincy said. We all shook hands. They looked at me in a way that I missed back then, but I understand today it's the look that executives have when tens of hours of conversations have gone on about you behind your back. And they still haven't quite decided if they're going to roll the dice on you. Okay, yeah, can I have everybody's attention? Quincy bellowed. We gone have an audition. Clear the furniture out the living room. I was looking around, thinking, oh, wow an audition at a party, that's dope. Quincy is the man. I wonder who's auditioning? Get Will a copy of that Morris Day script, the one we were working on, Quincy said. At first slowly, and then painfully, I remember that my name was Will. My father had given it to me. And since he wasn't here, and nobody else was moving. Reality took hold. Quincy Jones was asking me to do an impromptu audition in front of some of the biggest icons, present and past, in all of entertainment, not to mention the top brass at the National Broadcasting Company, home to The Cosby Show, Cheers, The Golden Girls, L.A. Law and Seinfeld. My knees buckled. Couches were being moved and someone handed me a script. I grabbed Quincy's arm, probably a little harder than was respectful. Quincy, no, wait, no, I can't do this now, I whispered in his ear. Quincy looked at me with an unflinching, tipsy joy. Y'all keep setting up, he ordered the room. I'm gone talk to Will in the library. Q. Uinsa Jones understands magic. He sees the universe as an infinite playground of magical possibilities. He recognizes miraculous potential in every moment and everything and everyone around him. His superpower is that he has learned to present himself to the universe as a lightning rod, placing himself perfectly to capture and conduct the ever-present, ever-recurring magical flashes of brilliance surrounding us all. Quincy Jones is an intuitive, artistic storm chaser. He can sense the subtle flickerings of the impossible preparing to strike. He prepared himself for decades, studying music, playing thousands of gigs, learning from masters, surrounding himself with the most accomplished performers and artists. Quincy used to say, things are always impossible, right up until they're not. He learned how to prepare the environment and invited the energy in, he saw himself as the conductor, both in the electrical sense and the musical definition. His main job was to keep all of us from missing the miracle, from blocking the subtle magical opportunity that was obviously, to him, presenting itself. Gigi had a similar idea she would say, don't block your blessings. Even though these possibilities are abundantly and perpetually flowing around us, we can miss them, or even worse, block or repel them. Gigi used to love to tell the Bible story of the death of Lazarus. Lazarus was a great friend of Jesus, so when he fell ill and died, Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, were devastated. They had sent word to Jesus, begging him to hurry. Jesus had to walk two hot dusty days from the other side of the river Jordan. 
he was already exhausted he'd worked all week, preaching during the Feast of Dedication. When he arrived in Bethany, Lazarus had already been dead and buried for four days. When Jesus approached the tomb, he saw that the rock was still in place at the mouth of the cave, as was the burial tradition of the time. Jesus wept, perturbed, and said and I paraphrase. So, let me get this straight. Y'all made me walk fifteen frickin' furlongs excuse my language to hot dag on Bethany, where Pharisees and Sadducees is runnin' around here like roaches just waiting for a chance to take a pop at me, to perform the miracle of raising your patriarch from the dead, restoring your family to blessed wholeness and light, and y'all can't even move the rock from in front of the tomb. If I'm gonna raise this boy from the dead, the least y'all lazy jokers could do is move the Dagon rock. This was an idea that Quincy understood fully. Magic demands awareness, faith you have to believe in magic, preparation, move the rock we must identify and eradicate the poisonous resistances and impediments within ourselves, then, surrender, stay out of the way and trust the magic to do what it does. Quincy helped people get their rocks out of the way of the blessed light that is always trying to shine in. The universe wants you to have the miracle. Move the damn rock. Quincy was moving furniture, but he was trying to get all of us me, Brandon, Benny, even himself to move our rocks out of the way. Qyuance's library was dark mahogany. High back leather armchairs, I don't know if the rugs were from Persia, but they looked expensive. I don't remember much else about the room because I was blinded by the glare from the gaggle of Grammy, Tony, Emmy, and Academy Awards scattered around the place like butter knives in a Swiss cottage hotel bathroom. A framed poster of Oprah Winfrey's The Color Purple hovered over my left shoulder, Michael Jackson's Thriller sales plaque loomed over my right 48,000,000 sold. I could have just written the word million but I wanted you to feel how many zeros that is. I felt Michael looking at me on his toes in the classic Billy Jean pose, as if he were saying, so what are you gonna do, Will? I take a seat. Quincy stands in front of me. He's been here before. This is what he does. He moves rocks for a living. Talk to me, Philly, he says. What you need? Quincy, I'm... I'm not prepared to do an audition, I stammered. I didn't know, when you called, you know, what we were doing and all that. It's only a couple of scenes. I got some people out there who will read with you. You just gotta be you and have fun. Quincy, I cannot do an audition in the middle of a party. I need to prepare, I just need some time, to work on it. Okay, I hear that how much time you need. Quincy asked. I mean, just, uh, give me a week, and I'll find an acting coach, and I can study it, so I can do it, not just read it. Quincy considered my words. Okay, so you need a week. Yes, a week, a week is perfect. Okay, so you know what's gonna happen in a week. Quincy asked. But before I could answer, he said, Brandon Tartikoff is going to have an emergency on one of his shows and he's gonna have to fly to Kansas to fire somebody. Then he's gonna have to reschedule for the following week. Oh, cool, cool. Two weeks would be even better, I said, missing the subtleties of Quincy's point. Right, two weeks. Then Warren Littlefield is gonna have something at his kid's elementary school that he forgot was on the schedule he can't get out of because his wife's going to tear him a new one if he doesn't show up. And he's gonna have to reschedule for two weeks after that. Right, I said, slowly starting to glean his point. So, a month. Quincy leaned in, eyes crystal clear, suddenly sharp, totally sober. But right now, Everybody that needs to say yes to this show is sitting out there in that living room waiting for you. And you are about to make a decision that will affect the rest of your life. I took it in. I looked at Michael, then to Oprah. They looked right back at me. We know baby, it's hard. What chug on do, Philly? Fuck it, I said. Give me ten minutes. 
I don't remember much about the audition it's kind of a blurry collage of jokes, laughs, punch lines, and ad libs Quincy, then Brandon, Benny 20 magical minutes culminating in an ovation from the entire room. The applause, like a defibrillator, jolted my awareness back into the moment, re-establishing my mental timeline. Quincy stands up, aggressively pointing at Brandon Tartikoff. Did you like it? Quincy screamed. Yes, yes, I liked it, Q, Brandon said calmly, keeping his cards close to his vest. Don't give me that shit. You know what I'm talking about? Did you like it? Brandon knew exactly what Quincy was talking about. Yes, Quincy, I liked it, Brandon said firmly, and confidently. Yes. Quincy shouted, clapping his hands and turning to point at a different man, who turned out to be Brandon Tartikoff's chief legal counsel, who had been strategically invited to Quincy's party. You, he said, to the man who was in mid mini pizza bite. You're Brandon's lawyer. You heard what he just said. Draw me up a deal memo right now. I was thinking, damn, Quincy Jones got power. That's not even his lawyer. He making other people's lawyers do work, on Wednesday, at nine at night, at a party. The lawyer looked at Brandon, Brandon attempted to chime in. Quincy, listen no paralysis through analysis. Quincy shouted. Draw me up a deal memo right now. Brandon relents and nods to his legal counsel, who steps up, exits to the NBC limousine where he would spend the next two hours drafting a deal memo. Next, Quincy snaps around with the same aggressive index finger slash magic wand, only this time it's pointing at me. You got a lawyer. Well, no, no, not at the party I stuttered. Quincy spins again, now in full magical conductor mode. Wand pointing at a new victim. Get me Ken Hertz on the phone. That's Philly's new lawyer. As a side note, Ken Hertz was in the maternity ward at Cedars Sinai where his second daughter had just been born. But when you're a young lawyer, with a brand new family, and you get a 10 p.m. call from Quincy Jones, and the maternity ward at Cedars Sinai is 20 minutes from Quincy's house, you arrive in 18 minutes. I met Ken Hertz that night he represented me in the negotiations with NBC, and for every other deal since. He's still my lawyer to this day. He named his daughter Corey. I mentioned that Quincy had been drinking, right? There was no reason for him to be saying everything as loudly as he was saying it it wasn't that big a room. We could all hear him perfectly well. But, maybe he knew he wasn't speaking to our ears he was bellowing to reach the caverns behind the rocks, simultaneously conjuring and welcoming the magic of the universe. I guess he wanted to be loud enough to make sure that the miracle didn't miss the house. No paralysis through analysis. Quincy shouted again and again. He would intone this mantra nearly 50 times over the next two hours. It was the answer to every question, it was the response to ever stutter, it was the solution to every legal problem. Until, two hours later, when Quincy Jones, Brandon Tartikoff, Benny Medina, and Will Smith entered into an agreement to shoot a pilot for a television show tentatively titled The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. And now, this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. Six weeks earlier, I had been curled up in a ball in Marina del Rey, lost, depressed, and terrified. And just like that, the universe had given me a new family, James Avery. Janet Hubert Witten. Alfonso Ribeiro. Tatiana Alley. Karen Parsons. Joseph Marcel. James Avery, Uncle Philosophy 6 foot 4, 320 pounds. Shakespearean actor. New father figure. Demanded the highest commitment to my craft. You're not a rapper here you're an actor. So, act like it. I spent the greater part of the next six years seeking his approval. Janet Hubert Witten, the first Aunt Viv. Triple threat singer, dancer, actress. 
elite on all levels. Starred in Cats on Broadway. The conscience of the show. Fought tirelessly to maintain a dignified portrayal of African Americans on The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. In hindsight, the show suffered after she left. Alfonso Ribeiro, Carlton Banks. Acting since nine years old. The Tap Dance Kid. Broadway, television, film. Unflinching ally, great friend he rode with me no matter what. Gave me the best advice ever, hey, man, I hear the producers discussing names for your character. Take it from me, give your character your name, Will Smith. Because people are going to call you that for the rest of your life. Carlton. Tatiana Ali, Ashley Banks. 11 years old and still had more experience than me. Singer, dancer, actress, Sesame Street, Star Search, Eddie Murphy's Raw, performing with Samuel L. Jackson. Would spend her teenage years on set ultimately educating herself to Harvard University. One of the most disciplined people I've ever met. Karen Parsons, Hillary Banks. The least experienced next to me. Beat out a slew of Hollywood big hitters to win her role. Was smart enough to tell me hell no when I tried to explain that we were not really cousins so it would be fine if we dated. I swear it won't mess up our working relationship. She knew better than that good call, KP. Joseph Marcel, Jeffrey Butler. Royal Shakespeare Company, Globe Theater, Othello, King Lear, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Solly Two Kings in August Wilson's Gem of the Ocean. Producers of Fresh Prince were torn between him and another actor. My first Fresh Prince flex was I want Joseph Marcel. In Hollywood terms, the conception, casting, writing, deal making, set design, shooting, editing, and airing of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air hovered on the border of the miraculous. Shows don't happen this fast. Everything went perfectly. Quincy's party had been on March 14, 1990, the writing, auditions, final casting, and deal making was completed by the end of April. Staffing, set design, wardrobe, etc., were completed, and we were shooting the pilot in mid-May. The show was edited and tested in late July, we promoted in August, and it aired on September 10, 1990. There was no paralysis through analysis. And I loved it. I found my thing. The world of acting unleashed all the artistic impulses within me. It was the first external canvas that felt big enough to hold the landscapes of my imagination. My musical expression always felt narrow and constrained by the limits of my skills and talents. Making music felt like living in a great neighborhood, whereas acting felt like being set free in an infinite universe. As an actor, I would get to be anybody, go anywhere, and do anything, world champion boxer, fighter pilot, tennis coach, galaxy defender, cop, lawyer, businessman, doctor, lover, preacher, genie I would even get to be a fish. Acting encompasses all the things that I am storyteller, performer, comedian, musician, teacher. Don't get me wrong, I really like making music, but I love acting. M.O.M. Mom was an avid reader. Her every free moment was spent between the pages of everything from Edgar Allan Poe to Agatha Christie to Toni Morrison to Stephen King to Maya Angelou to Sherlock Holmes and Sidney Poitier's autobiography. She would often talk about a book that spoke to her soul or she just couldn't put it down. It had penetrated her and transformed her way of seeing or being, but I had never experienced that. I was well into my twenties before I actually read an entire book cover to cover. The Alchemist, a novel by Brazilian author Paulo Coelho, was my first literary love affair. The book spoke to my soul, and I just couldn't put it down. It penetrated me and transformed my way of seeing and being. The Alchemist is the journey of a young Andalusian shepherd boy named Santiago. He has a recurring dream of a hidden treasure buried at the pyramids of Giza, in Egypt. The dream beckons him so profoundly that he sells his entire flock, gives up his life in southern Spain, and sets out to follow the whispers of his heart to Egypt, 
to pursue what Paulo Coelho describes as his personal legend, his divine calling, what I think of as his destiny, his dharma. But Santiago's journey is not an easy one. I cheered and feared and jeered every step of the way as he was loved and hated and helped and hindered along his perilous path. I felt like I was Santiago, my hidden treasure buried somewhere under the Hollywood sign. The Alchemist is probably the most influential book I've ever read. It empowered my dreamer spirit and validated my suffering. If Santiago could suffer, survive, and claim his treasure, then so could I. An alchemist is a spiritual chemist, a master of transmutation. The great feat of an alchemist is that they can do the impossible, they can turn lead into gold. This concept erupted in my mind the ability to take anything that life gives you and turn it into gold. Gigi could take the last half glass of Welch's grape juice and mix it with the last swallow of Dole pineapple juice, throw in some Kool-Aid packets, dice up some lemon and the other half of the orange she was just eating, and swirl it all together with a blast of Canada dry ginger ale freeze it and hand you the best damn popsicle you've ever had in your life. This was after you'd looked in the refrigerator five separate times and each time told her that there was nothing in there. Quincy Jones is an alchemist, and he had set my mind on fire, I had never met anybody like him. I wanted to be an alchemist, too. I wanted to be able to transform anything and everything that life gave me into gold. The universe had given me a second chance, and I swore to God that I would not need a third. Ada P. Tat I O N J L refused to come to L.A. The whole TV thing was disconcerting to him it was all happening too fast, it was out of left field and outside his expertise. I'd been to Quincy Jones's birthday party, and the next day I had a TV show. There was no plan, no strategy, and we were all still trying to recover from the catastrophic financial and creative collapse of DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And now, I wanted JL to pack up everything and move to Los Angeles because Quincy Jones is an alchemist. Tanya and I had gotten a new apartment in Burbank, walking distance to NBC. My full focus was clearly now on television. And making this pilot episode hot. Dude. You need to be in the studio doing what you do, JL implored. Jay, I'm telling you, our future is out here. Our music shit is dead. Well, that's not true. But whatever you need me for, I can do it from Philly. Jay, you don't understand you have to be out here. It's not scheduled meetings and structured like that. People make decisions at birthday parties and in fucking diners. JL knows me as well as anybody on this earth. He saw me, and sometimes still sees me, as an impetuous artist who needs to be protected from myself. He saw himself as the final checkpoint of sanity keeping Will from driving us all off a cliff. JL couldn't stomach the uncertainty and the tornado of change that he felt was endangering our recovery. Omer moved immediately, Charlie came out every week. Just as a piece of fresh Prince of Bel Air trivia, in the opening credits of the show, when I get in one little fight and my mom got scared, the person I get into one little fight with, the guy who is spinning me around and precipitating my departure for California? That's Charlie Mack. I figured if I could convince Jeff to come to LA, then JL would see that all of us were out here. So, without even telling Jeff, I went to the producers at NBC and pitched them a character for him to play on the show. I told them he was my music partner and that he was a bigger star in the hip-hop community than I was our fans would go crazy if they saw Jeff on the show. Obviously, they were worried about adding yet another Philly homeboy who had zero acting experience into a primetime sitcom. But this became my second Fresh Prince flex. They reluctantly agreed to test him in six episodes or a quarter of the first season. Excited, I hit Jeff to tell him the news. Ah, man, thanks, he said, but I'm not really feeling that TV acting stuff that's you. I just wanna do music. I was dumbstruck. Jeff. You can do music in LA they got studios out here like we got liquor stores and churches. Plus, they're offering you 10 grand per episode. That's easy money, man. Silence. Jeff. 
I'm just not feeling it, man. That LA shit's not me. I'm a Philly boy. I wanted to scream, what the fuck are you talking about? You are broke. You are back in your mom's basement. You don't have a choice. But instead, I just said, okay. I'll holla at you later. See Hank can be scary, but it's utterly unavoidable. In fact, impermanence is the only thing you can truly rely on. If you are unwilling or unable to pivot and adapt to the incessant, fluctuating tides of life, you will not enjoy being here. Sometimes, people try to play the cards that they wish they had, instead of playing the hand they've been dealt. The capacity to adjust and improvise is arguably the single most critical human ability. There's a Buddhist parable that has guided me through many a perilous transition, a man is standing on the banks of a treacherous, raging river. It's rainy season if he can't get to the other side, he's done. He quickly builds a raft and uses it to safely cross the river. In joyous relief, he high-fives himself, lifts the raft, and heads toward the forest. But as he attempts to make his way through the dense tree cover, the raft is banging and knocking into trees and becoming entangled in vines, preventing him from moving forward. He only has one chance for survival, he must leave the raft behind the vessel that saved his life yesterday is the same one that will kill him today if he does not let it go. The raft represents our outmoded ideas and old ways of thinking that no longer serve us. For example, the same angry, aggressive persona you cultivated as a child to protect yourself from bullies and predators will now destroy every relationship you have if you're unwilling to let it go. Things can be perfectly useful and absolutely necessary during certain periods of our lives. But a time will come when we must put them aside or die. Simply put, if we don't adapt, we become extinct. I saw JL's and Jeff's choice to stay in Philly as a death sentence for both of them. But I also knew that I wouldn't allow it. T. He Fresh Prince of Bel Air was behind the eight ball from the beginning. A show of this size would usually have been greenlit nine months earlier. Because of the truncated, damn near impossible shooting schedule, decisions were having to be made in real time across the spectrum of the entire production. In JL's absence, Benny Medina stepped up in a managerial capacity. He became the contact for all things Will Smith. Benny knew what he was doing, and he knew how to get things done. But my heart hurt being in LA without JL and Jeff. I had to get them out here, so I threw up a Hail Mary at the buzzer, I told JL that I would record another album if he agreed to spend one week out of every month in LA. At the time, I didn't see music as any major part of my future, but I didn't tell him that, I just needed him in LA. Now, I had to convince Jeff. Look, man, just do three episodes. If you hate it, you only got three to go. If you love it, you can get a spot out here and we'll go back to the producers and get you more. And we can record. The worst case scenario. You clear 60 grand for being on a network television show, and at a minimum. More pussy. I wasn't entirely sure which part of that argument sold Jeff, but I didn't care he was coming. FP trivia moment. Jeff went on to become one of the most beloved characters on the show, and he loved it. His signature comedic bit was Uncle Phil throwing him out of the house. During the shooting of the pilot episode, no one knew that this bit would catch on, so we only had one shot of Jeff flying out of the house. The interior of the Bel Air mansion and the exterior are two different locations, and we only had a one-day shoot at the exterior location. So, we had to use the same shot of Jeff being thrown out over and over. Therefore, any time you see Jeff enter with the brown and white Aztec patterned shirt, you know that he'll be thrown out in that scene. The Fresh Prince of Bel Air premiered on September 10, 1990, and was an immediate success, becoming the highest rated debut show of that season. That meant there were definitely going to be more seasons. Opportunities were heating up, but despite it all, JL was still skeptical. Even a year later and tens of millions of weekly viewers, JL kept his bedroom at his mother's house in Philly. I guess in his defense, 
it was barely a year ago that he had seen me burn through three million dollars, not pay a single dime to the IRS, collapse DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince over chicken fingers and rum punches, and then blithely move to LA to become a TV star. When I put it like that, I guess it's amazing that he still took my calls. But even though he was denying it, it was undeniable, the show was a hit, the iron was hot, and it was time to strike. I was hungry, focused, and excited about the new life I was being blessed to undertake. But my personal and professional crash and burn had taught me a harsh, universal lesson, nothing lasts forever. Everything rises and falls no matter how hot the summer gets, the winter is inevitable. I promised myself I would never get caught sleeping again. That during the good times, I would plant and nurture the seeds of the next thing. And if I was truly wise, and attuned to the movements of the industry, I would be able to time the harvest of the next thing impeccably, just before the death of the old thing. In the same way that my music career was scorching hot, then icy cold, I knew the same thing would one day happen in TV. I was about to be on Blaze but one day, I knew I'd be cold again. I asked myself, after television, what would be my next thing? There was only one answer, movies. But I also made a deeper, more problematic conclusion, that love and relationships were also subject to the universal law of impermanence. I vowed to never get caught without my eye on my next love. My heart had been crushed, and I was certain that it would happen again. I knew there would be a blissful, springtime meeting, a hot summer whirlwind, a melancholy fall, and then an icy winter death. I decided that my only emotional defense against this brutal cosmic certainty was to outcreate the cycle of destruction. In my mind, I knew I had to be like Tarzan, catching the next vine just as I let go of the old one. If I could grab the new thing, while simultaneously releasing the dying thing, I could avoid and escape the harshest elements of winter and indefinitely sustain the vibrance of springtime bliss. A sitcom television is the individual, undisputed, greatest job on earth. A sitcom work week was five days to produce one episode. Monday was the table read actors, producers, writers sit around a table and read the script aloud. Everybody would give notes, and overnight the writers would deliver a new draft. Tuesday and Wednesday were playtime, the actors on stage trying to breathe life into the words. This was the part that made sitcom television the best job. We got paid to laugh, joke, play, create, debate, grow, and love on each other. At the end of each day, we would do a run-through for the writers and show them what we had come up with. And Tuesday and Wednesday night they would make adjustments, improving the script. Thursday was a technical run-through. Lights, sound, cameras, all figuring out how they would cover the action of the scenes. And then. Friday, the live, in-studio audience. Friday nights on the set of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air were like being at the hottest club in the city everybody who was anybody made their way to our tapings. The top comedians on the mic, the most gorgeous Hollywood starlets, professional athletes, musicians a who's who of the flyest of the fly. And then there was our unique competitive advantage, everybody in our cast could sing and dance. So, between scenes, Alfonso would perform Michael Jackson, Joe Marcel would sing some obscure, hilarious British show tune, James Avery would demonstrate all the old school dances, Janet Hubbard Twitten was an Alvin Ailey, trained dancer, and a Juilliard trained actor and singer, even Tatiana, at 11 years old, was jumping in the game. And then, as if all that wasn't enough to send the studio audience into hysteria, we dropped our nuke, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince would perform live every Friday night. Our between-scene moments were as iconic as anything we ever put on camera. This was heaven. A new family, a new home, a new life. Teehee message read, I need a cut of that Will Smith business. JL received this message from an infamous LA gangbanger with a reputation for shakedowns, violent extortion, and charging fees for protection. JL decided not to respond. We were no strangers to violence and attempted intimidation. 
We had guys in Philly who were more than prepared to make trips to handle things if we needed it. But LA was different. There was a brazenness and a pervasiveness that made us feel uncertain. In Philly, you could easily discern the dangerous areas and avoid them you knew if the trash wasn't getting picked up, if there were cars parked on the sidewalk, abandoned buildings on the same block as family homes, you had to be careful in that neighborhood. And of course, the projects you knew what that was. But in LA, the worst neighborhoods would have green grass and palm trees. Carjackings in broad daylight were common you could get caught slipping anywhere. We couldn't work out where to drive or what to wear it all felt dangerously confusing. None of us carried guns in Philly, all of us carried guns in LA. There were now five messages for JL. I need a cut of that Will Smith business. You should probably respond. We had heard the stories about this dude he would just take people's money, force them to sign over their publishing, strong-arming people throughout the industry. We were new to LA, and we did not want trouble. But if trouble wanted us, we were right here. JL decided to take the call. This is James Lassiter. How can I help you? You a hard man to get in touch with, the dude said. I'm thinking I need to get into that Will Smith business. Okay, JL responded, taking a pause to measure his next move. I think we can do that. Good, good, the dude said. But I have a partner, JL interjected. I don't make the final decision. You'll need to speak with him. Okay, let's set that up. Absolutely, immediately. My partner works at the Federal Bureau of Investigation, JL said evenly. I'll set the call. And any deal that you and he come up with, I'm down for it. We never heard from him again. A threat is one thing, violence is something else. But when you grow up in violent environments, your mind adapts to perceive threats everywhere. You reason that you cannot afford to get caught slipping, even once. You begin to respond to a perceived threat and to actual violence equally, even though they're very different things. There's an old adage, I'd rather be judged by twelve than carried by six. It was a Wednesday. We were struggling on set, trying to make a scene work. We all felt it the writing wasn't landing as authentic or funny. So I took it upon myself to begin making changes to the scene. When the producers came down and saw all of the unilateral adjustments I'd made, they immediately called the leadership at NBCP, the production arm of the network, who demanded that we stop production and come to the office right now. Benny Medina, JL, me, and Jeff Pollock, Benny Medina's television partner, headed to the emergency meeting in the exec's office. There were two couches facing each other, with a wooden coffee table in between, and a huge etched glass desk at one end. The executive was standing, leaning against his desk, facing the two couches. His posture suggested that he was in charge and that he was pissed. We entered and took our seats in front of the headmaster. JL and Benny sat on one couch, and me and Jeff Pollock sat facing them on the other. No formalities, no hellos, no hearing our side of the story. So, you're a big man, Huh, the executive asked me. I didn't totally understand the question, so I didn't respond. He begins to circle the perimeter of the two couches. It felt like the scene from New Jack City when Wesley Snipes was trying to get somebody to explain to him how the Carter got infiltrated. So, you can unilaterally change any of the words you want on a network sitcom, huh? At that moment, he's standing behind me. I made eye contact with JL. Is this dude about to swing on me? JL looks at me as if to say, I got my eye on him if he even flinches, I got you. Hundreds of millions of dollars, multiple partners, a shit ton of fucking veterans of the business and you get to decide what the words are. At this point, he has circled behind the other couch and behind JL. I give Jay the same look he gave me. If he even flinches, I got you. The executive now circles back behind me. Jeff Pollock, the only white person in our group, begins to explain. 
I'm not sure you've been brought up to speed on the totality and the complexity of the situation. Well, hold on, Jeff, I know what I need to know said the executive. Now, he's over my right shoulder, and his voice is beginning to rise. I've seen this happen a thousand fucking times. You can be gone just as fast as you got here. In front of JL, on the coffee table, is one of those five-pound glass snow globes. JL surreptitiously grabs it and sits it in his lap. Our eyes locked. He has a different look this time. Whatever you wanna do, homie. I jump up and spin, stepping around the couch, coming face to face with the exec. What the fuck you wanna do, bitch? I sneered. JL jumps up, now fully brandishing the snow globe. Hold on, guys, hold on, Benny Medina implores. Back up, Jeff, JL says. Since Jeff came with us, he's confused about JL's tone and energy toward him, especially as all he did was stand up. But JL has a five pound snow globe in his hand, so Jeff does as he's told and quickly backs up. Who the fuck is you talking to? I whooped at the executive. In retrospect, I did notice that the man's eyes were completely surrendered and that he had no idea what was happening. He clearly had never been called a bitch in his life and wanted no beef whatsoever. Who the fuck is you squaring off on? I was fully in it now. I could tell he wanted to respond, but he was still stuck trying to unravel the urban co on what the fuck you wanna do, bitch. Well, um, clearly we've gotten off on the wrong foot, here, he said sweetly, his left hand now holding his lower back. You damn right. You standin' up screamin' on motherfuckers. Sit down when you talk to me. But, Will, he said, even more sweetly, I just had major back surgery and the doctor told me that I should stand up when I'm you gone sit the fuck down when you talk to me, I growled. But, Will, the doc sit. The. Fuck. Down. He gingerly made his way over to the edge of his big glass desk, delicately placing his hand to brace himself. Wincing, he lowered himself painfully onto the edge of the desk. Benny had seen enough. Okay, we're good. You guys, go, he said. JL, put the snow globe down. Jeff steps in front of the exec and gestures for JL and I to leave the room. We comply. As we're exiting, we hear Jeff whisper, we are so sorry. W hat the hell was they a a ot. Jeff Pollock is screaming at the top of his lungs in the parking lot. This was the only time I ever heard Jeff raise his voice. Dude looked like he was about to swing on me, I said in my defense. I had heard the term before, people pulling their hair out, but this was the only time I'd ever seen it in real life. Jeff was actually taking two fistfuls of his own hair and tugging on them as if he wanted to rip them out of his scalp. A 64-year-old television executive with a bad back was going to swing on you. Me and JL kinda looked at each. In the office, we had been certain, but when you hear it in a parking lot, it feels like it might not hold up in court. Well, why was he standing up, walking around us, like he was gone do something? I asked, in a last-ditch defense of my perception. What? The. Hell. Was. He. Going. To. Do. He's just had major invasive lumbar decompression surgery. Okay, guys, let's take a break, Benny said compassionately. I gotta call Quincy. Oh, shit, Quincy. I immediately rushed to try to call Q first. Quincy's on a call right now, Will, can I have him return? Fuck, no, tell him to hang up with NBC and hear my side of the story first. Sure, that would be great, thanks, I said. After the worst 30 minutes of my life, he hit me back. You think you fuck it up, I blurted. It's fine people cuss each other out all the time, Quincy said. Just never put your hands on nobody. I talked to M, it's good. What happened on set? 
I changed some lines in the script because they was trying to have me say some whack shit. They trying to tell me what a dude from Philly would say. And I'm like, that line's not real. Oh, so it was a creative disagreement Quincy said. I guess that's what they call it in LA, I said. You have a script right there. Quincy asked. Yeah, I got one right here. Okay. What's it say on the cover? Uh Um, I said, confused, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Right. And who's the Fresh Prince? Quincy barked. Me, I said. Exactly. Don't nobody know what the fuck you're supposed to say better than you. If they could do what you do, they wouldn't have hired you. You say what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And when somebody has a problem with it, tell them to call me. I was barely 22 years old, and Quincy Jones had just empowered me to say whatever I wanted to say on a network television show. He took my side over producers, writers, executives, advertisers, everybody. He bet on me. Yes, sir, I said. JL and I were shook up by how thoroughly we had misread the snow globe situation. We were coming from violent homes and violent neighborhoods and the violent music world. It was not unreasonable to think that an executive might get violent. We felt cornered and vulnerable. JL and I had been 100% certain that that executive was going to hit me. It's amazing how skewed your vision can become when you see the present through the lens of your past. It was a very difficult psychological rehabilitation for us to learn how to put down the snow globe. As per my agreement with JL, me and Jeff went to work on our fourth album, which would become Home Base. But Jeff and I were on TV now, so we were essentially moonlighting from our day jobs to make music. We were used to open-ended creative time, in the past, we'd blocked out months to conceive, write, and record, and consume chicken fingers. But now, because of the specific and limited time frames, we had to be laser focused and razor sharp with every single moment of studio time. To quote Dottio, there was no bulls hidden while we were on the clock. The result was, as opposed to and in this corner, for home base we made twice as many songs in half as much time for a quarter of the budget. And the songs were better. Another byproduct of our television success was that we were freed from the pressure of needing the record to be a hit. If the album bombed, we would be fine our rents, and our tax liabilities, were getting paid with Bel Air money. We got to have fun again it was just me and Jeff being me and Jeff, getting back to what made us great. We were getting back to our home base. It was also the first time we opened up our creative process to new producers and other creative voices. I had been working in Chicago, finishing my vocals on the album with a couple of young Jive Records producers named Hula and Fingers. Jeff was doing the final mixing in New York, and I was booked on a 6 p.m. flight from O'Hare to Lax. Me, Hula, and Fingers had partied hard the night before, celebrating the completion of home base. I had blown my voice out yelling all night in the club. On the way to O'Hare, I stopped by the studio to pick up a couple of CDs of the sequenced album so I could listen on the plane. Hula gave me the CD, I tucked it in my backpack, and headed to the door. Fingers called after me. Hey, man, there's one more track that we were messing with. Jeff said he likes it. He told us to give it to you and see if you wanted to lay something real quick. I was exhausted, my voice was blown out, I was ready to get home to LA, and plus, the album was finished. Fingers was holding out a CD with the word Untitled in magic marker across the top. Just seeing the word untitled was exasperating. Even the thought of having to write a whole new song made my stomach hurt. I was done. Hey, Fingers, I said, I appreciate you, man, y'all have done great work. But I'm exhausted, I mean, listen to my voice. I couldn't lay nothing if I wanted to. You would probably have to get Jesus to hand me that CD for me to write another song. The guys laughed but out of courtesy I took the CD. 
I arrived at Chicago O'Hare an hour before my flight to the announcement that flight 1024 to Los Angeles has been delayed 90 minutes. God damn it why is it always like that? The more you want to get home, the more delayed your damn flight is. I found a quiet corner, put my headphones on, and decided to listen to Untitled. The track opened with Fingers' voice into a crazy drum drop with a rising crowd cheer. Drew you will you ums, please a a a a a a a a yeah. And then a sultry female voice, summer, summer, summer time time to sit back and unwind oh. My. God. I must have looked crazy in that airport lounge, I had that face that musicians get when a track is bangin'. It's like you smellin' something nasty. My head was about to bop off my shoulders. I quickly grabbed my rhyme book from my backpack, and the next two hours was nothing short of divine intervention. I didn't write summertime as much as I channeled it. My mind collapsed into the bliss of summertime in Philadelphia. I felt myself floating through my childhood summer memories and my hand was just along for the ride, trying to keep up. Summertime is the only song I've ever written from beginning straight through to the end and didn't edit or change a single word. The lyrics, as they appear on the final cut, are exactly as they came through. It was a pure stream of consciousness. I would later learn a term that resonated deeply with my experience at O'Hare that night, psychography, or automatic writing, is a theoretical psychic ability allowing someone to produce written words without consciously writing. Skeptics call it self-delusion, I call it another Grammy and my first number one record. Flight 1024 is now boarding. Shit. I knew this song was crazy. And if I didn't record it today, it wasn't going to be on the album. I could hear Quincy in my head, what Chagon do, Philly. Fuck it. I popped up, back in the car, back to the studio. My voice was wrecked. The pitch and tone of voice I was famous for was high, up-tempo, and wrapped in a smile. But every time I reached for that energy in the studio that night, my voice would crack and fail. Hula and Fingers kept telling me, don't worry about it just work with what you got. Lay down in that lower register. Give me some Rakim. That was exactly the direction I needed. Rakim was hands down my favorite rapper at the time. So, I settled down and decided to play the cards I'd been dealt, rather than the ones I wished I had. My vocal delivery on Summertime shocked the hip-hop world. It was released on May 20, 1991, and within a month, it had hit number one on the Hot R&B slash Hip Hop and number four on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. The music video was recorded back home in Philly with me and Jeff's real family and friends. Home base went platinum within two months. It won an American Music Award and snatched our second Grammy. Just as a piece of jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince trivia, we boycotted when parents just don't understand won our first Grammy, and Summertime was nominated against the monster Naughty by Nature hit O.P.P and I was positive we were going to lose, so I didn't go. Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince now had two Grammys, and I had yet to make an appearance anywhere near the award show. M.E. and while, in my other career, I studied my lines obsessively. In those early days of the Fresh Prince, I was so terrified of failing that I would memorize the entire screenplay not just my lines, but everybody's. It was the only thing that kept my anxieties at bay. If I was going to lose, it was damn sure going to be somebody else's fault. I may have overdone it slightly. I was so prepared that I was unconsciously mouthing all the other actors' lines on camera as they said them. Fortunately, there's an interesting thing that happens when you watch TV your eyes focus on the person who's talking. This is a form of something called inattentional blindness. Daniel Simons, in Smithsonian Magazine, describes it like this, this form of invisibility depends not on the limits of the eye, but on the limits of the mind. We consciously see only a small subset of our visual world, and when our attention is focused on one thing, we fail to notice other, unexpected things around us including those we might want to see. A perfect example of this phenomenon is in Season 1, Episode 5, 
homeboy, sweet homeboy. Don Cheadle plays my boy from Philly, I stray. If you look closely, you'll see that I'm mouthing Don's lines. But even though I'm front and center, mouthing away like an idiot, you didn't notice at home because your attention was focused on the actor who was speaking, inattentive blindness. Feel free to pull up that episode and watch me nincompoop my way through the scene. Karen was nominated to break the embarrassing news to me. Of course, I denied it, and was horrified, and remained so, when I was shown the excruciating evidence. To this day, I cannot bear to watch that episode. All of these world-class, stage-trained master thespians, and the dumbass rapper is mouthing their words back to them. And the show is named after him. It took me a couple of weeks to break the simian habit. I would be in a scene, damn near biting through my bottom lip. But I got it. T here were very few people in my life I wanted to impress more than James Avery. James had been acting longer than I had been alive, and he was my paragon, the pinnacle of dramatic presence. I desperately wanted him to think I was a good actor. But nothing I did impressed James Avery. He played my father figure on the show and slowly assumed the role in real life. He was demanding and always pushing me to master my instrument as an actor. You can do jokes with your eyes closed, he'd say. You have that naturally, and it's beautiful to watch. But you have deeper talent in there, he said, tapping on my chest emphatically, that you can't even imagine yet. And you're never going to find it if you don't reach for it. There's a difference between talent and skill. Talent comes from God you're born with it. Skill comes from sweat and practice and commitment. Don't just skate through this opportunity. Hone your craft. One of the proudest moments of my career was in one of the most famous episodes of The Fresh Prince, Papa's Got a Brand New Excuse. In the show, Will's biological father, Lou, played by Ben Vereen, comes back into his life and spends time with him again. Will is thrilled to have his father back, but Uncle Phil is skeptical. This drives a wedge between Will and Uncle Phil. Will's father, a big rig trucker, invites Will to travel with him over the summer. Will is excited and decides to go against Uncle Phil's urgings. The climax of the episode happens when Will's father comes up with an excuse and cancels the father-son trip and disappears again, leaving Will broken-hearted with Uncle Phil trying to console him. This was the most demanding dramatic scene for my character of the entire series. It was me going toe-to-toe -to -toe with James Avery. Master actors revel in the opportunity to go head-to-head -head in a scene with other masters. But I was not a master I was a scared little boy in the shadow of a giant. When actors have these types of scenes, you know they're coming for weeks, everybody else knows it, too. The anticipation wreaks havoc on your sleep, on your appetite, on your memory, on your nerves. On set, dramatic scenes have the energy of a prize fight cast and crew lean forward in their seats to see if you'll bring it home. But the studio audience has no idea, and you want to shock and surprise them. It was Friday night, the audience was in place and the episode was going along great. And then the final scene. I had studied day and night. I felt ready. But on the first take, I froze. My mind went blank, and I missed my second line. I was anxious and trying too hard, speaking too fast, stumbling through my words. The director quickly yelled cut to not blow the surprise for the audience. But I snapped. Fuuuyuk. I bellowed at the top of my lungs. Fuuuyuk. The veins in my neck bulging, my fists balled tight. Hey. James yelled, snapping me back to attention. Settle down, he whispered. Then, pointing his index and middle finger to his own eyes, he gave me the universal signal for focus on me. He leaned into my ear. Use me. Look into my eyes and talk to me. I fell into his gaze, somehow plugging into his power, our stare, unbroken, until he felt I had been sufficiently fueled. James didn't wait for the director, he called action from the floor. The next take is what appeared in the actual episode, Uncle Phil, 
I'm sorry. I, you know, if there was something that I could do Will, you know what, you ain't got to do nothing, Uncle Phil. It ain't, like, I'm still five years old, you know. Ain't like I'm gonna be sitting up every night asking my mom, when's daddy coming home, you know? Who needs him? Hey, he wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first basket. But I learned, didn't I? I got pretty damn good at it, too, didn't I, Uncle Phil? Got through my first date without him. Right? Learned how to drive. I learned how to shave. I learned how to fight without him. I had 14 great birthdays without him. He never even sent me a damn card. Screams toward the empty door to hell with him. I ain't need him then, and I don't need him now. Uncle Phil, Will. Will, no, you know what Uncle Phil? I'm going to get through college without him. I'm gonna get a great job without him. I am a marry me a beautiful honey. And I am a have me a whole bunch of kids. I'll be a better father than he ever was. And I sure as hell don't need him for that, because they ain't a damn thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids. And after a beat, Will starts crying and says, how come he don't want me, man? Uncle Phil lovingly gathers Will into his arms. The shot slowly pans away onto a statue of a father and son Will had purchased as a gift. In the embrace, James Avery whispers in my ear. Now, that is fucking acting. Desire W hat does he want? As an actor, this is the single most important question to ask of the character you are preparing to portray. His want slash dramatic quest is the first pillar of behavior. What someone desires is a portal into the essential truth of their personality. If you want to understand why someone did something, you need only answer the question, what did he want? An actor's overarching focus is to unearth the system of wants that intertwine and sometimes collide within the mind of a character to create their psychological driving force. Acting is like building out a new personality for yourself from scratch. Once you have a foundational comprehension of a character's central motivation, the real acting fun begins with the second question, why does he want it? But that's for later. The war between desire and obstacle is the heart and soul of dramatic storytelling, sometimes, the obstacles are internal those are the fun ones. In filmmaking circles, there is a simple axiom that describes the structure of a great character journey, somebody wants something badly, and goes for it, against all odds. Another variation is, a person falls into a hole, and tries to get out. If you think about any movie you've ever liked, any character you've ever rooted for, it's because they wanted something you could relate to and they struggled, risking life and limb, to achieve it. What's true about movies is also true about life, you tell me what you want, and I'll tell you who you are. W hat are we doing, man? JL asked me one day, out of nowhere. What do you mean? I mean, everything. There are too many people, there are too many things happening I can't function like this. If you want me to help you, I need to know what I'm helping you to do. Shit is going good, Jay. I think you just not seeing it. No, JL insisted, I am seeing it. I'm seeing it all over the place, and unfocused, and I'm seeing us about to do the same shit we did last time. I'm not gonna be out here just winging it. I need to know what the goal is. I didn't really understand his question. In my mind, he was just scared. I knew he didn't do well with disorganization. He was a minimalist, damn near an ascetic he had very few clothes, his bedroom was always kept in impeccable condition, and everything in his life had a place and a purpose. And when things weren't neatly arranged, in a way he could get his head around, he'd feel disrupted, disturbed, and ultimately would want no part of it. So I was trying to give him a stabilizing, simple answer. The goal is to not be broke, Jay, I said. To be able to have fun, to be able to travel and live how we want. To not have the IRS taking our shit no more. So, technically, that's five goals. 
and that's my problem, what is the dream? What are we trying to build? What do you want, he pressed definitively. I had never said this out loud before. I had tried the phrase in my head a few times, but I had never given it voice. Mom Mom once laid out about 50 family photos of me and my brother and sisters, all throughout our childhood. She stood smugly over them and asked me if I noticed anything. I scoured the pictures like a detective trying to discover the clue that would break the case. After a few minutes, I gave up. I don't notice anything, Mom, I said. Look at your brother and sisters. Notice how in some pictures they're looking off to the side, or their faces are twisted, or hidden behind someone. Now look at you. There is not a single photo where you are not looking directly into the camera. I've always had a sense of the camera. I love performing. I like the camera, and more important, it likes me. I had held a secret dream for as long as I could remember. I didn't even feel comfortable dreaming it. I didn't deserve to dream this big. But in my quietest moments, alone, there was a consistent yearning, an emotional compass that was always trained on the Hollywood sign. I wanted to do what Eddie Murphy was doing. I wanted to make people feel how I felt the first time I saw Star Wars. I wanted to be Eddie Murphy in Star Wars. So, for the first time ever, I said it out loud to JL I want to be the biggest movie star in the world. JL is the type of guy who rarely reacts outwardly. His standard face is, poker. Whether you say, JL, your mom is on the phone, or JL, the oven just exploded, and the whole crib is on fire, or, I want to be the biggest movie star in the world, his countenance remains exactly the same. He never divulges what he's thinking, so you always find yourself leaning in for some tiny hint. I leaned in, hard. Now, that's a goal, JL said. S. Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said there are only two human problems, one, knowing what you want, but not knowing how to get it, and, two, not knowing what you want. Clarity of mission is a powerful cornerstone of success. Knowing what you want gives direction to your life every word, every action, every association, can be accurately chosen and harnessed to precipitate your desired outcome. What you eat, when you sleep, where you go, who you talk to, what you allow them to say to you, who your friends are, can all be corralled and launched toward your wildest dreams. Desire, however, is a double-edged sword. But that's for later I didn't know that back then. When JL has a goal, his ability to educate and transform his mind is beyond that of anyone I've ever met. He spent the next few months reading every screenplay in Hollywood. Old ones, new ones, bad ones, good ones, successful movies that had already come out, failed movies that were never released, hits and flops and everything in between. He probably read 100 screenplays, and we would discuss the pros and cons of each. We had our goal, and the first question we asked was what makes someone a movie star, as opposed to simply an actor? Movie stars tend to play likable characters who embody and depict the best of humanity, courage, ingenuity, success against the odds. I loved the idea of being a better person in a movie than I was in real life. I could protect people, I could kill bad things, I could fly, all the women would love me they have to, it says it right here in the script. I came up with a way to describe what makes a great movie star character, I call it the three F's of movie stardom, you have to be able to fight, you have to be funny, and you have to be good at sex. Beneath the three F's are our deepest human yearnings, fighting equates to safety, security, and physical survival. Being funny equates to joy, happiness, and freedom from all negativity. And being good at sex equates to the promise of love. And encompassing these qualities, the biggest movie stars make the biggest movies in the world. Movie stars put asses in seats. The next obvious question was what are the key elements of the biggest movies? JL grabbed a list of the top 10 grossing movies of all time to see if we could determine a pattern. And it was crystal clear, 
10 out of the top 10 films of all time had special effects. 9 out of 10 had special effects and creatures. 8 out 10 had special effects, creatures, and a romantic storyline. We would ultimately discover that all of the top 10 movies were about love, but we didn't notice that back then. We knew what we were looking for. Now, we just had to go find it and convince whoever had it to give it to us. The problem was that the biggest movies in the world were also the most expensive to produce and promote, meaning they were hyper-risky propositions. They were career-making, or career-ending, for everyone involved. I was young, unknown, inexperienced, and black, trying to convince studios to bet $150 million production budgets and $150 million promotional budgets on my charm, good looks, and modesty. T. Anya used to smoke weed. To this day, I never have. I think Dottio's alcoholism made me keenly attuned to all substance use around me. I tried to let her do her, but now with the clarity of my new mission, I couldn't see how my girl smoking weed would be helpful. I was ready for a family, I was ready to start my life. I told her she had to stop.